Good evening. So this is a video that people have been asking me to make for a while. Whenever I do live streams, whenever I do appearances on podcasts, or even sometimes when I make edited videos, I oftentimes have references to lots of books. And so people are always asking me, Dave, could you please do a rundown of all of the books you own or your recommended book list or your top 20 favorite books of all time? Now, there's a few problems with this. The first problem with giving an extensive list of books that I've read or that I've enjoyed, or even a top 20 list, or even the 20 essential books, is that there's no real efficient way to do this project. First of all, if I'm giving a recommendation of essential books, the question is always essential for who? Books are very personal in how they impact you at any given stage of your life, and there's no real ability to rank them in terms of better or worse or more impactful, universally speaking. I found that certain books I've read at certain stages of my life have had zero impact on me. I thought they were stupid. I picked them up 10 years later and they changed my life. So there's no way of doing an ex a universal best of list. The second problem is, is that... Uh, I can't do sort of an extensive re review of all the books I've ever read. It's too long. And moreover, my bookshelf is constantly changing. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the habit of lending books. I'm in the habit of giving people books. A lot of my favorite books I just don't own. So as sort of a compromise, I've recently been in the middle of a move. I told people that I would just give a snapshot of all the books that are on my bookshelf right now, which is actually quite a lot of books. There's like 12 boxes here organized by genre. And in the process of doing that, I thought I could give a rundown of why I own the books. Maybe if I'm missing a book or I know I lent it to somebody or I know that, that you know, there's this gap on the bookshelf. This it reminds me of something that I really should own. I'll mention that. And that should give people a rundown or some idea of where they might start reading. Or maybe you're just interested. Maybe you're just interested in hearing what a particular book has meant to me and my journey. Uh, again, I imagine this is going to be a really long video. I'm going, to I'm going to record this as a live stream. As you can tell, I'm not editing out uh, verbal fubs and uh, ums and uhs. It's not worth it. I'm going to have to go through a lot of books, and I'll, I'll release this. I don't know. Maybe as a, a premiere video. <laughs> I can't imagine. Someone's going to sit through the entire thing. But since so many people have asked me for this, it seems worth doing, especially now that I have to unpack my books anyway. So I organize the books into a variety of boxes. They're all in banker's boxes. And I think I, I, think I have about 12 to 15 of them. I am going to start, I believe, with the fiction, work my way to the history, literature, and religious books, and then finish with odds and ends, stuff like music, I don't think, and this is a big caveat here, an enormous number of the books I own are, techno, are technical books. These are books on, on mathematics and engineering. And I do believe that there are a lot of gems in those books. If people are studying technical subjects at a college level or an advanced graduate level, I could give recommendations. First of all, if I'm going to review those books, I'll put them at the end. Secondly, there's another problem in that most of the books I own of a technical variety are very high level, so they're not very good for lay people. Also, since I've gotten a PhD, a lot of them were written by people I know IRL, and so I'm afraid that if I expose that collection too deeply, I could kind of end up doxing a lot of people who might not want to be associated with you know, a controversial political channel that I run on YouTube. But, you know, we'll deal with that bridge when I get to it. I imagine this will take me multiple days to record. You might see the gray shirt change. Hopefully the lighting won't change because I have a, a set a setup that I really like here. So that being said, what I'm going to do again is start with the fiction. And I'm, you're going to see me slowly populate these three shelves of books. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll intersperse it with, uh, with pictures of how the shelves look after I set them up. And... Uh, I probably will release this as some kind of premiere, so I imagine there's going to be a chat, but I can't read it. So, so unfortunately, the thing is, I, I knew I, originally I wanted to do this as a live stream, actually, but I, I very quickly realized that if I had to deal with a chat and with questions and with why do you have this book and not this book, 
this would take me days and days and days and would be way too long. So you're just going to have me on this one. And it's just going to be me talking about the books that, that I own, uh, how they've been impactful on my life. And, uh, you know, we'll go from there. So start out with the, the most fun I could think of. I have the box with the science fiction books. I pack these things into boxes, again, bankers boxes via genre, but I'm gonna take them out in no particular order. So you guys are gonna have to bear with me. I'll show everyone for the camera and then we're gonna keep on going. I have these things very, very broad categories. By sci-fi, I mean sci-fi, fantasy, the whole, the whole deal. The one thing I don't think I, I include in that are, are like really young kids' books that I might have for sentimental reasons. Uh, but just starting off, I see that the two top ones on, on the box, just as they've been packed, are technically kids' books. So I, I guess I'll just start here. So I guess this is one of the first books I remember. It is King Arthur's uh, Knights of the Round Table for Children. Uh, who actually wrote this one? It is um, uh, Sidney Lanier, and uh, you see, it's fully illustrated. I got this book when I was a very little child, you know, and I got to go through the entire Knights of the Round Table. I think I was about, oof, was I about eight or something when I read this book? It was, uh, you know, I can tell that this was my parents' book, or my mother's in particular, because it's marked from, um, oh, I'm not gonna tell you the particular town, but it's marked from the, the local Bay Area library in 1962 where she lived. So this is a great book. Um, I actually never read The Death of King Arthur. I did read T.H. White's Once in Future King, which is the, the basis for, the at least the first few chapters are the basis for Disney's The Sword and the Stone, you know, with the, the cantankerous Merlin and the, the owl named Archimedes. But, you know, T.H. White's Once in Future King is beautiful don't own it currently i would recommend that for older kids but this is just if you're if you have a kid who's maybe in third grade and precocious uh this was just amazing i remember this and i've kept this for years and years and years so i guess that's the first one on my shelf i'll go through these fairly quickly so I don't go uh spend too long on them i i'm tempted always to tell stories about the books that i that i pick up I don't really have a story about this book in particular, other than to say that it was my first encounter with King Arthur. It's a book that I've always wanted to hand down to my son because you're always, King Arthur is a hard story because it's not really amenable to children. I feel like Robin Hood is much more fun loving, whereas a lot of elements in the Knights of the Round Table are laborious and, and some are darker than others. And nobody reads the original source material. No one reads the original romantic plays or anything like that. And so, you know, it's always hard to find a good, a good way to introduce older children, or I should say just um, grade school children to that. And that, I think that's just a particularly good version. Again, it's the Lanier version. I see this, so my father used to own a used bookstore, which is probably will explain why I have some titles later on when I go through this entire bookshelf. I see this book I use book sales all the time. I, I recognize it from the very colorful uh, cover. So this book must have had a wide printing in the early 60s. There's, uh, yeah, so I can't imagine that if you want to find this book, you won't be able to find it. But maybe, I, I thought maybe for a while when I was doing this, when I was um, putting together this bookshelf, a bookshelf, Maybe I would uh, include like links to Amazon Associates so I can make a little bit of money if people wanted to purchase one of the books. Some of the problems is a lot of these books are not going to be in print, or probably not that many of them considering it's Amazon. Second problem might be, well, do you really want to give money to Amazon? Truth be told, if you purchase something on an Amazon Associates link, given how small Amazon's profit margins are, probably are giving more money to me than you're ultimately giving to Jeff Bezos. Uh, but I don't know. Do I, do I really have time to put hundreds of uh, links from Amazon Associates into into a, a link tree or something like that, or or just in the in the low bar? But I'll move along to another one of my books that I remember as a child. Here's another thing I should mention before I show this one off. Um, so a lot of books in my collection are obviously new, even though I've read them many times, because you have a book 
you read it many times, it gets old, you throw it away, you buy a new one. Or what's more common with me is I have a book, I love it, and I lend it to somebody and I never get it back. So when I'm at a used bookstore, I pick up another copy. So, uh, and, and I'll try to be honest, a lot of books in my collection I haven't read. I imagine we'll get to a bunch of books uh, later on that I just plain haven't read. And I'll be totally honest with you about whether I've read them, why I haven't read them, why I own them. Uh, and you can judge for yourself if it's worthwhile. But this is a book I have read. And for some reason, I remember the movie more. Um, but it's a classic. I'm sure a lot of people will have this on their list for uh, best uh, young adult fiction or best. I think this is more children's fiction than young adult. But it's The Phantom Tollbooth by uh, Norton Juster. I never remember the author's name. But this is a delightful little um, story about a boy who is sent, weirdly enough, a toy toll booth. And he's able to travel, using this toll booth, he's able to travel to this other dimension where um, this other, in this other dimension, c concepts uh, like mathematics and numbers and time uh, they have personalities, and they interact with him as he's taking this journey uh, to to liberate the princesses that, who are called Rhyme and Reason. Now, the thing is with this book, um, it it really is the kids' version of Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, I remember was it was it Lambda and Daughter of Albion recently did a stream about uh, Pilgrim's Progress, which is a delightful book. People should read it, but. Pilgrim's Progress, it's a Puritan book from the 17th century, uh, the era of Oliver Cromwell. And it is written by this guy, John Bunyan. And he is, it's just an explicit al allegory. When, when, you know, it's, a, it's about a pilgrim called Christian trying to get to the city of God from the city of man. And everything he encounters, every person he encounters is the literal name of the archetype that character embodies. So it's this it's, it's this absolute lack of irony in its archetypical imagination, and it's totally delightful. C.S. Lewis even did a version called Pilgrim's Regress, which is slightly more modern. Um, this is the kid's version. Uh, it's, it's not obviously Christian, and it's a lot... Uh, and it, because, it's, um, because it's for kids, it, the lack of irony and the bluntness, which is also delightful in Pilgrim's Progress, don't get me wrong, is really in full force in this book. Um, it's good for, this book's good for adults. It's really good for kids. I really enjoyed it. You know, holding this book right now, I'm, I'm reminded of the fact that there was another book that I've always associated with it, but I can't find it anywhere called The Teaspoon Tree. And come to think of it, I think that book is by T.E. White, which is the same author as Wunsch and Future King. But The Teaspoon Tree was for children. Now, I will find a copy of The Teaspoon Tree uh, and, and put it on my shelf, but it's currently not in my collection, but I'll, I decided to mention it there. So... The Phantom Toll Booth, I believe this was also a movie. I definitely saw the movie, which was really like hokey 80s non-Disney animation, um, which is why it's stuck in my mind, kind of for its hokiness. Um, <laughs> well, in, in true fashion, you can tell that this box is certainly not organized because not only is there uh, a, a book that uh, we go from two childhood classics, a book that I didn't purchase, a book that my wife purchased, and a book that I haven't read, um, this is Razor Fist's uh, sci-fi noir book that uh, my wife is a real Razor Fist fan, and uh, so she he, he, she bought his book when he published it, uh, which is great. Always support content creators when they write their books. I'm going to get Academic Agent's book when I get the chance and some extra money. I haven't read this book. I can't comment on it. Uh, I'm sure there's like YouTube videos where Razor Fist talks about his film. I say film noir, his um, pulp noir book. But, um, yeah, so people will realize when you're married that um, you, you end up owning each other's books. So um, I think most of the books in this collection are mine because when we, when we, my wife's Canadian, so most of her books are in storage in Canada. But there are a few here and there that she got transported over. She transported a few books. And so there, there'll be a variety of hers mixed into the, uh, into the bit. Um, I do share... Uh, Razor Fist's love of pulp. And this is, uh, this is, I, I have a bunch of, actually, there's two books here, the next two. Um, I, 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 every time you go to used books to sales, you pick, I pick up pulp books. And this is the thing, you lose these things. Uh, here is one, uh, Robert E. Howard's Call, King Call, 
these little trade paperbacks that they are made out of absolute uh, absolute paper. You, they will disintegrate the second you and unlock my screen here. They will disintegrate the second uh, you, you they come in contact with any water. They're not meant to last. These things sold for less than a dollar back in the day. Yeah, this one's marked 95 cents. This one's 60 cents. Uh, I think I bought them used for like twice as much as they were originally sold for the manufacturer's recommended price. This pulp uh, is H.P. Lovecraft's The Doom That Came to Sarnoff. Now, um, Call, I don't know about Call. I mean, I bought this one because I love Robert E. Howard and I read him. I have to confess, not particularly remembering any given story from, from Call. I much more remember the Conan ones for some reason, and so does everyone else. I don't know if I have, I think I have Conan in here, but, but my particular favorite Conan is uh, the Tower of the Elephant or the Queen of the Black Coast. However, I think I remember every H.P. Lovecraft, and I always jump at an opportunity to buy these really hokey paperbacks that have, I mean, look what this one is, a salamander, oh, this is a salamander on it. Uh, I, I guess it's an eldritch salamander. So this one, uh, apparently this one is all of the sort of the dream quest uh, cycle of um, of H.P. Lovecraft. These are the really surreal ones that he did. Less sort of the gothic horror ones. Uh, Narthlatep, the Celts of Ulthar, From Beyond, the Festival, the Nameless City. Uh, I don't know, if you guys aren't familiar with H.P. Lovecraft, you're cheating yourselves. Uh, don't experience it through video games or through board games, although I do love a variety of H.P. Lovecraft board games. The, the thick, laborious pulp text, does it translate well into our time? No. Does it tell a concise story? No. But it's a delicious use of the English language. It's a, it's a picture into a certain time period, into the 1930s, now people consume science fiction. And it's a science fiction, the, 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 the corpus of H.P. Lovecraft's work is a science fiction masterpiece, even if the individual works themselves will eternally be pulp. So that's a good one. And you know, I have, I have a video on um, H.P. Lovecraft, obviously one of my um, traditionalist codex ones. Uh, but uh, my favorite one that came out recently was Morgoth's, uh, he did an analysis of one particular H.P. Lovecraft story, Narthletep. Uh, Narthlatep is sort of the chaos god, or one of the the messenger of the chaos gods in in Lovecraft. Although Lovecraft doesn't call them chaos gods, but Narthlatep is literally called the crawling chaos. And in this in this version of the story, he's sort of this like mad Egyptian prophet. And Morgoth beautifully relates this to sort of how it feels being in a declining civilization, sort of the end of the Spenglerian cycle. Um, beautiful, underrated. Um, this this video is going to be kind of schizophrenic, so <laughs> you know. Uh, here is the next one on, on in the box, and this is Robin Hobb. Okay, so Robin Hobb is if you so if you ask a person in the, in the modern day um, what what the best fantasy series is or who the best living fantasy writer is. They'll tell you George R. R. Martin, and they'll tell you Robin Hobb. Now, I was really, I went in, in, in junior high, and, and as a young adult, I love, love, love fantasy. I read all of it I could. Then in high school, I kind of got too good for school, uh, too cool for school, and decided that you know, fantasy sucked. I wouldn't read any more of it. Uh, one of my friends at the time tried to get me back into it. One of the series he recommended was the Assassin's Apprentice series by Robin Hobb. And the other one he recommended was, was Game of Thrones. And I read both of them, and I, I like Game of Thrones a lot more. Or it was called, sorry, it's called, um, it's called A Song of Ice and Fire, but the first one's called Game of Thrones. And so it was the much more popular TV series. Um, Robin Hobb wrote a bunch of series about, one's about an assassin, one's about a, a fool, one's about a series of living ships and the traitors who own them. Uh, and it's well written in the fact that the characters develop pretty well and it's character focused, but it never really appealed to me. Something about the plot was very meandering. It loses track of its most interesting elements. And, you know, my wife asked me for a fantasy series to read and I said, I don't really like this one so much, but you should try this. And, and she read through the first one and when she got to the end of it, 
she told me she told me an interesting thing. I, I this is a brilliant literary analysis of the genre, and that is that all of Robin Hobbs' characters they all sound like women. Like even the hardened warriors, they talk like women. They talk like uh, like like a female's writing them. The like female's putting words in their mouth, and um, and this is something that. Um, I, I, it kind of it perfectly kind of set off for me why I had a problem with the series. Not only is the plot kind of meandering, it, the characters don't feel properly medieval. They, they don't. They feel like they've been transported uh, from from 1990s America or 1990s England and into an appropriate medieval setting, and now they're set loose. So anyway, uh, there again, there are three books in the series. Um, I felt had a very anticlimactic ending, and I don't own the other three. I only own this one because I picked it up for my wife. But um, having owned it, I probably will try to get rid of it. <laughs> um, okay, well, this is a book that I certainly will not be getting rid of anytime soon. Uh, you don't, can't see it, but this is Dune. Not only is this Dune, this is the first edition of Dune. Uh, first edition, not reprinted. Uh, you can tell because the, uh, the, the index, the dictionary is in the front of the book, not in the back. Um, so this is sort of a collector's item. I don't think it's worth anything. My, my, again, as I said, my dad owns a used bookstore. So when I saw a first edition of Dune floating around, I snapped it up. Uh, one problem with this, though, it's missing its dust jacket, right? So if you're collecting books... The book loses a considerable amount of its value if it's damaged. You know, it's damaged and it's it's missing its dust jacket. Um, you know, I could talk I could talk to you about Dune again. I, I feel like I mention it all the time. I have a one hour video on Dune that's one of my most popular on the channel I've ever done. I have a video review of the Dune movie. I did a whole live stream on Dune less than a year ago. Um, Dune it's an essential science fiction book and it'll be on everyone's list, but. A, for what it's worth, I have a first edition. Um, okay, uh, more pulp. I have uh, The Best of Fritz Lieber, another pop author. I think I've read one of these short stories. I think Fritz Lieber is kind of like a, a cross between what you'd ordinarily see in Weird Tales and something like H.P. Lovecraft or, or Conan. Not properly Golden Age of Science Fiction, uh, not properly pulp, but... There's only so much I can say about books that I've, I've uh, only read one. Uh, I've only read one story of. Um, I'm just gonna get rid of all of the pulp now. Uh, Solomon Kane, another great Robert E. Howard character. Got to hope I'm not gonna reveal that 90% of my science fiction collections all Robert E. Howard and H.P. Lovecraft. Um, but okay, sure enough. Uh, I can. I think I can take care of all three of these at once. Uh, I have the Book of the New Sun. So uh, for people who finished Dune and they loved it, people who read things like, um, if you're really attracted to something like the Dark Sun scenario in, Dun in, in Dungeons and Dragons, if you like the, the dying world motif, and if you really appreciate archetypical fiction, and you don't mind a massive amount of, spir uh, of surrealism inside your, uh, your 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 fantasy. Uh, I can't recommend enough Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun series. These are the first two. Uh, wonderful art, sort of a Warhammer 40k. The guy has a sword with sort of like a gas mask thing, and it's you know, it's followed up by. Um, I see. I haven't read this one. I haven't read the uh, the the sequel to the Book of the New Sun, uh, but the originals are well worth your time. Uh, it goes from uh, the Shadow of the Torture uh, down to the Citadel of the Autark. And uh, again, I think that these... these the, the, the Gene Wolfe doesn't get credit for being a huge contributor to the field of science fiction or fantasy. Uh, it's a little unjust. The first reason why he doesn't is that he's a fairly new author. He came from the 70s. And... Um, you know, there is, uh, sorry, he came from the 80s. He wasn't even the 70s. So he, he's a latecomer. And and so it, it, once you start writing in the 80s, people feel like everything's already been explored. You know, dark fantasy is already kind of a thing. 
uh, I think Gene Wolfe put sort of a uniquely original take on the dying world archetype of fantasy. He put an, uh, an original take on sort of post-apocalyptic cyclical universes that are so far removed for us in time we can't really relate to them. Spengler has this thing in his Rise or the, the Decline of the West where he talks about how civilizations, once you try to understand a civilization from outside of itself, it's much more difficult because you have a very difficult time imagining yourself within that civilizational context, whereas, whereas we, we have a very easy time putting ourselves in a context that is, um, that is within our own civilization just 100 or 200 years back because we see ourselves as part of a continuous story, whereas each civilization has its own story. The Book of the New Sun, more than anything else, captures the distance in time uh, better than any other book, better than Dune does, better than Foundation. Foundation does it particularly poorly, in my opinion. Uh, Dune does it better, but still not quite as good as the Book of the New Sun. Uh, the Book of the New Sun, the civilization and its rules and its values are very hard to discern from reading it. Even as you're reading the plot and picking up the events as they go down, the values people operate under, how they perceive the universe, how they perceive humanity's place in the universe is very indistinct. It's very hard to pick up and you have to pick it up through context. Now, in some sense, this is a horrible decision. It's, it completely removes you from the story because you can't put yourself immediately in the shoes of the protagonist. There's always a layer between you and him. Not to mention the, the protagonist is an unreliable narrator, which adds an additional dimension of complexity to it. Uh, but the, the, um, it, it, it's, it's challenging for that reason. And it's hard to really associate or sympathize with the characters. And, and for that reason, it, it sort of, it, it's sort of the inverse of Robin Hobb in some ways. Robin Hobb has very relatable characters, but they don't feel like they're in, in any kind of unique time or place. They feel like they're just 1990s hipsters that have been transposed into a medieval setting. This is completely different. It, the universe feels unique. The characters feel alien. And uh, you have to explore this universe. And, and it, feels, it feels like an adventure reading the book. And, and that is both... A, a damning i think that's both the greatest praise i can come up with for the new sun and also sort of its most, most damning criticism but if you're really into science fiction highly recommend it um now that i can kind of get a vantage point on these books looking down i can kind of group them together <laughs> um let's talk about a science fiction author that is seminal from the 1980s and that will certainly be remembered as this uh contributor to science fiction, probably the last contributor to science fiction where you're like, yes, that person, if he hadn't written or written this particular book, uh, science fiction would have been completely different and we wouldn't even have this genre. I refer to none other than William Gibson, uh, Neuromancer. And uh, this is his short story collection, Burning Chrome, in which you will find the first uh, cyberpunk stories before he put them into a novel. I think the first one was Johnny Mnemonic, I believe, which was also turned into a Keanu Reeves movie before The Matrix. A really bad one, although I'd never have seen that movie in its entirety. I'm not going to talk about the short story collection, uh, but I will spend some time on Neuromancer. Oh, uh, I love this. Love this. Love this book. This book is not an easy read. It, it was written in, I think, 1982, and it describes basically cyberpunk. This is the origin of the science fiction universe where hackers are fighting corporations for access to information, for AIs, for the virtual reality interface where you have to, you know, you have to run on data and you know you you can you can die in the matrix for 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 hacking into a mainframe that has really really bad security protocols which they call ice in this, which which I always love. I always love thinking of um, computer security as ice it's called uh, Intruder Countermeasure Electronics in the book. And this is the book that coined the word cyberspace as well. Um, this is a great book. Uh, Fritz Imperial mentioned, I, I recommended this book to him, and his comment upon reading it was, is it intentional that every single character in this book is a complete piece of shit? The answer to that is yes, it, it is intentional. Every character in this book is cynical, is out for themselves, has no greater belief in anything other than pleasure and whatever postmodern meaning 
that they have contrived for themselves. This is a thoroughly postmodern science fiction book. And that's why it was so groundbreaking at the time, is that this, this was supposedly, you know, everyone was talking about postmodernity in the 80s, but, but no one was grappling with it within science fiction. Like everyone was, was sort of writing science fiction novels where civilization either collapsed or whether, um, or, or we, we, we sort of transcended postmodernism when we re-entered the frontier, like in Star Trek. This was the vision of a future that had embraced its own postmodernism. And um, it's wonderful. Now, the other sort of criticism about it here is that while the imagistics of the universe are completely unique, uh, the sort of urban dystopia, the sprawl that consumes the world, uh, the corporations that, that rule in place of governments, well, all that is, is totally original to this book. You guys have already seen it. You know, we've come past the 90s. There have been more than three role-playing systems and a dozen of re actually really good board games. My favorite board game, Netrunner, is based on this book. Um, that, so you're, you're not going to perceive this as a unique universe because, it, like Tolkien, it's already been done. The repetitions have done it to death. And the, the second thing is, is that the, the story itself, um, it's compelling but it's basically it's 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 a caper story it's a film noir story the story itself does not contain any revelation that is uh it can it's an interesting character study but but think of it sort of like the long goodbye or the maltese falcon the story itself the plot is very much in the tradition of the paul hardboiled detective novel almost or the caper novel it's not like Dune or like the Book of the New Sun where the plot itself reveals something profound or edifying. If you read this book, read it for the plot. And, and if you don't want to read this book and you want to listen to it on audiobook, I highly recommend the BBC had a radio play version of Neuromancer, which I really loved. Now, I've been told that the radio play moves way too quickly and it glosses over a lot of details, as it must, because it's a radio play. And, and some people think that, th that a lot of stuff falls through the cracks of, of, of that version of it. But, but I thought it was fast moving, way easier, to, in, in many ways, easier to understand than the actual book. And just a really, really good production. So I highly recommend that. Um, okay, I'm going to continuously go down this... Uh, uh, here is the other science fiction cyberpunk author that has come recently. That he was more of a '90s creation than a, a '80s creation, and this is um, Neil Stephenson. So his famous book, the book that really put him on the map, is Snow Crash. Now, Snow Crash is like it, it's it's like it's it's like Neuromancer, but it's less cynical. It's more humorous. And it, it's much more like a fantasy novel. Like there are actual good guys and bad guys in, in, um, in, in Snow Crash. And they're actual like high stakes. There's actually like an end of the world scenario that they're trying to fight against. And, and so because of that, it incorporates a lot of fantasy elements and a lot of humor elements. People tend to like Snow Crash more than, um, uh, than, uh, than the Neuromancer. But in many ways, Snow Crash, I felt undermined the entire concept of cyberpunk. It wasn't true cyberpunk because it had too many fantasy dimensions to it. The, 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 the hero is literally called hero protagonist, like the Japanese name hero, last name protagonist. So it clearly delineated lines of good and evil are not a cyberpunk thing. And, um, and so I felt it was always kind of worse for wear in that dimension uh it though did have one really interesting element of it is that because this is the 1990s and the, the pc gates weren't erected yet uh neil stevenson does he does um he does explore the concept of refugee flotillas from the third world being literal weapons of mass destruction against first world countries he, he literally describes sort of a camp of the saints scenario in his science fiction cyberpunk novel which you, you never would get away with at any time after 2006, probably. But if, you're, if, you, if I've convinced you to not read Snow Crash and you're still looking for something good by Neil Stephenson, uh, you would do worse than picking up The Diamond Age. Okay, so The Diamond Age. This book sucks. Uh, the plot sucks. It's boring. The characters are stupid. 
Um, so why do I love this book so much? Um, this book, first of all, it takes the postmodern condition seriously. You're living in a post-truth world. Uh, but the real critical thing about the Diamond Age is that it, it kind of it goes beyond um, Neuromancer, whereas the characters aren't just cynical and out for themselves, even though they live in a post-truth, postmodern condition. In the Diamond Age, what people have done is they have created little enclaves of culture, little patchworks, where, where people would have moral systems inside their little spaces. So if you're part of the Mormon community, you have the Mormon moral structure. And then there's a, uh, there's a little enclave of Victorians that have decided to live with the ethics of, of the Victorian people. And so outside, the world works like Neuromancer, doggy dog, cutthroat, the most brutal kind of post-techno world you can imagine. But inside the little, um, the little cells, the little patches, uh, you have people living out almost, some of them are living out uh, degenerate lifestyles, some of them are living out trad lifestyles. And um, I don't know, is there much of a plot in this book that really is really compelling? No. Is, is, are, are the characters really good? No. I barely remember anything that happened in this book. But I do remember the vision of, uh, it's almost a neo-reactionary vision uh, of, of a post-cyberpunk patchwork. Uh, so I'd, I'd recommend this one if you're really interested in, in Neil Stevenson's understanding of how, uh, you know, the, the patchwork model of governance might work in postmodernity. Uh, but I, um, you know, heavy caveat with the fact that I don't think it's actually a compelling story. Um, speaking of not compelling stories that you probably need to read just to have read them, Foundation. Uh, does anyone like this book? as an actual book? I don't know. This is the classic uh, decline and fall of the Roman Empire as told in space, with the caveat that in this world, uh, a mathematician slash historian called Harry Selden predicts it in advance and takes means to protect against it by building a foundation that will rebuild civilization once the barbarians invade, sort of like the monasteries. So this is another Benedict Option type book. Unfortunately, it's written by a shitlib who thinks that you know, the, the best thing you can do, he kind of ignores the Spenglerian imperative, which is sort of funny about the whole thing. He ignores the Spenglerian imperative. Uh, he, he, the Spenglerian imperative, and this, this is, um, you know, this is the, sort of the great wisdom of Spengler, and, and most people who take seriously the decline and fall of civilizations, the cyclical nature of civilizations themselves, is most people who seriously examine the subject understand that the height of the civilization is where the seeds of the decline are sown. So what you have playing out in the decline of civilizations are mistakes that were made at the height of the civilization. So there, there's no way around this, right? There's no way around this because if you were to rewind to the height, the mistakes would still be there. And now the, what's happening in the decline phase, what's happening in the cataclysm, is that the chickens are coming home to roost. The mistakes that, for whatever temporal reason, were not apparent when they were made, times have changed, and now those mistakes are large, massive security flaws in your civilization, and they decline. But Isaac Asimov sees decline as being inorganic and something that you, know, you can snap out of. So his idea is that you have a civilization preserving mechanism so that if, if all the records were kept, you could snap back to the prime of civilization after only a very limited amount of time in, inside the bottom tier of civilization, which I, I think R.N. McIntyre was, the first, was well, Morgoth or R.N. McIntyre both mentioned this, and they said that if you took Spengler seriously, the foundation was the actual worst thing you could do because it would prevent uh, humanity from, from learning the mistake. It would prevent the new civilization from, from being an actual correction and for something new actually coming about, it would, it would simply be uh, a, um, a reassertion of the decadent stage in a lot of ways. I, I hear that, but you know, the, the another way of putting it too is um, you know, I, I kind of, being a, a, a participant in a declining civilization myself, I kind of sympathize you know, I think when you look at people like Boethius or Augustine, they very much were preservers of the Roman tradition. 
And, you know, and did their work stop the Faustian civilization from coming into existence? It didn't hold back the fall of the Roman Empire, but at the same at the same time, their work in the dying embers of the civilization uh, made made the relighting of that civilization fire all the brighter from the depths of the Middle Ages. So, so I don't know. I think that this is kind of the shitlib perspective on how you would get out of the cycle of declining civilization, but it's a great one. It's also one of the most seminal science fiction works of all time. Uh, you can't. I don't know, if you want to be accomplished in reading science fiction, there's no way to avoid getting out of reading Foundation. And it's and it's much better sequel, Foundation and Empire. I think originally that there were three. And, um, of course, everyone likes the one where the chief antagonist appears called the Mule. Um, I'll, I guess I'll go through two, three more pulp novels. We have uh, the Robert E. Howard Omnibus. I, I love this picture. It's a space gorilla carrying away a nude woman. Uh, oh man, you just couldn't you couldn't get away with the stuff anymore. People in the 30s loved gorillas that carried away uh, blonde women, uh, but you just couldn't get away with this anymore. Uh, you know, the Warhammer 40k orcs get rid of it a little bit, but but I think Games Workshop uh, kind of tried to dodge a bullet when it definitionally made the orcs ase asexual. So so it took out the question of the whole um, you know obvious race dynamic going on in, in most of these things. Uh, apparently, I have another uh, another pulp. I have not read this one. I think my wife bought this for me. It's Sprague de Camp, the Goblin Tower. It's obviously pulp. Haven't read it. I probably won't. Uh, maybe on a vacation sometime I'll read it. And another another delightful uh, Lynn Carter's analysis of the Cthulhu mythos in trade paperback version. Uh, a ghoul that kind of looks like a, a parrot got taped to a lizard there. Um, but Lynn Carter was another, uh, he was sort of a post-pop author, author, I believe. Um, and very, very good. Uh, might as well clear out the pulp stuff here. Um, Edgar Rice Burroughs, the author of, uh, author of Tarzan earlier than, than Howard. He was the original pop author. Uh, and this is, this is really Flash Gordon stuff. This is the synthetic men on Mars. I don't think I've read this. I definitely haven't read this book, uh, but it has a place on my shelf anyway, just because it's you know it's delightful to have these these old pulp paperbacks around. Someone will tell me that's a really good book. Um, uh, Neil Gaiman's The Graveyard Book. This is the last book by Neil Gaiman I ever read. I really didn't like it. Neil Gaiman was a seminal author uh, in my own development, and we'll probably get to be discussing what he meant to me when we talk about the graphic novels and the Sandman, would I still have backed there. Um, he was a thorough creation of the 1990s, and he became super popular in the early 2000s when some of his books were turned into movies. I'm thinking here of Stardust, and earlier than that, Neverwhere. And he became sort of a popular person to recreate as sort of part of a BBC production. At this point, he's really showing his age. His worldview, which was sort of implicitly liberal, implicitly progressive, seemed to be able to capture profundity very well in the 90s when he could kind of break from uh, the, the PC, um, the, the PC uh, aesthetic orthodoxy. And now it's sort of captured by it. And this last one, The Graveyard Book, is his forte. Neil Gaiman's forte is kind of taking myths and uh, stories for children and making them really, really serious and really, really, and have, giving them deeper components. It's sort of like those people who take Twinkies or, or you know, Hostess Ding Dongs, Hostess Cupcakes. They called them Ding Dongs back in the day, but I think people made fun of that, so they call them Hostess Cupcakes now. But, but in the 2000s, there was this uh, foodie craze of taking bad food and then trying to make it absolutely good, like using the best ingredients. Like uh, you, you would have a hostess cupcake that, that tasted like a chocolate eclair. Uh, and, and people would do this. And, and that's sort of Neil Gaiman's thing, is to take things for children and, and mix them with darker elements. Now, when it comes to something like Coraline, uh, also a great movie. I don't own Coraline. I think that is the absolute, that's, that's Neil Gaiman at his best. 
uh, creating a very dark story that kids like and adults like, and it just fits. It, it feels like it's respecting the source material. And it's also um, thoroughly making a modern fairy tale. I felt that the graveyard book showed its weakness. Um, I felt that the graveyard book, it, it's about a kid who's raised by ghosts. The universe makes no sense. Uh, it, it's too dark to be a kid's book. And when I read it as an adult book, my adult brain asks questions that, that I know I shouldn't be a asking. My screen's gone to sleep again, so I need to wake it up. And so because of that, um, because of that, I, uh, I, um, I don't know. I couldn't get into this book. It really was not my thing. I think my wife really liked it, though. So I'll probably talk about, more about Neil Gaiman later. So I'm sorry if I have to, if, I, if you see me uh, um, typing on the keyboard there, that's me waking up my screensaver or screensaver. I'll, I'll try to disable that uh, later on when I do my next recording, my next video. So, okay, we're getting back to the last really good stuff. Okay, what do we say about this next one? Everyone knew I'd have to own it, Ender's Game. So, I think most millennials will have this on their best book uh, books list. What I can say about Ender's Game is that it's a great little adventure story. It's a great little coming-of-age story. Um... Does it hold up? It's been ages since I've read this. I feel like I've I have it memorized. I feel like there's a nice twist at the end. I feel uh, uh, it would be perfect for a 13 or 14 year old. Most adults, I think, will see the twist before it happens, and so they'll be prepared for it. Uh, that you know, as an adult, you're you're you expect twists, and they don't really surprise you as much. I still feel like it's a very very good science fiction sort uh, science fiction novella. No groundbreaking aesthetics. It's your typical space bug war uh, with with more character development. What what usually makes this so popular with people is that Ender's Game puts the focus on a very young protagonist, and they really very well capture the pressure it feels to be the son of a very successful professional person. The the, the pressure to achieve, as if the whole world rested on your shoulders. And, and the stress you feel and the difficulty being bullied. And so this this really does capture, I think it's a very similar emotion you'd find in something like Evangelion. Um, Evangelion is the, it's an anime and Evangelion, um, I, I well, we could talk about that anime endlessly, but it usually is most people's favorite anime, that and Cowboy Bebop, uh, from the 90s at least, I should say. Um, and this very much is in the same mode of Neogenesis Evangelion, uh, a very similar story, I would say. Um, I actually, of, of this series, I don't own it. Uh, my favorite book in the series is the sequel, Speaker of the Dead, which uh, explores sort of the post, the fallout of the first book, in particular in the dimension of spirituality. Now, Speaker of the Dead, uh, Speaker for the Dead, I think, I forget what the book is called exactly. It asks a bunch of questions that are very philosophical. And the author's subsequent books, Xenocide and Children of the Mind, just could not answer those questions and ended up disappointing a lot of fans uh, when, when, they were finally, when they were finally brought to the front. And so a lot of people hate the, the, second, this, the last two books in the, well, not, not a trilogy, the, um, the, the set of four books. Uh, but but I don't know. I'd say read read Ender's Game as an adventure novel. Uh, it's very good for young children. Um, Speaker of the Dead. If you want a more of a, a spiritual twist on on the same characters, uh, and if you're really adventurous, give the last two uh, a go with the understanding that they are um, the fans don't like them, and the author can't really deliver on what he promises in the second book. But the first one can stand on its own as, as an independent book. So I, I'd recommend that if you just want a good um, science, fiction, uh, science fiction story. Uh, I should say also that the author did write, or since Scott Card wrote a lot of other stuff, uh, he's obviously, he, he was canceled early on because I think he was against gay marriage. He's a Mormon. And um, uh, he, he also wrote prequels. Yeah, he wrote prequels to... Ender's Game, and they were just sort of adventure stories. They were almost carbon copies of the original story, and I really don't like it when 
when when authors write prequels that just feel like they're rehashing the same thing like they don't add anything new to the story they're they're just the same thing over and over again i understand pulp and conan and cole and hb lovecraft is nothing but the same thing over and over again but it feels it feels sort of cheap when the 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 repetition of the story is introduced as a segment of the story like it takes place in the same universe it feels like i'm people are trying to cap uh, capitalize on, on the franchise effect like you read Ender's Game so you have to read this prequel to Ender's Game you have to read the the same book from a, the perspective of a different character uh, you have no choice you're invested um yeah so I don't know um but everyone's probably heard of Ender's Game and has read it from the millennial generation let's talk about these are we're coming to the last few books on on the um on the sci-fi fantasy docket and let's talk about an author that very few millennials have read or uh who who they've come across but they really should uh stanislaw lem now uh this book is the siberiad by stanislaw lem and i have also the futurological congress read both of these love them both so stanislaw lem is a polish author he's kind of known as the polish philip k dick i've read a lot of philip k dick books i love them don't own any one of them because I never really I, I like what Philip K. Dick is, but I never really fell in love with any one of his books in particular. I would read them, I get the idea, I'd give the book away. Stanislaw Lem has had a much more lasting impact on me, and he's a very similar author. Conceptual science fiction, psychedelic science fiction. That it it it, it it um it sort of bends with the notions of reality, very surrealistic, especially the Siberiad. Uh, he's best known for his uh, his book, his novella Solaris, which has been turned not into one movie but two movies. I haven't seen either one of them, but it, it's about a living planet that, it, that it's it's intelligent and people it has the ability to distort reality on the planet. But it's so different from anything we've come in contact with that it's very very hard to discern what it's trying to do. So people go to this place and they have surreal experiences, uh, but it's hard to know. You know what are these surreal experiences is this you know is this the, the, an artificial intelligence talking to these astronauts or is this a reflection of their own subconsciousness uh, subconsciousnesses being reflected back to them and so that's a very delicious thing the siberiad actually i mean solaris is what everyone watches and what everyone talks about i didn't really think it was a particular strong stanislaw lem book um i prefer the siberiad this is a surrealistic take on um well, it's obviously a reference to the Iliad, but to be quite honest, I don't think it has anything to do with the Iliad in terms of its structure. It reminded me much more of Gulliver's Travels. It's about two robot makers who, who are themselves robots and who exist in a completely strange universe that doesn't seem to have humans in it. Uh, they, they, they build robots for a variety of different people who make requests to them and uh, they're sort of rivals and they, they they get into all sorts of completely ridiculous surreal situations where you build robots for purposes uh, you, you can't you can't even conceive of right um and it, it, it's a bunch of short stories and i remember some of them and i forget other ones but i do remember that i really love this book um the future of logical congress is basically an acid trip uh that it's basically this NASA trip. It's about uh, it's about the characters. They um, at at a congress to discuss the future. Uh, they're exposed to some kind of psychedelic substance, and uh, they they have a trip where they imagine themselves going into the future. And the 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 main feature is a future that's completely controlled by drugs, where technology has been arrested except for our ability to control perception through drugs. And, and that is, uh, you know, I, I remember it, with all Stanislaw Lem's books, um, what really st the reason why I love them, the reason why I own Stanislaw Lem and not any Philip K. Dick is the fact that there are all these little moments inside Stanislaw Lem that really hit me. Uh, they, they feel really meaningful and the images they conjure are really profound. Whereas Philip K. Dick, I feel like the concept is the story. Once you have the concept, you have the story. I know some Philip K. Dick people are really going to hate me for saying that, but it, it is what it is. Um, 
All right, so here is another book that every person who likes science fiction should read. A very difficult book and an absolutely foundational book that is out of print, very hard to find. This is A Voyage to Octaurus by David Lindsay. Now, this is a 1920s science fiction book of the same era of H.P. Lovecraft. This is not pulp. It's, this is actually one of the first serious science fiction books, if you discount things like H.G. Wells and Jules Verne and stuff like that. It's the first sort of post, um, post, post World War One science fiction that is not just, that, that that breaks the mold of just. Wouldn't it be weird if we built a spaceship and went to the moon? Wouldn't it be weird if aliens invaded? Um, this is really getting into modern science fiction, and it's the direct inspiration of of um, C.S. Lewis's The Space Trilogy. Now, David Lindsay, uh, A Voyage to Octaurus is about a seance where a person goes to another planet. Uh, and the planet is, again, unlike Voyage to the Moon or Voyage to Mars or, you know, any of the pulp novels, um, as he translates in space and time, uh, everything about his brain and his body is transformed as well to the point where he gets to the alternative world and meets the alternative uh, species. And he realizes that his perception itself is changing. He's, he's like growing arms and growing heads. And his ability to conceptualize the universe is changing along with his location. So again, you have sort of the book of the new sun experience where the narrator is unreliable and totally surreal. And the environment is totally unreliable and surreal. One of the early problems he has is that when he gets to the new world, his ability to imagine colors is completely... He has so we have three cones in our eyes. We can see red, green, blue, and every color that we see that isn't red, green, or blue is a combination of red, green, or blue. Which is why computers can represent colors for human perception in the form of just three, uh, three color, um, uh, three color uh, uh, dials, and we don't feel like we're missing something. Other species, such as butterfly or mantis shrimp, can hypothetically see colors that our brains can't even map. But in this world, the protagonist himself um, gets a new body that has more cones, that can see new primary colors. And he's trying to explain to the reader what it's like to see in a new primary color, which is something that's totally outside of our experience and we can't even imagine. That gives you an idea of what kind of book this is. Now, is it just surrealism for surrealism's sake? No, there's actually a philosophical message in this book as well. Again, this is this is very much like uh, uh, a Gulliver's Travels, where he's going from one weird thing to another. He's going from the land of the small people to the land of the big people, but it's 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 weirder than that. Uh, moreover, David Lindsay himself, I believe, was a mystic. He he was a person who's into seances. He was also a Christian. So what you see in the voyage uh, voyage to Octaurus is is it's a Gnostic Christian parable. It, it, it literally is a story about a demiurge, a, an evil kind of god that's ruling over a physical and material reality that in many ways is, is a veil behind a broader, uh, a more true spirituality, a truer god that we can reach through if we have the means to explore our, our inward feelings or inward emotions or inward spiritual intuitions. Um, it's, it's not wishy-washy, progressive, uh, um, Gnosticism, but it's much more of a serious, like 1920s. These are the people who literally were doing seances back when seances had their height in the H.P. Lovecraft era. Um, but this is um, this is sort of his work and his it, it's his it's his idea of spirituality put in in a science fiction adventure. It was a big inspiration of C.S. Lewis, who I think wanted to do. A, a Orthodox Christian version of um, Voyage to Octopus, which became his space trilogy. Again, a book I love, which I don't own. If everyone, if anyone wants to read just one of those space trilogy books, I would read that Hideous Strength, which is actually the last of the three. Um, unlike most trilogies, uh, the the space trilogy gets stronger in each iteration, not weaker. Um, and the last one can be read, read, it's so strong it can be read independently of the first two. And it's still a very, very good book. 
Uh, it has it's much more on uh, C.S. Lewis is much more on the point politically and much more on on the nose theologically, and 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 with David Lindsay, uh, the the Gnostic Christianity is much more subtle. It's much more behind the scenes. It comes off as something that Salvador Dali might write, uh, but highly recommend it. A hard book to find. You'll have to look very very hard for this and use bookstores or order it off a bookseller. This frequently is out of print on Amazon, or at least it was a few years back. It could be like um, Burnham's The Machiavellians. Uh, speaking of another out of print book that I highly value, this is my favorite Dune book that is not Dune. This is the Dune Encyclopedia uh, by a bunch of... Um, it's a, it's a, I think it was written by one of Frank Herbert's friends. I'm going to screen saver again. I apologize for this. It's funny, I wouldn't mind if it was a live stream, but because this is pre-recorded, uh, little pauses kind of, um, they get on my nerves more. This book is how you do canon, in my opinion. Uh, so, do, uh, so originally Frank Herbert wrote six Dune books. The first, was it the first, we did six, right? The first four are amazing. I love the first three sequels to Dune. I, in some sense, I think some of them are stronger than the original Dune itself. Even though I don't own them, I love them. The last two, The Heretics and Chapter House, are really, really weak. They're really, really weak affairs. You could see Herbert's decline as an author. Herbert actually, you know, he's only known for Dune, but he did a number of really good books. The White Plague is really, 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 really good. Uh, the Jesus Instant and The Lazarus Effect are amazing books. They're the actual, the, they were actually the inspiration for Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri game. And they have an enormous amount of spiritual allegory in them. Uh, they're, they're, they're really good science fiction. Uh, a little surreal, a little confused at times, with really good books. But by the time Herbert gets around to writing the last two Dune books, he's really declined as an author, and he's really milking the franchise. And although it's original and philosophical, they're incredibly confused books, and they end up going nowhere. I'd advise stopping with number four. But after that, his son started writing, guess, surprise, surprise, sequels and prequels that feel like they're rehashes of the original adventure formula that was in the original Dune book. And they're really, really bad. And Frank Herb or Brian Herbert, he takes ownership of the canon of the universe and he, he sets it up so that you can write infinite numbers of sequels and still have adventures going on. So it's more like Star Wars. Um, completely ruins the universe. To me, this is how you do canon. So this is a encyclopedia that describes the Dune universe written by Frank Herbert's friends and with inputs from Frank Her Herbert himself. What's delicious about this is that the encyclopedia itself is written as if it were an encyclopedia inside the Dune universe. So it's written as an unreliable narrator. So all you can tell from any given entries in this book or that the people who wrote it thought that this was the way things are. So it, it gives people complete liberty to, to go to the same subject matter in the universe and go, well, okay, well, the person who wrote this encyclopedia entry, they were just wrong about this. In fact, it was actually like this. You know, it was, there, there's, there's disagreement among authors about what actually happened. This is written like a history. So there's one article in this uh, Dune Encyclopedia that actually doubts the existence of the main character from 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 the original dune series they think he's a mythological like like people consider jesus to be mythological there's all these atheists that think that there is never a historical jesus which is absolutely ridiculous but you know any stick is good enough to be christianity with guys right uh, this is the same thing for the dune universe where one of the messiahs is maybe mythical um but this is just a delightful book it's fun to read as a book uh you know there's like there's there's speculations on how language looks uh, there's there's pictures of other main characters. There's charts on, on tarot cards, and images of of objects in in the books that um, that you might have imagined when reading the original Dune book. A great book. So when Brian Herbert wrote his sequels, though, this became no longer canon, and this went out of print. So it's very very difficult to find this, and it was never printed in hardback. So you know my copy is already falling apart, and I probably wouldn't own one if I um, hadn't uh, looked very very hard for it. So um, 
that looks like it's the end of my science fiction collection. I'm going to end the portion here. Uh, again, this is not all the science fiction I've ever read. This is just what happens to be on my bookshelf at this given time. Uh, you know, I've read much more than this, but you know, this is this is the nature of the video. So I'll see you in part two, where I discuss literature and the other fiction books I own. All right, so welcome to part two. I'm probably going to have to speed things up because I've got oof, probably about eight or nine shelves to fill and I'm barely on one. So in this section, I'm going to go over the literature and fiction that I have on my shelf. Uh, and again, in no particular order, just seeing how it comes out of the boxes. Um, wide variety of everything. Uh, first thing out of the box, this is my wife's collection of Mark Twain stories. You know, this is odd. I've never really been a fan of Mark Twain. Um, I am, um, I mean, I, this is always the thing. I always thought he was a very good humor writer, like Puddinhead Wilson, and his short stories are great. Um, I loved reading Tom Sawyer as a kid. I'm not one person, though. I, I can't really see The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn as one of the great, um, one of the great works of, um, Western literature or American literature. I, I still think that's Moby Dick. Uh, God, it's been a while since I've read anything by Mark Twain. Didn't a few years back he he had the um, his his last will, his last work was published as part of the executor's will because it was his last it was his last desire for that book to be published a hundred years after his death so that nobody he mentioned in the book would uh, would 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 have their reputation smeared. But you know. I don't think anyone really commented much about it when it came out. Okay, so the um, next book on my list is something that I can comment on. Kipling. Um, I I am maybe not the biggest Mark Twain fan, but I absolutely love Kipling. I don't think any child should really go through uh, their young... Uh, they should not go through their childhood without hearing the, thus, the, the Just So stories. As a matter of fact, just so story is, is is sort of an archetype of of a way of thinking, in my circles. But but that being said, also the Jungle Book. Uh, Kipling was an amazing writer, an amazing speaker, an amazing essayist, and a and a great poet. Uh, his stories from India, his short stories are amazing. Um, his his magnum opus, most people consider to be Kim. Another great one people don't talk about nearly as much is Captain's Courageous, which is the typical, I mean, it's it's almost a stereotypical story of this uh, this rich kid that's, I forget exactly the circumstances. He's, um, he's taken aboard a, a ship of hard sailors and is eventually uh, taught how to be tough and, and persevere in, in the face of adversity. And so it's a, it's a classic tale, a classic coming of age. Uh, great author from the early 20th century. I kind of associate him with, um, oh, who is the author? Conrad, The Heart of Darkness. Uh, Conrad also had a very, um, uh, you know, a very early 20th century perspective. Uh, but I don't highly recommend Kipling um, if you haven't. I, I would wonder, you know, if you're if you're an adult, where the best place to start would be. I maybe say the short stories are fairly good. The poems, obviously. Uh, are essential. Uh, if you haven't read If, uh, you know, that's a great poem. Uh, not to mention Gunga Din's, um, well, rather un PC edition. So, this is a book. Uh, this is a book that I have lent. This is like the fourth copy of this I've owned. This is the collected works of Flannery O'Connor with her uh, patented peacock symbol. Flannery O'Connor is one of my favorite authors, and Unlike Kipling, who I don't really have a good place to start in, maybe if you want to read Kipling and you're an adult, you could start by reading Kim. I I don't know. I felt that one a little bit difficult. It it seems it just dumps you right in the middle of Imperial India under the Raj, and it sort of feels like that's on a place that very many people would feel comfortable being. It, it, it's not like imagine what it would be like living in India under the Raj. Is that something that comes to your mind very easily? It's, it's not to mind, right? And so it, it can feel like 
it can almost feel like a science fiction novel where you're dumped into this alien world. And it might be easier just to read The Jungle Book, which is a very, you know, it's a very, The Jungle Book is a very typical Romulus and Remus story. And if you, everyone's seen the Disney version, right? So you have some place to start. But the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the written one is, the written one and its attendant short stories is much, much richer and much deeper than what you'd get from Disney or anything else like that, very predictably. But Flannery O'Connor um, is an author that's actually very accessible because she mostly wrote st- short stories. Now, most people have read uh, A Good Thing is Hard to Find, uh, but really any of her short stories are amazing. Uh, you know, the there are some gamer words in the title of her short stories. I opened up to one. Uh, the River is uh, is very good. A Good Man's Hard to Find, again, is the one that everyone will have read. Um, the Lame Shall Enter First. Basically, all of her short stories are amazing. Uh, they're from a genre called Southern Gothic. And uh, I think I've talked extensively about Southern Gothic. It's one of the classic modes of American fiction. These are people like Cormac McCarthy, William Faulkner, uh, obviously Flannery O'Connor, things, uh, movies like Night of the Hunter, which I believe was a short story too, but I'm, I'm blanking on who wrote it. Um, but Flannery is my favorite. Every one of her short stories is has allegorical elements that link back to her Thomistic worldview, Catholic worldview. And, and even if you don't like the religion or don't want to hear about the religion, um, what, what comes in from the aesthetic is a deeply medieval worldview that, that somehow has found itself in a, into 20th century Georgia, which is, of course, the heart of Southern Gothic. Gothic is the chief aesthetic motif of the Middle Ages. And Southern Gothic is the transportation of that medieval motif into a new world context with new issues. And it reveals in that transformation perennial truths that you can't get anywhere else. If I were to give you one short story that I thought was essential, I think the one that would be the one that comes to my mind the most, and I hope I'm thinking of the right one right now, that's everything rises must converge. Everything that rises must converge. And uh, the, the, there's no way I can really describe it via plot. It's a short story that's 10 pages. I would highly read it. And it's it's not something that I don't know. A lot of people read it and they don't get it. And uh, then when they talk to someone about it or they read it a second time, they kind of do get it. And it's one of those things where if you can't see what's at stake, uh, it's hard to explain it. It's it's hard to explain what, what makes the story so powerful and it makes it so cutting. But what it really reveals um, something very deeply human. That's one of the great problems with modern fictions, with modern movies in particular, is they lack a certain human quality. They go through the plot and they hit all the right notes. They hit all the right declensions and, uh, and, and, and rising plot elements to keep you invested in, in the plot. And of course, they're very beautiful. But no one really believes in the things that they're talking about. And they have a hard time capturing those very human moments that define our lives and that really color it and give it the meaning that, that we, we carry with us for the rest of our lives. And Flannery O'Connor is the master of that. She died very young. She died at the age of 37 from lupus. And so she, and, and so she wrote most of her works understanding that she was in possession of a fatal disease that would eventually kill her. And I think that that colors her worldview. It, it allows her to see the god of the small things and of the human the human dimensions of everyday life that really get passed over. And it, it's not that her books, I mean, obviously A Good Man is Hard to Find is incredibly violent. It's, it's very famous for being a violent short story. And so if you want sort of to come into her world with a bang, uh, start there. But but in many ways, she finds her true genius in, in the smaller stories, like Everything Rises Must Converge. And of course, I might mention her novel, which might be a book later on in this collection. If not, I'll, I'll mention that my favorite novel of hers is uh, Wise Blood. Um, <laughs> hey, it's the first book that I just haven't read. This is The Cloister and the Hearth by Charles Reed. Now, um, this book was listed by a number of my, uh, 
number of the parishioners in my um, former parish on the West Coast listed this as being one of their favorite books. It's about the Middle Ages. Um, but then I, I got it uh, and a bunch of people told me that it was overrated uh, and it was uh, completely superfluous. And I, I put it down and I never picked it up again. And now I have this, you know, this beautiful edition of this book. It's, it's, I really don't have anything to say about it other than the fact that I haven't read it. <laughs> but that's what you get from, uh, from real... I, I, I'm told that it's sort of... It's one of these books that was written in the late 50s, early 60s, I think. And, and as such, I believe there, there are a lot of maybe 1960s ideas that get kind of injected into the medieval context. And that might strike some as being fake or artificial. And, 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 and I think they can irritate a lot of people. A lot of people, one of the books that oftentimes people like in addition to this book that, that is highly run down is uh, Gabron's The Prophet, which is another one of these traditionalism meets New Age spirituality meets uh, incarnated in a book that could only have been written in, in the early 60s. I, I believe it was written in the early 60s. Um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of run down uh, because of that. Oh, my father gave me this book, uh, Otto von Horvath's Youth Without God. I hate to say this, but I have not read this book. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the realism. Anyone who owns a real book case will have a lot of books that they have read, haven't read. Um, I don't know why this is even in my fiction collection. This is Tolkien's analysis of the story of Cuervo. So uh, a, he is, Cuervo is a, a, I think he's a Swedish, it's, it's an epic poem, a very much like Beowulf, about the tragedy. It's kind of like Oedipus mates Beowulf, uh, this tragic hero who's, um, who unwittingly, I think he unwittingly marries his sister. Like all things Tolkien, it's this ingenious analysis of, of, the, of the poem which I haven't read in its original form. Um, you know, there's this line from this, this movie called uh, Metropolitan about this, um, this college student who's trying to rub elbows with all of these sort of hoy ploy old money kids. And um, he, he doesn't read any of the actual books. He just reads literary criticism of the books because the literary criticism not only tell him what happens in the books, it tells him the correct opinion to have about those books. <laughs> so that's, um, and that this is, literary criticism so i guess it, it belongs in, in the literature section at least a little bit i will say that i know the story of cuervo because um the the classical music composer sibelius who's a great composer everyone he's he's one of the great late 19th century early 20th century composers a predecessor of minimalism in a lot of ways a bridge between romanticism and minimalism he had a very sparse approach to music and a very a very basic one, a very primal one. And you know, Symphony Number no. Two is amazing. I love it. And his opera is is that story, and it's very like Viking oriented. Lots of like chanting. I, I really I listen to the Dawn of War soundtrack because I'm looking for like wordless music uh, that that's like really epic. And there are a few passages from from this video game soundtrack about space marines that I. I swear to God, are lifted note from note from Sibelius. Uh, so, um, yeah, that is what it is. Oh, hey, another Flannery O'Connor one. Since I give them away so often, uh, I have multiple copies. Um, this one has the entirety of A Good Man is Heart... Uh, sorry, it has the entirety of Wiseblood in it. And Wiseblood is absolutely my favorite Flannery O'Connor. It's one of her two novels... And it is amazing. It's brutal. It's gothic. It's violent. It's spiritual. It's surreal. It has everything a good book should have. And it's deeply, deeply human. So I've already praised Flannery O'Connor enough. So I feel like I can pass over this one with just the caveat that everyone should be reading. Um, everyone should be reading um, uh, uh, Flannery O'Connor in her entirety altogether. This is just the night of books that I haven't read. Ulysses. Now, I have read... Um, did I read Dubliners? I reported with an artist, and I think Dubliners, of James Joyce, but I never read Ulysses. So, 
surprise, surprise, the two books of his that I have read aren't here, and the book that I haven't read of his is here. I bought this with the hope that I would read this. A Portrait of an Artist is great. I'm not so sure that I really, it was really, you know, I would wonder if it would, I read this more or less at the same time I read uh, Herman Hesse's, Be- uh, Herman Hesse's, not Beowulf, Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf, and Steppenwolf impacted me a lot more. But um, I am, I don't know. I, I really should read Ulysses. It's, it's, it's supposedly a really great book. And the, the sort of early 20th century Irish Renaissance, the modern Irish Renaissance is something that kind of fascinates me. Um, one, you know, I'll talk about this in the poetry section, uh, sort of a predecessor to this, this movement in Irish fiction is, um, is, uh, is one of my favorite poets, uh, Yeats. Uh, who is, again, a bridge between modernism and romanticism. Uh, Speaking of short stories, uh, the complete works of Franz Kafka. Um, This is, oh, Franz Kafka. The dust jacket's completely shot. That's the thing. I I really want to throw dust jackets away when they look like this, uh, but, you know, I'm told never throw away a dust jacket, right? Um, I consider... Uh, Kafka to be essential reading for living in the modern world. <laughs> Obviously, in right wing, I mean, Kafka is a brilliant writer, uh, a brilliant understander of the modern condition, and a brilliant critic of modernity. And in its sort of inhumanness, his stories are cold and they're paranoid. They have rightly been, well, not rightly. I mean, I don't think ethnic criticisms are ever. Uh, accurate. I don't think you should ever dismiss an author because they have an ethnic persuasion of one variety or another. And Kafka is an absolute genius. But I, I, I'm not alone in believing that you know his take on society in Austro-Hungary it definitely is colored by the fact that he comes from um, a, 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 a religious minority that is very definitively not one of the approved standard minorities that existed. Not a Hungarian, not an Austrian, not a German. Um, you know, do the math. Uh, but you know, so I'm sure a lot of the alienation comes from that particular ethnic circumstance, which I don't, you know, is completely unenviable. But he also captures just something very deeply true about the human condition itself. Uh, the two most famous of Kafka are the Metamorphosis, where the main character wakes up uh, transformed into a giant. People say cockroach. I think it's actually a dung beetle. Uh, and it's it's not really concerned with why this transformation has occurred, but rather just the difficulty of living life in the modern world as, um, as this transformed creature and, and how little it changes from his depressing existence as it, ex- as, as it, as it was before his transformation. Um, and, and, uh, and the, the, uh, Ones that people mention oftentimes are, um, you know, um, the the trial. Well, the trial is not a short story, but the, people will mention um, the penal colony or the hunger artist. Um, those are very good. Okay, um, hey, one of the more recent books I've read, uh, Moby Dick. I feel like people ask me about this every single stream. Uh, I'll just say that this is my vote for what the great American novel is. A lot of times it's not what people expect. People expect a deep character study of Ahab. This is not a deep character study of Ahab like you'd find in Dostoevsky. This is more along the lines, I would say it's actually closer to something like Pilgrim's Progress. This is a journey. This is a sea journey across a variety of adventures um, through which I think certain allegorical truths are revealed about the nature of man and his struggle against the elements. I would say that Ahab, he does have deep modern psychological elements, but I feel like he exists in Moby Dick more in archi- more as an archetype than as sort of like this deeply complex character. Um, but he, but but even as an archetype, uh, the the power and and the the weight he has in the story is unmistakable. And of course, he's the person everyone remembers from the story of Moby Dick. Much less so the the novel's autistic narrator, Ishmael, who who's just obsessed with learning all elements of of whaling in the nineteenth century. 
which actually, you know, this is a funny thing. People skip over the books about the, the chapters that are dedicated entirely to whaling, but they, but they actually are, in many ways, the, the best parts of the book. Um, they, they are the parts of the book that, uh, that are... Um, how should I put this? Melville takes you on journeys inside these digressions uh, that feel like... What makes Moby Dick so kind of powerful in a lot of ways is the is the feeling that the feeling that it is a modern myth the feeling that uh the characters are like they're real characters that have real psychological dimensions that should not be downplayed but in this hunt for the leviathan they have taken up arms in in, in a broader struggle a struggle that man always has against the elements, against to, uh, to conquer the horizons, to find the beast and to slay it. They are participating, uh, maybe in folly, in, in the classic battle against the beast, the classic struggle against the, the creature of chaos who, who will devour the world in the end times. The Leviathan is literally the creature of chaos. Uh, the waters of the earth representing the, cha the primordial chaos that existed um, you know, when God forms the universe out of nothingness or out of meaninglessness. And um, and so what I think the strength of the book is, is that the archetype and the, the, the true psychological uh, fate of the, uh, of the protagonists are in tow. They're, they're in complete lockstep. And it's that interplay that gives the book, I think, its real power. But no, I'm not about to write a master's thesis on, um, on Melville. So I will... I probably should have organized these a little bit. Um, uh, another recent book. Okay, this one you can tell I've read it recently. Uh, War and Peace. Uh, great book. An amazing work of fiction. Again, I, how, I could sit and talk for probably an hour on War and Peace. I could do a live stream on it. I don't know why I'm holding it up. Only to show that the cover's been torn off of it. Because once you, you know peel back a book this large eventually starts falling apart if it's in a trade paperback the way they print them these days what should i say about war and peace it's worth it. it it's it's deep in areas you might not think are deep uh it apparently and i learned this afterwards through isaiah berlin i learned through his essay the fox and the hedgehog that one of the characters in this literally is joseph de Maestra. Joseph de Maestro was obviously the arch reactionary, one of the founders of the school of thought that we talk about endlessly on this channel. Uh, he went to Russia after the French Revolution and became both a Catholic apologist for the Tsar's court and also sort of a political advisor against uh, revolution, in which, of course, de Maestro's recommendations were never give the revolutionaries an inch. And according to Isaiah Berlin, one of the, uh, the, the background characters is actually a parody of de Maestro. And in fact, what, what you will see in the Berlin essay uh, is that de Maestro's uh, traditionalist view of history. Uh, so I should say, this is a character. So, like most Russian novels, War and Peace is a character study, like Crime and Punishment, like the Brothers Karamazov. It is also a. Um, it's also a. It, it also is sort of a, a shadow treatise on uh, on history, and this was Tolstoy's magnum opus for him to prove definitively or to illustrate definitively uh, his view of, of history as being sort of this large cosmic force that humans in their infinite folly think they can influence. So, you know, we think that we have impact on politics and that we can buy our decisions and buy our activism, that we can steer the course of events. But really, we are more the, the pawns of these events than we are their author. And in the meantime, you know, while we, 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 while we and our hubris think that we are um, shaping the world with all this epic stuff, all of these little human moments that really give life meaning, where God really exists, they all flow by the wayside. They all get, they all get disregarded, and people convince themselves to do all sorts of cruelties, which in the grand scheme of things have more impact than these large events that they have really convince themselves are, are, are the most important thing 
uh, in, in the course of their lives. So again, you know, I don't know. This is not a light undertaking, but definitely worth a read. Um, we are not uh, going <laughs> in a direction that is light here, I'm sorry to say. Um, so I guess two books that I... So I used to run a, a book group for my, for my Catholic community, and two ones that came up um, that I got for it, and we never read these, are Nikos Kazanstaki's The Greek Passion and Willa Cother's Death Comes from the Archbishop. Now, I never read Death Comes from the Archbishop. I did read Zorba the Greek, um, which is Kazanstaki's most famous book. Uh, I watched the movie for The Greek Passion, which is, I think I gave the, the Zorba the Greek away. And, uh, Again, I think you have a hard time finding. So this is the Greek passion is about um, it's it's a it's about a Greek village that that's occupied by the Turks. I believe this is in the early 19th century, and they are putting on a play about uh, the passion. They're putting on a passion play, which implicitly becomes um, this is sort of like the Moby Dick thing that that the the characters who who've been selected to act in this passion play paradoxically start taking on roles in real life that are like the roles that they've selected in the passion play. So as they're preparing for this passion play, they become their archetypes in real life as they, as they, as they struggle against life under the, the, the rule of the Sultan and the rule of the Muslims. And so it's, it's sort of a, it's a political allegory. It's sort of a romantic political allegory. And, um, and, uh, it's also it also is just a human interest novel as well. I, I think that people oftentimes I think people are less fond of Kazanstaki's relative to someone like Tolstoy because I think he puts a lot less emphasis and has a lot less insight into the human condition. And you know, obviously, I think his politics are a lot more crude. I think that uh, the Greek passion and and Zorb the Greek they have explicitly nationalist elements inside of them. It's very obvious that uh, you know the Greek passion is about the desire for Greek nationalism, and and so I think that this 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 uh, these sort of nationalist opinions are considered by modern critics to be a lot more crude than um, than than sort of the Tolstoy's uh, you know grand vision of of a headless history that that sort of wraps up humans in their humor hubristic desires to seem like they want to matter. So I think it oftentimes gets kind of given short sh short shrift. Um, another one of my favorite novels, I think this is going to happen a lot, and I'm, I'm realizing this more and more, is that when it comes to literature, less so with science fiction, the two reasons why I have a book in my collection is I've either read it, and it's one of my favorite books of all time, or I haven't read it and I plan to read it in the future, <laughs> right? So, so expect to see a lot of books where I haven't read them or I've read part of them. Or this is one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, you can't avoid this book. Um, and this is, uh, this is one of the latter. And this is Dostoevsky's, the brother, Fyodor Dostoevsky's, The Brothers Karamazov. This book, I... I think I've only read it once. I've only read it completely once. Um, I've actually read this first, and this is kind of surprising. Usually, you know, you get these paperbacks, the, these these hardcover books that look like this, and you don't actually read the hardcover book. You read like a, a paperback, right? Which is like War and Peace with its its cover torn off. This one I've actually read. Um, I've actually read the 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 hardback version. But the Brothers Karamazov is, uh, it's one of Dostoevsky's magnum opuses. This is one of his longer books. And this is, nobody does character study the way that Dostoevsky does. Not Tolstoy, uh, not, not Jane Austen, uh, not Charles Dickens. Dostoevsky is the master of the psychological character study. No one before or after has ever done, uh, done it like he does. And uh, the Brothers Karamazov is his best one because it's his most diverse range of emotions the obvious one that everyone tells you to start with is crime and punishment sometimes i'll tell you something like the gambler or the idiot but you know, if, if i'm a if you never read anything by dostoevsky you should read crime and punishment 
I own that book. My wife's currently reading it, so it's on her nightstand and not in this bookshelf. But, you know, you, it, The Crime and Punishment is one story about one person who does one thing and the consequences of that thing. It, it's a very tight picture. Brothers Karamazov is broad and sweeping. It doesn't have one main character. It has three main characters. And it's got a bunch of little sub-stories inside of it, each which, which have these very, very... Each one of the sub-stories could in and of itself be an entire novel and, and be one of the most prominent novels in, in late 19th century, early 20th century literature. And it's really amazing. It's really that amazing. Certainly, if you were to... Um, ask what you know what, what's the most famous thing to come out of the brothers karamazov it is the sub story called the grand inquisitor about uh jesus returning to the world and uh being caught by the spanish inquisition in a dialogue between him and an inquisitor from the spanish inquisition i, I think um you know warhammer uh fans will notice that uh theodore karamazov is uh, uh who uh, theodore karamazov is the person who tells the story or, yeah, I think it's, I can't remember if it's Ivan or Fyodor. Fyodor Karamazov is the person, I think, who tells the story of the Grand Inquisitor. And, and one of the Inquisitor characters in Warhammer is, is, is Fyodor Karamazov, e.g. The, the Grand Inquisitor. Um, but I cannot recommend Brothers Karamazov enough. My only caveat is that you probably don't want to start with uh, Brothers Karamazov. I mean, you could. It's not like it's a hard book. It's not like it's any harder to read than Crime and Punishment, but it's a lot less focused. It's a lot less, it's a lot more, he does, you know, usually Dostoevsky doesn't do this so much. Everything in a Dostoevsky novel is like, is an integral part of the structure of the novel. But in Brothers Karamazov, he does do a lot of side stories where it's difficult to at least immediately figure how it builds into the larger theme of the novel. So that's something that, I don't know, keep it in mind. Anything else about Dostoevsky? Probably not. Oh, who knew it? <laughs> Another one of my uh, all-time favorite books. Um, so everyone knows that I have mostly here male authors, uh, and and um, you know I need some diversity here. So... Why not a female author? Uh, George Eliot, don't let the name deceive you. George Eliot is actually a woman. Her real name was Marian Evans. I, I mean, she wrote after Jane Austen did, so she certainly didn't need a male pseudonym to write. But I guess, I guess she felt more comfortable keeping her, uh, her literary personality separated from her, her real one. And, and a pseudonym was the way she did this. So here I have George Eliot's Middlemarch, which I think is... She's also famous for writing Solness Marner, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's so short, it might be a short story. It might fall within those boundaries. But um, speaking of people who care, do amazing character studies, Middlemarch is about Victorian England after the Reform Bill. So this is really what we would call liberal England. So the Reform Bill is really what extended democracy. And you, you can see, you know, Jane Austen writes for the Regency. And her characters are aristocrats. They are very, very tightly ensconced inside a class system. They don't really work. They're not professionals. They're they're landed gentry. They manage the affairs of their estate, but they do not engage in in professions the way that the commoners do. This novel is about sort of the upper middle class of early Victorian England, and it's all the characters have professions. But what you see here is, 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 a, is a character study. It's a story of marriages and of women who get married and have families and the problems those generate. Uh, but, but this time, and it's, it's told with the same wit and force as something like Pride and Prejudice. But I felt here, A, it's a lot less romantic than Pride and Prejudice. Um, you know, there's a lot of unhappy marriages. Uh, B, um, B, the, the, because of the class dynamics, I felt like the characters in Middlemarch were much closer, they're much more relatable uh, for people who come from a modern professional class. Um, you know, they actually have to get up and go to the office. They're not just hanging around on, on, on their palatial estates, you know, arguing over inheritance all, all, all the live long day. And, you know, George Eliot, it's been, I think, 10 years since I've read, read that book. But it's amazing. She has, she has, 
you know, she, she, she's, she, like a lot of other 19th century authors, are really experts at capturing those, those moments of poignancy and character study inside, inside crisis. And, and, and really bringing out the heroism of everyday actions done at just the right moment. Um, see, you can't help but kind of be bored with your own book collection because you guys don't know these books, but I certainly do. Um, another book, Walker Percy, The Second Coming. I've read like four Walker Percy books, and this is not one of them. <laughs> uh, the, the Walker Percy book, which I don't have in my collection, but I have read, and it's excellent, and everyone should read it, is Love in the Ruins, which is Walker Percy's speculative fiction about what a future United States would look like if the culture war of the 60s had kept on going. And um, it, in, 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 in this fictional world, civilization is tearing itself apart due to a mental health crisis that is bubbling up, and, and that's hence the ruins of the whole, the whole endeavor. I feel that Walker Percy is sort of a prophet of the human soul. He was a Catholic author of the 70s, and in many ways he characterized uh, Orthodox Catholicism in, in exile in many ways. Uh, I, I think he, he really informs the modern Catholic imagination of the John Paul II variety. Uh, Walker Percy is also very famous as being the author who discovered, um, he discovered the transcript of Confederacy of Dunces, which is a very, very funny novel. I, I might have that one. But anyway, I'm not going to belabor the point uh, of a book that I haven't read, just to tell you that I've read the author. Um, another book, a collection of provincial fe uh, French folk tales. I think I've read one of these, and I don't remember it, so I'm going to put this one on my shelf. Uh, provincial folk tales turned into short stories. Very good. Um, another one of the books that I haven't read, The Song of Bernadette. I've gotten a lot of recommendations for that book um, and uh, haven't gotten around to it yet. Someone, you know, someone might want to tell me that I should put some more time into that, but for now, we'll sit on my bookshelf. Um, my favorite C.S. Lewis novel, Until We Have Faces. This is a retelling of the tale of Cupid and Psyche, um, from the C.S. Lewis's allegorical imagination, he turns the myth into a character study of, um, of the ugly stepsister. And, uh, you know, I, the, the inverted fairy tale, man is it overdone, but this one is worth it. Uh, C.S. Lewis really creates a beautiful story. Uh, he creates a story with a lot of spiritual meaning in it, uh, spiritual meaning that I think you can access even if you are not a Christian. If there was one book I could give to neo-pagans and ask what they thought of it was, it would be this book. I would want to know what neo-pagans or pagans' opinion is of, of this book and of C.S. Lewis's ethical uh, learnings that he draws out of this story of Cupid and Psyche. So uh, for people who don't know, Cupid and Psyche, Cupid is the god of love and he wounds himself with his own arrow and he falls in love with this woman, Psyche who he's supposed to be killing um, and uh, because, because she's loved more than, than, than Venus. And um, Psyche has to go through, she, she's, because she's loved by a god, she's outcast from her community and she has to go through all these trials and it's a Beauty and the Beast type deal. Uh, a very beloved story from romantics or in people who like romantic stories. Um, it's... Um, but this is this is the best version of it, or, or the version I think that that communicates a lot of meaning and a lot of um, power. Um, a collection of Ambro Bierce's short stories. Uh, Ambro Bierce was a poet, a short storyist, an essayist. Also, mysteriously disappeared in Mexico uh, around the turn of the century. One of the most famous disappearances of all time. Uh, very nice, considering he uh, has. Um, he, he was a ghost story writer. Uh, I've read several books from uh, this collection, none all of them, and um, they're good. I, I was ever, you know, I think I think uh, I preferred Turn of the Screw to Ambrose Bierce's short stories and uh, also M.R. James's 
uh, uh, ghost stories to Ambrose Bierce, but I don't think I have um, James's Turn to the Screw or uh, MR James on the bookshelf, so I'll give the recommendation in lieu of, uh, of that. Um, okay, well, this shouldn't even be in the fiction section, so I guess I'll put it on the other shelf over. But this is a collection of the um, expository essays of uh, Flannery O'Connor, which I mean, I think she was quite good at. She was a very wise woman, and her her essays and reflections and literary criticism are are just spot on. They're delightfully witty. Uh, they have just the cutting. They have the same cutting dimension as her prose does. Truly, a genius that was that was taken before her time. Um, okay, so here's a here's a Catholic author. A great author of the 20th century. I shouldn't say Catholic author. I feel like it puts them down. But this is one of the best authors of the 20th century um, that people oftentimes forget about. Graham Greene was a Catholic, uh, and his stories contain Catholic um, philosophy in them. Uh, I think Graham Greene is the most famous for writing The Third Man, which was, again, famous. It became an even more famous uh, it became even, an even more famous um, movie with Orson Welles. My father's favorite movie, in fact, because my father was a, a refugee um, from Eastern Europe who found himself, the, 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 the place where they ended up was Vienna uh, at, in 1946. And so um, that's where The Third Man takes place. And um, it's about living, it, well, it's about someone visiting post-war Vienna in 1946. But it, but it captures the mood of the city, the occupied city, perfectly. Um, Graham Greene is also known for The End of the Affair and The Quiet American. Um, this might be his most famous single story, but it's about, uh, a, 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 it's about an author uh, who has an affair with a married woman. And um, I, again, it's a, it's a character study. It's hard to really explain. Uh, but the woman ends the affair um, uh, for mysterious reasons, and then dies. And it's about him trying to figure out her reasons for for ending their love affair, uh, kind of after her death, I believe. Again, it's been a few years since I've read this book, but it was definitely very good. It was um, it was um, highly appreciated. I, I read this book in uh, the a Catholic book group that I was I was running at the time. Um, Return of Martin Gear, another medieval book about a knight that returns from the Crusades. This is on my to do to read list. I bought all of these books for the same purpose of eventually being read in my book group. We got through about ten of tw ten or twelve works, but all those um, I never got around to them. Okay, well this is a little bit embarrassing. Uh, well, I guess these almost are more fantasy or science fiction. So the last book I gave to my wife to read is Watership Down. Um, so this is a book about rabbits. It's a book by Richard Adams. Uh, I think he wrote it in the 50s. But it's about uh, the Yorkshire countryside and this, this colony of rabbits that's being displaced by a construction project. And they have to escape from their, their warren and, and build a new community. And they have to do this trek across the English countryside with all the danger that entails uh, for little rabbits. And of course, it's told from the point of view of the rabbits and they have their own mythology. It was turned into a very dark children's cartoon with John Hurd as the voice of the protagonist, which is really funny. Um, and uh, it's, it's good. Uh, it's really good. I always, um, my wife loved it. I always think of Daughter of Albion when I, um, when I uh, see this because it's kind of like, her, it's, it's bunnies, Plus ye old England, plus right wing death squads, uh, yeah. So um, Watership Down, definitely. I, I liked it a lot as a young adult, but I never really looked back on it much as an adult. Uh, my, again, my wife absolutely loved the book, so um, you know, uh, obviously it can definitely appeal to adults. It's it's, it's written for adults. There's a lot of uh, serious elements on it, but I mean, you know. You're not going to get a deep human character study by uh, a, you know a, a story about rabbits. Uh, probably a step down from Watership Down uh, significantly. Uh, I, I picked this up at a used book sale. Um, this is Redwall. This is a fantasy series that 
uh, I was really into as a child. Again, takes place in um, ye old England, uh, but this time it's it's not a realistic England. It's not like uh, it's about animals who who create a, a monastery, but it's highly fantastical. It it's basically medieval England, like but but with mice and rabbits and and stuff like that. And it's it's a very standard fantasy adventure, but with furry animals. Uh, you can see why this appeals to why this was like my favorite book in fifth grade. Yeah, I think I read it like four times when I was, um, I don't know, 11, maybe. <laughs> All right, so that's the first of the literature boxes down. On to the next one. Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, the, the bucolic English countryside about little animals keeps on going with the wind in the willows. Um, I read this book as a little kid, loved it. This is actually, I, this is a little hard though, right? Because um, who is the author? Graham. He's a deeply poetic author. I have to unlock this thing again. Um, but he also, I mean, it sometimes interferes with the story. So if you're reading this as a kid, you're going to go for chapters. One second here. Where where all, all that happens really is... Uh, is is they just talk about uh, walking through the countryside or something like that, or they take a boat ride down a river, uh, and and so it's an incredibly simple story. It's an incredibly linear story, uh, absolutely poetically beautiful. You know, when I I got this one, I made sure to get the one with the pictures. Uh, again, I think most people will know the Wind in the Willows from Mister Toad. Uh, this was turned into a Disney cartoon in the '40s, sometime. Not a very popular one. But everyone knows Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. He's he's the crazy aristocrat, uh, you know, um, old money that that blows his family's fortune on motor cars, and it eventually comes to ruin because of it, and has to be bailed out by his good friends, who are the more responsible country gentlemen, which I think really embody uh, what the virtues that 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 um, this author was trying to get across. Um, I'm trying to think of what to say about Wind in the Willows. It's a beautiful book. Its best parts come in the moments where it's not actually advancing the plot, which is both its 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 strength and its weakness. Uh, you know, the the chapter Piper at the Gates of Dawn is probably the best chapter of this book, um, but it's uh, it, it also does not advance the plot at all. <laughs> it's also not it doesn't advance the plot at all. All right, so interesting. Um, interesting. So this is um, this is the book that I was reading when I met my wife. Uh, this is a, a very good book, a modern book by uh, Eugene Vodolazkin. Um, it's called Loris. So all you ortho bros out here, you should read this book. So this is a book about a knight in early medieval Russia. So this is just when the Golden Horde is getting pushed out of, of, of Russia. Uh, this is about a knight who, um, uh, well, I, I, his, his, his love dies and he breaks uh, his vows. And it's him looking for redemption in his knightly quest. This is a really fun book. It's a really good book. It's the last book that it was actually published in, in you know, after 2016, I think, or... No, it couldn't have been published in 2016. I read it in 2016. Uh, it was published post-2012, where I, I picked it up and read it, and I, I was like, wow, this is a good book. This is entertaining. This feels like it has something to say. It feels like the author actually believes in this book. Um, I, that being said, it, it's not great literature. As far as I can tell, it's no Brothers Karamazov. Uh, although I do think of it every time uh, I see the the, the, the the sort of based ortho ortho bros, the, the the reactionary Orthodox church people, I always want to recommend that book to them. I mean, if you if you're a Russian Orthodox, don't you want a really cool story about a crusading Russian knight in the early medieval ages? You know, that would be pretty cool. Um, all right. Um, okay, here we go. So I already mentioned Walker Percy. 
Um, let's talk about the book that Walker Percy is most famous for not writing, but for discovering. So Confederacy of Dunces is one of the most comedic books um, of the of the 20th century. It's absolutely hilarious. Um, it's about this sort of fat incel, but it, it's, it's from the 70s, right? So in case you were thinking that fat incel 4chan posters who were obsessed with the Middle Ages um were were a modern invention they're actually not they were around apparently in the 70s and um this is this is the original guy that wears the 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 hat the, the fat guy that wears the the hat with the flaps on it very famous in literature his name is ignatius riley and he, he's obsessed with boethius and this is always a problem i always feel that silence of the lambs ruined q lazarus's goodbye horses this book ruined Boethius because this absolute idiot who, who's, who's book smart, but an other, an other more and otherwise constantly quotes this uh, Boethius and, and talks about how we should be going back to the Middle Ages and it's completely oblivious. Does this book have a broader message? No, I don't think so. I don't think like The Second Coming or, or like... Um, or love in the ruins that that this has some kind of cathartic message, but it is delightfully funny. Its comedic timing is perfect, and um, yeah, tragically the author of this wrote the book and then hung himself. And his mother was trying to get it published, and she was turned down by all the publishers until she brought it to Walker Percy. Walker Percy read it and absolutely fell in love with the book, and thank God. That we have this amazing work. I mean, it's a tragic that the author um, perished, but but I mean, you no, know, his uh, his uh, his comedy lives on, if nothing else. I, I always find, and that's always a very tragic thing is is sort of suicide of authors. I never, it's difficult. I'm realizing sort of a theme here. I have more than a few of these things that are come from uh, bucolic English countrysides. Um, my, my wife always asks me for books that she should read, and she likes books that have a bucolic uh, dimension to them. And so, you know, I go back to my, um, I remember this book in particular from my uh, time living in England. So for a, about a year, uh, I lived, uh, my parents were working in England, and I lived in England. Um, it was a town between Oxford and London, uh, some suburb. Um, and um, while we were there, uh, my my mother took the opportunity to really push reading uh, English books, or, or some, sometimes they were read to us. And this is uh, uh, right at the top of the list of books I remember. The Secret Garden, it's the story of a, a young English girl. She's raised in India um, by her careerist parents who just leave her in the care of her Indian nanny. And uh, they, they perish uh, due to a disease outbreak, and so she's sent back to England. And with, with absolutely no understanding of her native land, of her native culture, um, of, of her, uh, of, of, or, or how to take care of herself, she's, she thinks that all the servants exist just to wait on her hand and foot. And she has to relearn not only what, it's, what it means to be sort of an embodied person who exists in the real life, uh, but but also what it means to have a connection to the land. And she takes the learning that she's learned for herself, and she's able to teach someone else those same virtues. Uh, an absolute, absolute, absolutely magical book. Um, again, it comes from the early 20th century. Um, I, I'm not particularly fond of this stupid version. It, it literally has like pop-out inserts into it. Like I wanted an illustrated version. I, I didn't want a scratch and sniff version of this book. Uh, but you know, that's what I got for my money. Um, so, you know, one one book is and the text hasn't changed, right? They didn't change the words, and it's it's still as magical and it's in its updated form. And um, I, I should ask my wife. I actually I haven't read that copy of the book, uh, but I am. Um, I uh, I should ask. Um, I should ask uh, uh, my wife what she thought of the illustrations. Um. Speaking of another book, this wasn't a book that I had read. Um, uh, this is a book that was read to me as a very young child, and I think I read it myself, The Little Prince. Uh, this is a delightful French book. 
uh, about a um, an alien. It's kind of like E.T., but he's the he's this little prince that comes from the world's tiniest planet, and he has all sorts of. It's it's one of those things where the the point of the book is the childlike perspective. I, I consider it very much like um, it's a very. I, I think that was written in like the forties, but. I can see how it got popular in the 60s because it's just the, the image of, of the young child who, by his innocence, by his alienness to the adult world, he sort of unlocks all this wonder and joy uh, that, that the author who encounters him uh, is, is unaware of uh, and that was, that was around him all the time. And of course, he has stories of the adventures he goes on. It's a very delightful little book. The problem is I have no idea what the right age group is for the little prince it doesn't play well to really little children for sure and it doesn't play well to it doesn't play well to maybe it's more for adults like maybe it's more a book that adults read because they think it's something that a child would read who knows well okay yeah i said that the book that i wanted uh pagans to read was uh c.s lewis's until we have faces I came up with a better one. Sigrid Unset's Gunnar's Daughter. So Sigrid Unset was uh, part of this uh, pagan revival. Um, not, not pagan revival, but you know, native European revival in the early 20th century, along with people like Tolkien and all that sort of stuff. Um, and she, she wanted to write a modern edition uh, to, the, to the, the poetic Edda, the stories of the Vikings. And so she read Gunnar's Daughter, which is a story that's remarkably like the uh, the the Northman, the movie that came out. This is being recorded in 2022 uh, in summer, so the Northman has just come out. And the Northman reminded me of this book, with the exception of the fact that this book has a cathartic, meaningful ending, and the Northman was just meaningless violence. But it's it's very similar, right? A a, a, a tale of brutal people and a brutal crime that needs to be revenged, and then eventually a quest for revenge and counter-revenge that's, that's resolved, that's brought to a head in a meaningful way. And Sigrid Unset herself was uh, a devout Catholic, and, and she brings that perspective to this, this tale, uh, this, this pagan story, uh, and, and just beautifully marries the two of them in, in a manner very much like Tolkien. Um, Tolstoy's The Resurrection. Everyone tells me that this is the book that I need to read of Leo Tolstoy. And I haven't read it. <laughs> so I can't comment on it. I don't know. Tolstoy is just... It just isn't... It's not quite the same as Dostoevsky. I don't know. It's, it's, he's really good. He's really good. Now, don't get me wrong. He's in a brilliant uh, character study. Um, I don't know why I have this book on my shelf. It's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Roger... Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. Roger Louis Stevenson. Robert Louis Stevenson. So Robert Louis Stevenson's probably most famous for for uh, Treasure Island, which is the book that I probably would recommend people read of his. Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. What can I say about Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde? It's a good book. It's a like most Victorian horror. It's epistolary. And I don't know about you, but I don't like epistolary horror. I couldn't do... I mean, I read Dracula twice. Good book, great book. There's something about reading somebody's letters that makes it so that I can't I can't get afraid of that story. I know that probably for the typical Victorian reader, reading letters that contained scary things in them was their equivalent of like the Blair Witch Project, was their equivalent of the found footage horror movie. But for me, it kind of removes it. And there's also the problem with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Does anyone not know the secret of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Does anyone know? I, I guess I can't say it now, but does anyone not understand the relationship between Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Is that, is that something? Because I feel like every, every you know, horror movie or a rendition of horror movies or a parody of horror movies contains that archetype. So it's not like you get to the end of, of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and are shocked by the revelation, right? Uh, so, so there's that problem. 
Forty Days of Mogadishu by Franz Verfel. Is this a this is the second book by Franz Verfel I have? I don't know. I haven't read that book, so I'll have to. I'm how 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 bad is it that I haven't read a ton of books in my shelf? Probably not that bad. I mean, that's most of the reason why you have books is to read them in the future. But I think we're going about seventy percent of the these I have read. Um, or, or again, I either haven't read them or I really like them, right? Um, an essential book for everyone to read, Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness. Uh, this is absolutely a critical book of the 20th century. I compare Conrad... Ooh, that kind of startled me. <laughs> um, a little close to my head. Uh, I compared Conrad to Melville, I think, initially. Um, this is the imagistic... This is the inspiration for um, Apocalypse Now. And uh, it's the story of somebody who's sent to recover uh, a, an imperial administrator that's, who's gone native, who, who's taken up, he, he was sent to rule these African tribes as an imperial governor, and he is, he's taken uh, to ruling them like a witch doctor. And, and it, it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's a brilliant the the author captures in horror the the nature of humanity laid bare so the the idea is is that uh, sure enough um you know this this guy has gone native and sure enough the the natives in this this african area are just total savages uh they they're they're totally possessed by by chaotic impulses uh, they have no understanding of of modern morality or these niceties of empathy. And, but at the same time, they're more human because human's nature is dark, is degraded, is chaotic. So what, what you know, I, maybe I'm spoiling this, right? But the, 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 the lesson of Heart of Darkness, the horror, and that's literally a line that's very famous from it, the horror is the fact that he discovers in his path into this, uh, this dark continent uh, that that his own civilized niceties are an illusion and and that that this is actually a picture of, of humans in their native element and that is what this imperial administrator has discovered again if you are a fan of um, uh, of apocalypse now um, you uh, probably will enjoy that book um, Okay, there's a lot of books here. Um, I love this. I, I don't love this book in particular. I love this author. Uh, so this is Babette's Feast, although I don't think this is uh, the book. Babette's Feast is a short story that appears in this book. These are stories by the author Isaac Dennison. Now, Isaac Dennison, again, like George Eliot, uh, Isaac is actually a woman. I forget what her name was. Uh, Kirsten something something some Nor some some Danish name, um, and so uh, the famous one's Babette's Feast, which was turned into an Academy Award winning movie about this French maid who's working for these austere 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 Calvinist Protestants, and she wins the lottery and she spends all of her lottery money to put on this elaborate feast for her um, for her hosts. To teach them just how valuable uh, bodily pleasures can be to, to bring back people in the spirit of communion. And so, uh, this is Babette's Feast is supposedly Pope Francis's favorite movie and one of his favorite short stories. And um, well, this is a very, you can see why Francis likes this, right? Uh, Basically, it shows um, the Babette's feast is supposed to be all, all, all of these people's lives. They've tried to pursue spirituality through austerity, through denying themselves things. God existed as a negativity, as a reason for things not to happen. Uh, but, but this French maid teaches them that, that God can also exist in a mode of celebration and embracing physical uh, pleasures in some instances. And, and that's, um, I don't want to say it's spirituality through indulgence, which might, 
indicate why Francis likes it so much. But but it toys with that idea a little bit. You know, I'm not gonna. I, I, okay, Pope Francis, he is a wonderful man. He's a wonderful pope. He is the the seat of Saint Peter. Um, no criticism whatsoever. But if you're going to read Isaac Denison's short stories, so I should say Isaac Denison's most popular work is her memoir Out of Africa, which is also turned into a movie about her uh, uh, owning a plantation in, in Africa for a brief period of time and, and her having an affair with this other man. Uh, but the best short story of her short story collections is uh, The Sorrow Liquor, which also explores the dynamics between the pagan soul uh, of, of, uh, of this aristocrat and this peasant and, and their Christian one. And I think Isaac Denison was one who, who really, again, she was like a lot of these other 20th century, early 20th century people. She really struggled with the dual draw of the pagan spirituality and the Christian one, um, both pulling in different directions. Okay, so this is another great comedy. Um, I mentioned this on my last live stream. This is Bulgakov's The Master and Margareta. It's a story about Satan coming to Stalinist Russia uh, prominently featuring this fat, vodka swilling alcoholic cat. This book is hilarious. I've read it three times. I love it every single time. It roughly retells the story of Faust, which is what the reference is. Uh, Margareta is a character in Goethe's Faust, and the master refers to Mephistopheles or Satan. Uh, I don't know what the meaning of this book is, other than a satire of Stalinist Russia. But man, is this funny. It's delightful and it's well written, and I can't recommend it enough. Um, speaking of another comedic early 20th century novel, this one from the Irish Renaissance, uh, a contemporary of, um, was it a contemporary of James Joyce? If not a contemporary, someone who, who kind of came close on the heels. This is Flan O'Brien, uh, the third policeman. Okay, this book this is a surreal story about this insane uh this insane working class guy who becomes obsessed with this esoteric i don't know why he, i know this guy this this guy is irish but it's a sort of autodidact who becomes obsessed with this literary figure and um subsequently subsequently murders somebody and is 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 trapped inside this kafka s surrealistic police station from which he can never escape uh but so it's very much like kafka in the sense that it's paranoid but it is absolutely hilarious it is um it's delightful from page to page it's surrealistic it's a little bit paranoid and it at the same time it's also thoroughly irish it thoroughly comes from that that, that very um and it's a kind of irish thing where you know a, a good scrap can always resolve all issues and some, sometimes the simplest answer is always the preferred one. Um, Flan O'Brien also wrote this novel, At Swim Two Birds, which I'm told is his best work, but I haven't read it. I might actually own it. I might, it might be one of the ones that I pull up and I haven't read. Um, this is a book that I keep on trying to get my wife to read, another cozy uh, book, Anne of Green Gables, um, who wrote this again, Montgomery, of course. Um, so this is sort of the cozy Canadian uh, story of a girl coming of age in early 20th century Prince Edward Island. Uh, it's, it's delightful. It, it paints a picture of early Canada that is, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. Like it's, it's like a different world. You can't imagine modern day Canada coming from that place, but somehow it did. And it's, 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 it's magical enough that the characters are um, are very interesting. Anne, uh, who's an orphan, she's adopted by these two austere Protestant brother and sister, and um, she's kind of she she grows up in in this community, and she she has to decide between her ambitions to become a writer and her 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 love for this other man. That's sort of the chief, um, and also her relationships to other characters. And it's her, it's her learning more wisdom about the world and about what's truly valuable. It's, it's just delightful. When I first saw it, uh, or first, well, actually, truth be told, I did see the BBC version of the movie before I read the book. 
When I first saw slash read it, the focus was all on the character of Anne and the subsequent characters. Now, when I flip through this and read a chapter or two, the focus is 100% on the vision of what Canada once was. It was, it was a place that had, it, paradoxically, it had more identity, more understanding of itself as a British colony than, than it currently does under Justin Trudeau. Well, I guess, I guess that shouldn't be surprising. But um, good nonetheless. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to mention this one, Winnie the Pooh. Um, is this actually the... In yeah, no, this is... This is I, I thought this might be a commentary on it. Um, Winnie the Pooh. I, I haven't read this particular version, but I remember growing up with Winnie the Pooh. Is Winnie the Pooh deep? No. Uh, is it is it well written? Yes. Uh, and it, it comes from the same tradition of Wind in the Willows. Something was in the water in, 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 in Britain in the early 20th century that just had story after story, all of this cozy literature, all of these classics that we'll cherish for hundreds of years in the future. People were just churning them out. It's, it's actually, I, I'm actually in awe of this period. I think people like the, I think people like the Franklin are too. So I noticed he mentions it quite a few times. Um, here's another classic, uh, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. Uh, so everyone knows Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver is the same man who travels to a variety of places. Um, very famously, because this was usually part of the animated features, he goes to the island Lilliputia, which everyone's small and he's a giant, and the island of Bron uh, Brondabong, which is uh, where, where he's small and everyone else is a giant, right? Um, uh, most people don't realize that every one of these expeditions of Gulliver is a political satire or a satire on the Enlightenment. And the, 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 first, so the first two books are the, the, the land of the little people, the land of the big people. And, and in those first two books, Swift lays out basically what he thinks is the pettiness of European politics. And then the land of the giants, sort of his ideal utopia, I think. But the satire only really kicks in in the second two books that people forget. And the second two books are the island of, Lula, uh, of, of uh, La Puta <laughs> um, and, and the, the, the island of the Winhams and the Yahoos. Now, the island of Laputa is the flying island. If you've seen the Miyazaki movie, you know that Laputa is the island. And if you were really a deep lore appreciator of Miyazaki, you'll know that the island of Laputa, the Laputa Castle in the Sky, couldn't be called Laputa Castle in the Sky when it got its Spanish release, right? Because what does Laputa mean in Spanish? It means the whore. <laughs> so Laputa, in Swift's analysis, is the island of the scientists. And in it, he describes scientists and, and Enlightenment thinkers uh, in all their insanity, uh, doing things like uh, crushing cucumbers to try to extract sunbeams and constructing uh, plans for building houses like spiders. And all of the scientists in this, in this uh, flying um, castle or island, they're always talking about the music of the spheres, the music of your, the spheres. If you only had our intellect, you'd hear the music of the spheres. And uh, so that's where the expression, the music of the spheres comes from. When you're talking about uh, some kind of arcane and esoteric academic discipline, the only people who are part of it can appreciate, they, they call it the music of the spheres. So that, that's, that's uh, he, he, Swift reams the Enlightenment in, in that book. And then he goes on to the story of the Winhams and the Yahoos, where Gulliver lands in, in sort of a Planet of the Apes-like situation, where in this island, humans are savages, and the horses are the intelligent species, and the humans are called Yahoos. And that's where we get the word Yahoo. Um, you know, uh, the Yahoos are the savage humans that this race of intelligent horses has subjugated. And in, in this... Um, in, in, the, in the last book, uh, Swift basically says, like, well, humans are just animals. We're, we're no better than savages that just are, are murdering each other over mud. Um, okay, we're coming down to the end of this. i got to make this good. Uh, okay, well, let's get this out of the way. Flynn O'Brien's at Swim Two Birds. I already told you I hadn't read this. 
The third placement was good. I can't imagine this would be a disappointment. So sort of a recommendation on that one. Ah, two Japanese books here. I have Satsuki's Endo's Silence about the persecution of Christians under Tokugawa Japan. This was turned into a movie like three years ago. I discussed it at length then. Uh, a very difficult book for Catholics to read, but, but good, I think. And the book I'm currently reading, I'm not going to shelve this, uh, The Lady in the Dunes. Uh, this was um, it's by Kobo Abe. And it's about an a, a amateur entomologist who's trapped in, in this village that's being consumed by sand. And he has to push it away or, or the sands of the desert will consume the village uh, come dayfall. Uh, another sort of theater of the absurd, absurd type thing. Okay, this book. Roberto Bolano's 2666. Uh... This is Bolano's last book. It's supposed to be his best one. And um, I've, tried to fit, I've tried to get through this book two or three times, and it has defeated me every single time. It's about a serial killer. That's one thing. But the thing that, um, the, the, what always stops me is for, for the first 500 pages, it's only about academics arguing over this fictional author who doesn't exist called Archimboldi, who's a German author, who's supposed to be someone like um, Hermann Hesse, right? And, um, and I, I can't stand stories about academics. So although I've been recommended this book multiple times and I really should read it, I just, I can't get into it. I can't get to the point where I feel like I'm actually uh, able to, to, to process this because I, I hate the characters. So that might eternally be not fully read on my bookshelf. Um, I have Boxen, which is a series of uh, fairy tales written by uh, the young C.S. Lewis, I think in college, or I think when he was actually a child. I read some of these, they're very good. Um, kind of a deep cut from C.S. Lewis, most people don't have this one. Uh, then I have... Um, Two of these annotated fairy tale books. One is the annotated Alice. Um, it's written. It's annotated by the mathematician Martin Gardner. Um, I don't know, guys. If you hadn't read Alice in Wonderland, you're missing out. But you probably didn't need me to tell you that. Um, you know, Alice in Wonderland was written by a mathematician, and he has all of these kind of little word games in it. Again, is there any element of Alice in Wonderland that hasn't been thoroughly discussed? Uh, I don't think so. I'm, I'm trying to mainstream Humpty Dumptyism. Humpty Dumpty is the character in Alice in Wonderland who believes that words only mean what he thinks they mean and, and nothing else. Like they, there's there's no agreed upon meaning of words. Um, and, and and you know I always this is how modern progressives think, right? Um, but the, the the joke is in Humpty Dumpty's case with C.S. Oh, sorry with Lewis Carroll is. Uh, Words, words are 100% arbitrary, but if they only mean what you think they mean in any given usage, then the whole purpose of language is immediately, the objective purpose of language is immediately defeated. Um, okay, so one of, another one of my favorite fairy tale collections is Hans Christian Andersen short stories, or not short stories, fairy tales. Now, Hans Christian Andersen is not well beloved by most modern um, most modern uh, children because his stories are so insanely dark. Um, you know, I'm thinking The Little Mermaid would be a good example. Uh, obviously turned into a Disney movie. Uh, spoiler alert, it does not have a happy ending in the, in, the, in, the, in the Hans Christian Andersen version. Although I think it has a more edifying ending than the Disney version does. It has a much more spiritual ending. Um, another great one from this collection would be The Ice Queen. Uh, the Ice Queen is a story about uh, this demon uh, that, that steals away this boy and his sisters attempt to find him. I, I do believe that The Ice Queen was the inspiration for this new movie, Frozen. 
but they they changed around all of the lessons and all of the uh, all, all of all, all of all of its messages. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. Everyone's favorite uh, story to to make a kid cry: Little Match Girl. Uh, if you want your kid to to ball his or her eyes out really really quickly, read them the Little Match Girl because man, that's a tearjerker. <laughs> I don't know if it even has any other point other than for you to feel horrible after reading it. Um, but this is what Victorians loved reading their kids. And it's very well written. And it's, and it's a very good story, actually, you know, even independently. And of course, there's other classics like Thimbelina. You know, most people don't remember Thimbelina's Hans Christian Andersen, but it is. Anyway, very good book. Um, and then last but not least... Um, a book that has been very close to my heart for a long time, Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf. Now, I'm not going to talk much about this. I might be uh, mentioning this in a video I make soon. But this is a, um, a wonderful character study about an isolated man in Weimar, Germany, and his alienation from society, uh, both of the bohemian variety and of the sort of bourgeoisie variety. And he associates himself with the Steppenwolf, the Lone Wolf. Um, Hermann Hesse is a delightful writer. He has a keen philosophical insight. Every one of his books is really interesting. He was kind of a shitlib of uh, his era. He was kind of a shitlib of the early 20th century. Uh, for instance, I, I was heartbroken to find this, but Hermann Hesse was one of the originators of sort of the anti-white diatribe. Uh, there is a, I think the book, I think the short story is called The European, uh, and um, it, it was published in like 1921, and in it you'll find, you, you'll see the predecessing seeds of sort of white self hatred, uh, in in that short story. He explicitly like just poo poos the the entire European race. Uh, so you know, I, I we we overlook that. Herman Hesse is a great author. I would not consider him to be a spiritual master. I would consider him to be sort of in the thrall of a lot of enlightenment ideas that we now know to be kind of naive. Uh, but but the questions he asks and the, the imagistic framework he puts forward are just delightful and they're powerful. And I think people still would be well served by reading Seppin Wolf. Well, I can't guarantee that that's all my fiction, but apparently this is the last in my uh, literature box so i'll close there with this part and i'll see you again i think i'll be starting in on history and politics all right so welcome to what i think is part three if you might have noticed, I've shifted the camera a little bit. Uh, I'm recording this over multiple days. A day might have elapsed. You might notice that my five o'clock shadow has grown a little bit. So uh, I shifted the camera right now because I'm coming to the largest genre in my collection of books and I decided to shelve them on my little mini bookshelf here. And uh, you know, I, I need to organize ahead of time so I don't run out of space while I'm shelving these things. You know, I, Forgive again the scruffy look. I, I kind of intentionally, I, I'm, I'm moving, so <laughs> this is just how you look when you move. And I think it kind of adds to the atmosphere that this is just informally going through the books that I own and explaining why I like them. So I guess in this section, we'll be doing the, the politics and then eventually working our way into the history books that I have. Again, this is not every book on politics I've ever read. Uh, read. This, is even, this isn't even every book on politics that I like. This is just the ones that happen to be in my bookshelf. And hopefully they're enlightening. They'll give you some ideas of what to read. I'll be able to explain why I think these are good books or, or bad books or whatever. Um, and I guess we'll start with, um, well, we'll start with this one. A beat up copy of uh, The Constellation of Philosophy. By Boethius. Ugh, God, this is this book's in terrible shape. I read this about a year ago. I think I read it over last summer. Um, a great book. Uh, certainly, it's hard to find a, a book from this period. This this book is written during the middle of the fall of the Roman Empire. So Boethius was a contemporary of King Clovis, who is sort of the first 
Christian king of France, or someone we could call a Christian king of France. Uh, he was sort of a transitional specimen between just a pagan Frankish barbarian and the, the kind of later kings we associate with medieval kings of France. But uh, Boethius is a Roman who's imprisoned due to a political change in the declining Roman Empire. And under these circumstances, he writes a book about uh, the philosophical life and why it's worth living. And he's discussing the misfortunes with um, the, a spirit of philosophy, a spirit of reason. Now, uh, you might remember me mentioning this particular book in previous sections because this indeed is the book that uh, the, the character, the buffoon Ignatius Riley, won't shut up about this particular text. And in particular, he won't shut up about the imagistics of the Wheel of Fortune. Now, uh, or, or Fortuna, right? So Fortuna or the Wheel of Fortune or the cyclical nature of fortune is a common motif in a lot of medieval literature and medieval philosophy. And you see it, I think, emerge in the first time very properly in Boethius. I'm not a scholar, so someone from someone expert on Roman history could show me up and say that it's actually a much earlier motif in, in Roman literature. Um, but this is the most famous one. And, and in all of these things, in all of these uh, pieces of literature from, from very early medieval ages or from the, the late Dark Ages or even from the Middle Dark Ages, I think you notice the consistent theme of the cycle of history. Uh, of of sort of the fickle nature of fortune, how people can be up or down. It's, you know, it's a lot of people, it's so funny because when you think of Boethius, he's a man condemned due to his own philosophy and his own, his, his own political positions, but he doesn't sit around uh, talking about the righteousness of those positions. If you compare him to somebody, uh, let's compare him to someone who came after or someone who came before, the followers of Socrates are deeply invested with this idea that Socrates was wrongfully accused. Uh, he was he was basically there was a grave injustice that forced him, well, I mean, forced him to commit suicide basically, or accept exile, which he chose suicide very famously. And the same thing is true for Dante. Dante was forced into exile by political circumstances in Florence, largely surrounding the conflict between the White Gulfs and the Black Gulfs. And he, he is obsessed with the political righteousness of his cause to the extent that he does an entire uh, political tract on it. But Boethius, what's so funny about his perspective on philosophy is how detached and philosophical it is. In, in some sense, it seems almost like the political forces that condemned him, I think to imprisonment and later to death, were, were more or less forces of nature, like they were a typhoon sent by an angry god. And I think that when you look at this, you know, more than anything I particularly got from, I probably need to read this again. This is the first time I read this book, or at least as an adult. And uh, I think I probably need to read it again because a lot of it probably escaped me about what I should be picking up from this book. But what I did note is sort of the, the philosophy that was existing in the background about politics. The idea that all things that are in temporal reality or are constantly in flux, are chaotic, are meaningless, and anyone who positions themselves so that their life draws meaning from these temporal things is going to be basically screwed over. And you see this a lot in Augustine when he compares the city of man to the city of God, to the extent that I'm, I'm really convinced at this stage that existing in a declining civilization like these two great geniuses did, I think they were within 200 years of each other, maybe even 100. The, the idea that it, it seems that, that human action itself becomes fatalistic, human action itself becomes naturalistic. It, you're, you're left less with questions about how to manage a perfect society than really just how to manage the flawed nature of the society that's collapsing around you. And that's really what Boethius goes into, not so much how you could fix Rome, but really how philosophy offers a way to touch something eternal, a way to touch something meaningful and to touch a thing holy uh, that, that exists outside the fallen nature of the political environment he lives in. And, uh, is that what you should be getting from the constellation of philosophy? I don't know, but that's what I got from it. So uh, first, probably first, well, not first chronologically because there's older Greek stuff, but um, a good place to start, I guess. Uh, well, the next one on the docket, um, much latter day. Uh, I have the latter day pamphlets. Um, 
Uh, I don't know where I got this. I think I got it online or something. I can't imagine I picked this up at a bookstore. Uh, so um, this is the Latter-day Pamphlets. For a while, it was very hard to pick up a copy of Latter-day Pamphlets, but very early because, you know, I'm a Curtis Yarvin fan, very famously. I, I tried to track this down, and this is the copy I found. It's really nice. It's like the wide print. <laughs> you know, you can read it like a newspaper. Uh, it's just a series of, I think, about four essays. Um, very famously, this is where you get the Carlylean perspective on order versus chaos and, and sort of the strong hand on the wheel of governance being, you know, th this is the political theme that comes up again and again in Carlyle's expository writing on politics. And and I think it's it's best encapsulated in the Latter-day pamphlets, although it's, you know, this, if you're looking for a political place to start with reactionary uh, readings, this is, uh, Carlyle's a very difficult person to read. His language and his style does not translate well into modern-day English. He uses massive run-on sentences, and the way he starts his paragraphs is never with what his paragraph is about, but just some random digression that will eventually land on his point in due time. So, as uh, Uncle Yar said, the way you read Carlyle is just to let it wash over you, and eventually you absorb the wisdom, and there's, there's an enormous amount of wisdom here. I'll never forget when uh, Yarvin said, you know, when, when you're reading uh, Carlyle, there's a temptation to perceive all of these confusing sentences as if they're filler jargon, as if you're reading some kind of modern postmodernist author like, um, say, Judith Butler, where a lot, of, or, you know, was it Bell Hooks, where there's just a lot of blather, there's just a lot of uh, filler to, to, to pad out the chapters when they could be just arriving at their point immediately. But Carlyle's thoughts are densely packed inside of his own, uh, his own prose. And when he takes these long Byzantine routes to arrive at his point, he's using examples that are carefully selected to illustrate the point in its entirety. And they're deeply considered. And that's why, you know, I think I've read this only once, but I could immediately tell when I finished it that I need to read it again. So uh, Letter Day Pamphlets, uh, I mean, if you're in our circles, you probably heard that one. One thing I would say about Latter Day pamphlets: usually, when I encounter these books on politics or uh, history, I'll tell you to go read them at Skeptical Waves uh, or or another audiobook channel who, who has free audiobooks. I might offer a, a big exception with Carlyle. I don't think that I, I I've tried to listen to audiobooks of Carlyle. It never works. I can't absorb the. Audiobooks, you read a sentence of Carlyle's, and many times I need to reread that sentence in order to understand it. If you put it on audiobook, you, know, you, you hear the thing in 50 minutes, 50 minutes go by, and you've absorbed nothing. Even if you're not doing something like playing a video game or washing dishes or, or, do, or, or sorting out uh, you know, your widgets or whatever, even if you're not multitasking, you can listen to a Carlyle essay on audiobook or audio format, and you'll, you'll absorb absolutely nothing out of it. So I think that that's... I would I would be careful of that. I would just read it if you possibly can. Um, another reactionary author I talk about a lot, uh, Joseph de Maestra. Uh, this is his collected works. Um, I think I've read all of them. I can't guarantee I've read all of them. I certainly I, maybe I haven't read all of the uh, the Saint Petersburg dialogues, uh, but uh, uh, de Maestra is my personal favorite of the old school nineteenth century reactionary authors. His, his, his wit is cutting. His prose is much easier to understand, even though it is being translated from French. And uh, he, he, he writes like a modern-day blogger, uh, albeit, you know, a little, bit more, a little bit more laboriously, with a little bit more verbiage, because he is indeed, um, you know, an author that was writing during the Regency, uh, basically Jane Austen's time, maybe a little bit earlier, a, a Napoleonic author. And... Um, yeah, he's just, there's this, this is dense packed. Uh, I don't know if this particular title, uh, every time I've been able to find a collective works by Joseph de Maestre, it's been this uh, trade paperback with, uh, with the foreword by Nisbet. And uh, I don't know, uh, I've, I recommend de Maestre any, any way you can find him. Uh, this is, you know, this is my copy. I probably talk a lot about de Maestre, but you know, he is, He's one of the original critics of the Enlightenment, one of the original people who lay out the problems with the democratic and liberty-based thinking. And he just does, does so in so many delicious ways. 
and and with a perspective that doesn't it doesn't feel like it's aged it feels very very eternal all right um we're going quickly through the the politics section as i anticipated we've got a lot of books to go through maybe i'll put this one off <laughs> uh Alexander Solzhenitsyn's book, well, it still has the tag on it. <laughs> I've read one essay out of this. Uh, I, this is a collection of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's essays. Uh, the essay I wrote was very, very good. Obviously, this is one of the, the, the person who suffered under the gulags and very famously wrote Gulag Archipelago. And uh, his essays are very, very much on point. Um, Jordan Peterson talks about him endlessly. Uh, and he's got a, a good insight. Um, you know, I don't know. I just... I don't really feel like I understand Solzhenitsyn's perspective uh, on, on much. I feel like I, I know him uh, from, from what Jordan Peterson has told me about him, uh, from the essay I've read, from obviously the Gulag Archipelago. I know that he was a, obvious a critic of the Soviet Union and, and later a critic of, of modern America. And, and because of that, he's sort of a, a, a reactionary go-to author. But I haven't had a chance to work through all these essays, and I certainly... You know, unlike De Maestra or Carlyle, where I feel like I've read, you know, enough so that I kind of, I kind of get the idea of how they write. I, I have no, I have no broader opinion of Solzhenitsyn other than, you know, the little I've read of his. Obviously, I think if you're looking for a person who can make insightful criticisms of modern systems, uh, Solzhenitsyn is right up there with Christopher Lash. Uh, just a great resource for that. A very insightful person and someone who... And someone who lived a life, who suffered for his beliefs in a very real way. And because of that, you know, a, a lot of us, everyone experiences politics in, in some degree. But very few people have the experience of Dante or Solzhenitsyn, where the political reality disrupts their lives in a way that they can't walk away from. You know, obviously we suffer under inflation. Obviously we suffer under thought control. We, we suffer under lockdowns. But I think it I think it becomes slightly different when you're just tossed into jail or tossed into a gulag. And I think you get I, I don't know, street cred's overrated, obviously. But um but in my book, you definitely for whatever street cred is worth, you pick up a lot of it by being jailed for being a political distant. Um this is one of my favorite books of all time. It's not really a politics book. It's I really should be under theology more than politics. But this is G.K. Chesterton's Orthodoxy. This, more than any other book, uh, was what really took me from deism to Christianity uh, and, and then later Catholicism. Uh, this is one of the most brilliant works of apologetics ever put together. Uh, usually, you know, people are familiar with the William Lane Craig version of apologetics. They're familiar with the C.S. Lewis version of apologetics, where you're essentially building up, pardon me, you're essentially building up arguments on top of, of assumptions about what people already believe. But G.K. Chesterton's perspective from orthodoxy is quite a bit different. Uh, he starts on this meandering autobiographical tale about why he himself became Christian, and then eventually ends up on these sort of profound truths that Christianity, or I should say God belief, and then later Christianity provides, and how the, these have been eternal lodestones to his own life. And... And, and how he essentially, I think in his own words, he says, this is how I found Christianity and, and the teachings of Jesus to be a truth-telling thing. And, and this was a very powerful, those words were a very powerful tool for me to understand spirituality and religion going forward. The idea that you could be in contact with a form of spirituality where you're not just reinventing the wheel, but you have a relationship with a truth-telling thing that is continuously guiding your own development. Um, so pardon me, guys. I, periodically, my computer falls asleep, so I have to wake it up by uh, entering the, the password. I hope that's not too distracting when my hands go forward like that. Um, but that being said, I don't want to spoil this. If anyone is interested in Christianity, if anyone is in sort of a, a mode of religious exploration, if you're, um, if you're Christian yourself and you just want to hear an incredibly insightful portrayal of, of a journey towards Christianity logically and, and insights into Christian wisdom. I can't recommend orthodoxy enough. I recommend it for atheists. I recommend it for Christians. Not really about politics. I guess it's going on my politics shelf because I think I, 
I store politics and philosophy together. And I certainly consider it a philosophical work, if nothing else. Uh, here is another book. Um, this is, has a this is library uh, laminated dust jacket, so you probably can't read the title. But this is uh, written by G.K. Chesterton's good friend and fellow 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 developer of distributism, Hilaire Belloc. Uh, Hilaire Belloc was a Frenchman, so G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc were two Catholic thinkers who developed distributism. And G.K. Chesterton was much more on the literary philosophical side, and Hilaire Belloc was much more on the economic side. And he was interested in developing an economic perspective that took the best from sort of classical economics and the best from uh, the best from Marxist or socialist economics. And I think he gets a lot of things wrong. I think Belloc tries to resurrect elements of the labor theory of value, which I think just should be left for dead. I think that's the greatest weakness of Marxist, or the, well, materialism is the greatest weakness of Marxist thought. And they attempt to cross Paul Knight materialist approaches with, with idealistic ones. But, but, it, but this, aside from, from that general dialectic materialism that is a giant mistake, the biggest problem with socialist thought is the labor theory of value, and, and Belloc tries to resurrect it in his distributist texts frequently. So I always take them with a big grain of, of salt, but I appreciate Belloc's insight into, into an economic perspective that is focused on human well-being above just jamming numbers up and up and up and up. And that's really how we should be thinking about economics, is how do the economics improve the prospects of us being human and not how they increase the GDP. So I always try to, I am always, I don't think I've, I think I've read like a chapter of this book. Um, obviously I've read The Servile State, which I'm probably gonna get to in my box. That's a classic. Um, economics of Helen, I bought this text largely because uh, it's Economics for Helen. Helen's my wife's name. So uh, I gave this to her as a joke, like, oh, hey, you can learn about distributism because this is economics for you. Hiller Belloc wrote this, um, I believe he, he wrote, he wanted to write a treatise on economics that was so simple and basic that he could give it to his niece, who was named Helen, and she could understand it. And she was, I think, 13 or something. I think the entire idea of doing that with economics is quixotic to the extreme. I don't think economics is a science that ordinary people should be largely concerning themselves with. It is, as Carlyle famously put it, the dismal science. It, it is horrifically complex and, and not something that is prone to elegant solutions. And any basic formulation you can make is inevitably false that will lead you down to innumerable horrible uh, conclusions if you work on it logically. Uh, economics has to be done practically and, and with a lot of heuristic approaches, a lot of rules-based approaches. And, and so coming up with economic systems and then handing them off to 13-year-olds and say, here, advocate for this. I think that's a really bad approach to politics and economics. Um, so, but it's a, it's a cute book and from a great author, uh, a, a great polymath. He also did a series of children's books that are very famous and not to mention he did a lot of work with G.K. Chesterton. So that's another really good one. I probably have a few Hiller Bellock. I, I apologize if I'm uh, batting away from my nose. There's a lot of dust in these books. So, um, yeah, it is what it is. Um, all right. What do we have here? Hobbes's Leviathan. Um, so I bought this book recently so that I could reread portions of the Leviathan. Now, I swear that I, I was assigned reading of the Leviathan for my philosophy class in, in, um, in, in, in freshman philosophy, but I don't remember the book being this large. So I actually got to some of the later chapters where he talks about the Christian Commonwealth and assumptions about, uh, you know, about about uh, what how how government should be organized, whether it, it should have sort of explicit morals built into it or not. Obviously, Hobbes is very famous for the idea of the state of nature being the bellum omnis com, contra omnis, the war of all against all. Uh, his description of the state as the Leviathan that necessarily has to come into existence. And his idea of sort of, uh, I don't think it's his idea of the social contract, but his idea that the Christian commonwealth is put together to sort of negotiate this incredibly lamentable situation. Uh, when we don't have some Leviathan to rule over us, we descend into chaos. 
And this is why we have to come to peace with some kind of, uh, of very powerful government that will keep this impulse in line. Uh, obviously, uh, the part where he talks about um, the very famous war of all against all, man in a state of nature, uh, that's very famous. Everyone should read it. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff, a bunch of stuff about his assumptions, about the imagination, about reason and science. Uh, this is a very thick volume. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could you could probably you could read this for a while and and, and say where is the the beef? Uh, but I you know I've been actually with, with all these books I should say that uh, when, whenever you come to a classic text, it's always dangerous to skip over and just hit the good parts. I've been burned by that a bunch of times. Uh, for instance, in this very book, I remember getting into a discussion with with Matt uh, McManus about whether Hobbes was somebody who opposed teleological preconceptions being used in politics. Now there are a few passages in inside, um, you know, inside Hobbes's Leviathan that imply that he sort of he has this kind of Machiavellian perspective where uh, politics is just sort of input output. There's there's no idea about what should be about what the final cause is for a political body. It just does what it does, and this is sort of the the engineering manual for politics, and um, and this sort of applies a sort of functional atheism. Now. I totally missed this on, on my uh, original like college read through of this book, and then uh, later I was going back and looking at it, and I did research on on, on it uh, like kind of cursory research for an internet debate you do, and you know certainly these passages are there, but you know then there are other passages that contradict that, and this sort of idea of this Hobbes being a functional atheist was something that apparently Hobbes was accused of during his lifetime and he vociferously denied, which of course didn't stop. 20th century leftist authors from resurrecting Hobbes as an example of why, you know, teleology has no place in politics or, you know, oughtness or morality has no place in politics. But again, this is just, this is the problem with all of all books like this, where it, this is just such a foundational text that to read it is to read it is to essentially misread it. To read it is to, there's no way that you're going to be able to, uh, on one reading, uh, find all the things you need to from this book. Uh, certainly not as an undergraduate and not even as an adult or a full adult reading this book. Uh, so you need to have a certain amount of humility. You need to say like, okay, I've read this, but you know, I didn't understand it all. Uh, there's probably a lot of stuff that went over my head. There's probably a lot of passages that I thought were just filler that, that I disregarded that, that are actually essential planks of his philosophy. Uh, I think you just have to have a lot of humility. Modern texts usually are very light on ideas. Like I said, they're, they're, there's like one idea in a modern book on politics and then everything else is fillers, examples. And so it's very, very easy in a modern book to get to the thesis, uh, toy with it and just go, I disagree. But if you do that with these magnum opuses where, where these geniuses spent you know, decades writing these books, um, you know, there's not a lot of fluff in here. Everything in this book, he probably agonized over. So, you know, holding this and this that I read Hobbes' Leviathan, yeah, I've read Hobbes' Leviathan, I probably understood like 10% of it. You know, I understood the basics of his philosophy, I think, and I think that, you know, I learned something from that, right? And that's what you really have to hope when you read Hobbes' Leviathan. Another thing to always keep in mind is uh, it's always good to understand the time period in which these authors were writing when they're writing about politics. When you talk about Chesterton and Belloc, they're inseparable from the early 20th century. When you talk about Boethius, Boethius is inseparable from the Dark Ages and the declining and, and the dying Roman Empire, I should say, not the declining, the, the Roman Empire in its death throes. There's no way to explain Boethius without that. And similarly, there's no way to really understand Thomas Hobbes without the English Civil War. Without the English Civil War, without the long parliament, without the tyranny of Oliver Cromwell, without the execution of Charles I, the questions that Thomas Hobbes is asking himself just wouldn't be imminent. And the political crisis he's trying to deal with just wouldn't be imminent. The idea is how can men be good, uh, well-governed uh, when so many political systems have failed us, when, when monarchy seems too weak to hold on to power, and when oligarchy seems to be, you know, when, when oligarchy attempting to be guided by Christian principles, which is arguably what we're dealing with right now, what happens when that falls through and leads to blatant misgovernment, which leads to 
in my opinion, I'm not, I think Hobbes' opinion as well, outright tyranny and outright misgovernance. And, and you know, that is the context in which Hobbes is writing. And so everything he's talking about when he talks about proper Christian commonwealth, when he talks about the state of nature, when he talks about anarchy and the Leviathan, it's all in the context of Charles I. It's all in the context of Oliver Cromwell. And so I think if you think that way, it's a lot easier. Um, this is a departure from this. This is another book, uh, Thomas Nagel's Mind and the Cosmos. So Thomas Nagel is to atheism what uh, Camille Pogli is to feminism. He is the heretic atheist. He is the atheist that points out, uh, oh, hey, there's a spanner in the works. This idea of creating a material model of everything, it's not going to work out, guys. We, we, we don't have a handle on this. He's not a Christian. He doesn't believe in God. He doesn't go in for the cosmological arguments for, for, for um, higher powers. But when atheists like uh, Sam Francis or atheists like Daniel Dennett are telling you that they have consciousness figured out, that they have the entirety of existence completely modelable uh, through computations and through mathematical formulas, um, this person comes in, Thomas Nagel comes in and tells them that they have no idea what they're talking about. So Mind in the Cosmos, along with the rest of Thomas Nagel's work, is essentially explaining why a lot of what we're pursuing when it comes to when it comes to um, um, mapping consciousness and mapping our relationship to actual reality is it's sort of hubristic. Uh, we think we have this good understanding of what the universe is and what the human mind is, uh, but there's really no way we could know that. There's no way that we could understand what consciousness feels like to a bat. Or, what, what, or, or come up with a model that would satisfy our understanding of the experience of consciousness in any meaningful way that would satisfy our deeper philosophical questions about it. And so, I mean, this is essential reading if you're really into it. It's pretty thick. I don't think it has broader political concerns for people who just want to understand the, the broad perspectives on things. But if you want to do a deep dive and, and you want to uh, find sort of the good atheist of the bunch, uh, Thomas Nagel is one of them. Again, I don't know why these books in particular have so much dust on them, but um, I feel like, uh, you know, a sneeze is coming on every time. Um, okay, I'm going to do these books at once. So I've got two by Julius Evola. I've got Revolt Against the Modern World, which I read a while back, and I've got Ride the Tiger, which I haven't read, which I probably should read. Um, what is there to say about Julius Evola that hasn't already been said? This is essentially required reading for all people on the distant right. Uh, Julius Evola is not my cup of tea. His pagan sensibilities are tr too strong, um, but, but he is an exciting writer. He is a refreshing writer, considering that he wants to rage against all of modern liberal perceptions on what is right and what is wrong what is good and what is bad in politics and you know if i'm you know there's a conversation that i should have with pagans but i don't think it actually goes through julius avola i don't think that julius avola is representative of what uh what what meaningfully divides pagans and christians i think that he's trying to capture a sort of perennial tra traditional religion uh, he's trying to capture common motifs that extend through time and extend through civilizations that are present in Chinese civilization, in Hindu civilization, in European civilization, in both its ancient and Christian iterations. And he's trying to draw those out into common archetypes in, in, a, in a much more brutal, in a much more raw, and in my opinion, in a much more honest way than Jordan Peterson uh, does in his own attempts, and in a much more political way as well. I really respect the project. Uh, I quibble with it, but um, you know this is nevertheless essential reading. Uh, I say essential reading, but wh who, what am I talking about? As I said at the beginning of this, uh, th there is no such thing as essential reading. Uh, everyone has their own life. Everyone has their own um, uh, their own stage of learning, and so there there's no such thing as a book that you have to read. There's only a book that you have to read in your particular moment. Again, you could read Julius Evola and just not be ready for it. You could be you could read Julius Evola and be way beyond that. 
uh, you know, you could you, you could already have internalized these concepts from other authors, and um, you know, so so there's no such thing as an essential reading list. Um, here's the one I was talking about: Hiller Belloc's *The Servile State*. Uh, this is if people ask for one book about distributism, uh, people usually talk about this one, uh, *The Servile State*. Um, really, this is less economics. This is less a political treatise than. Hiller Belloc's own understanding of economic history. The main thesis, the main thesis that I carried away from this book, the one that I always remember, is that the the chief motivating paradox that Hiller Belloc tries to examine in the servile state are, are why why peasants, even though they existed in, in essentially authoritarian societies and had almost zero power in comparisons to their local lord. How in many ways were, were they more independent? Were they more uh, free? Than, than many of the post-industrial uh, age citizens that are that are locked inside this completely constrained way of being, um, you know, and he 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 says that in some ways, in some ways, capitalism, and he uses weird definitions. So I I don't want to I don't want to misquote him, and I don't want to misparaphrase him either. But in some ways, he says capitalism kills property. Uh, because because it locks it in all these power relations with debt and with and with necessary reliance on larger supply chains, um, is, is there a coherent economic vision, uh, prescriptive economic vision that comes out of the servile state? I really don't think so. But at the same time, it's a good starting point because it's a key question I think we should be asking. All ages are equal before God. And it does appear that in our transition from the medieval mode or the Renaissance mode to the, to the industrial mode, uh, something very critical was left by the wayside. Something very human was left by the wayside. And that is a technology that we're going to have to rediscover politically. And, and, and of all things that political thinkers should be interested in, it's in rediscovering old technologies because that's the most bang for your buck. The greatest contributor of all time, in my opinion, um, to, to, to thought. Like, the world was as different um, after he existed than before uh, was Thomas Aquinas. Uh, because Thomas Aquinas opened a door. He, I mean, he, he had a lot of original thoughts, don't get me wrong. He had a lot of original theological takes, which are heavily criticized by people like my friend Anglo Ortho. Um, but, but his real contribution to political history was him opening the door to Aristotelian thought inside Christian civilization. And because he did that, he opened a floodgate. I mean, he opened a whole school that had been developed over hundreds of years and basically just dismissed. And, and I think he, more than anyone else, is the author of the Renaissance and the author of, of, of the European technological explosion. Uh, because it was that open door that allowed Europe to really think the thoughts it did in the late Renaissance and in the early age of the War of Religions that, that led to it having this amazing um, advantage in thought and technology going into the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, uh, but yeah, we should always be looking to rediscover old technology, and this is a discussion. I don't know if Belloc would discuss the servile state that way, but that's the part of it I always remember of the servile state. Um, this is a book that I've only read part of. Um, this is uh, Slavo Zizek's uh, The Puppet and the Dwarf, uh, The Perverse Core of Christianity. So this is Slavo Zizek's take on Christianity. Now, I was really interested in this because I heard him talk about uh, Christianity and read an essay that he wrote. And I, um, I said, oh my God, this is so interesting. I have to read his book. And I started reading his book, and I discovered that I really just dislike the way Slavo Zizek uh, writes. He writes in a very scatterbrained way. I have no doubt that if you read as much Hegel as uh, as Slavo Zizek has, uh, it all makes sense. This method all makes sense. Um, but I find Hegel indecipherable. I find him just mystical. I, I've read, I think, one or two. I've read I've one, one or two, and then some kind of a summary of Hegel by another author. And I find Hegel intriguing. I find his ideas that uh, I find his ideas uh, fertile. I find them fruitful. I find them. Uh, he has methodological approaches and imagistic approaches to history that inspire people to 
have a lot of new interesting ideas. Uh, but his way of writing is is very, very difficult to parse. And I feel that Slava Zizek copies that over. And so I feel that I, I just couldn't get through this book very easily. I, I think he wrote an essay in Christianity for some, maybe it was Vanity Fair. And I might read that instead if I were to recommend someone something. But, you know, it, for for a communist, his his perspective on Christianity is pretty based. He He kind of wants Christianity to be alive in its full force. And he's kind of disappointed with progressive Christianity and Christians that take things halfway, which, to be honest, is, you know, is all of us, mostly all of us who are not, you know, who, who are very lax and they're striving for sainthood. And, and I respect this perspective, even though I thought I got very little usage out of this, uh, like literal physical text, uh, mainly because how it was written. Um... Oh, hey, more books that I haven't completely read. Um, this is uh, Sexual Persona by Camille Paglia. Um, I got through a little bit of this, but it, this is a dense book. And um, I couldn't get through. I mean, I kind of got the idea. And, uh, you know, this thing is 700 pages. And it goes through the entire history of Western aesthetics and tries to analyze them from the perspective of eroticism and sex and dynamicism. I really respect Camille Paglia as a thinker. I think she's on the right track. I just never had time to get through this book, so I put it down and I never picked it up again. My wife really likes Paglia. She might try this, but I don't know. I think <sighs> this is not for the faint of heart. Um, again, I, I want to try to be as honest as possible about uh, the books that I have and have not read, right? Um, Speaking of which, um, I might as well shelve this one first, right? So this is the granddaddy of books that uh, that that right wingers are that 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 left wingers try to catch people out for not reading. Uh, Karl Marx's Das Kapital. So how do you tell if I've read a book or not when it comes in this form? Well, usually it's the the line you can, can see here that I've I've read this book and I've marked pages in it. Um, so almost nobody reads volume i think i have volume one two and three i certainly have haven't read volume two and three i don't think uh, most marxists have not read das kapital and, and 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 i think even fewer have read the second and third volumes of das kapital uh the, the thing is incredibly dry it's incredibly dated economics and uh, it's um and if you're a right winger reading this, if you're somebody who comes from a school that's not uh, a, a sort of labor theory of value school, uh, this is how you know this is how your reading of Das Kapital goes. Um, so you you get through the first few chapters to this first purple mark, uh, where he basically introduces the labor theory of value and argues for it, and then you get to this second and third paper mark where he introduces his big thesis which is CMC, MCM. So Marx's argument is uh, that you, can, you know what capital is because capital goes, the, the process of capital when it, when it exists in a person is that capitalists use um, money to get commodities and then they use the commodities to get more money. Whereas ordinary people who are not capital owners, uh, they use commodities to get money and then money to get commodities, which they then consume. So the capital growth, I mean, really, it's a, it's a simpler, Marxists always try to get, they, they always they always get, do gotchas, where they're like, oh, what's MCM? If you read Das Kapital, what, what is that formula? Uh, really, really it, it's, it's trying to, it's just underlying the difference between consumable goods or consumable economic behavior and uh, an investment-oriented or, or growth-oriented economic behavior. It, it's not something that Marx invented, but what Marx's real contribution is, is that he says, okay, well, let's start with the labor theory of value. If you start with the labor theory of value, then, then all of a sudden these, these computations about you know, how much your labor is worth or how much this, this sandwich is worth, all of a sudden now because of a, of a very naive application of the labor theory of value, those go from being hypothetical concepts to being real, physical, calculable, material concepts. And in almost every single thing in this entire book, his entire idea of exploitation and industry, it's all based on 
the labor theory of value filtered through that uh, the, the the definitions of capital and, and non-capital wealth. And um, if you reject those two core pillars, I found that there's very little in this book that, I mean, maybe a Marxist can correct me on this, but there's very little in this book that survives those assumptions being removed. And so it's like it's like reading a proof where it's built on a faulty premise. There's no way you can keep yourself interested because every next step you know to be a false step because you departed from the argument in, in chapters two, three, and four. And so there's there's almost no reason to go on. I I don't even know if I got to the complete end of Marx, uh, you know, of 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 Das Kapital, uh, um, all of it. But you know, there it is. I think that's that's most anyone needs to go through. Maybe I can shelf this on the lower shelf so I don't have to constantly have all the volumes of Das Kapital uh, right there. Okay. Um, uh, going through this again got some well this is appropriate uh, yes yeah, so well this is appropriate so this is Hegel's um, this is Alistair McIntyre's criticism of Hegel yeah I, I, I found this I found this very delightful Al Alistair McIntyre is a uh, uh, very core. I, I don't know what what school I'd really describe him in. I would say originally he was like a conservative author because he's very popular among the sort of first things crowd, among the National Review crowd. He wrote the the very great book After Virtue, which is uh, discussing how society can operate in sort of a post truth, post virtue age. Before Western society was totally focused on the idea of virtue, and now and now it basically it's a managerial state, it's a technocratic state. And I guess he wrote uh, this criticism. I haven't, maybe I've read one of these essays. I certainly haven't read this entire thing. I also have another work by Hegel here somewhere, but I'm not seeing it right now. So um, I'll just keep on, I'll keep on piling through. Sometimes the books get a little bit mixed up um, as you go through them. Putting Hegel next to Marx seems rather appropriate, so we'll do that. Oh, but speaking of the devil, here is After Virtue, the book that I was um, just mentioning. Again, uh, just a great book. Everyone should read this. Uh, this is not the book I read. I think I repurchased it. Um, in fact, there is a great... I think I have the audiobook version of this on my audiobook channel. And if not there, there's also, I believe, an audiobook of After Virtue on Skeptical Waves channel. Uh, I think that this is a book that is amenable to being listened to on audio. I don't think it's so thick that it, it will run away from you the way that Carlyle does if you try to listen to it on audiobook. And this will this will bring you through sort of the core the core problems with trying to um, trying to live in a post virtue age in Western society. I think that we're I think this problem is kind of rearing its ugly head in, in very real ways in the millennial generation. And, and we're seeing this every day with sort of the, the remoralized left wing. And we're seeing this every day with the completely demoralized right wing. And uh, it's, it's, just, it's an important to remind yourself of all these things. I, I don't know if I have really much more to say about this uh, other than, you know, I highly recommend this book. I think it's a lot harder to, to again, you know, I think with... Um, with, with literature, it's way easier to say everyone needs everyone who reads science fiction needs to read Dune. Everyone who reads literature or Russian literature needs to read Crime and Punishment. Uh, it's much harder to say that with um, uh, with political books because, again, you know, it, it, it just it, it, political books are so dependent on where you are in your own development and and the context of the times you live. And so I can discuss which one sort of had an impact on me, uh, but I don't know how much more I can really uh, put on that effort in terms of um, coming up with an essential reading list. Uh, but of the essential reading list, this one certainly comes up a fair amount of times. This is The Machiavellians by James Burnham. So um, about a year ago, this book was almost impossible to find on Amazon. They just recently republished it, and, and I purchased it as soon as I found it. You may notice uh, I haven't read this book. I listened to it because it was impossible to find. I listened to it on audiobook, but I snapped it up the second I could find this paperback in, in a form that was easily uh, in a form that was easy to, to come by. 
And this just brings you, I mean, this, 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 if you wanted to condense modern reactionary thought into 170 odd pages, this would probably be the book. Um, so, you know, now that you can purchase it for eight bucks, it's well worth it. But given how much people like myself and Aaron McIntyre and Alex Kashida and academic agent talk about James Burnham, uh, maybe you've heard all the arguments already. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it, it could seem like old hat. You know, a, a fact is a fact is a fact. And, and hearing, hearing a rendition of the fact is uh, sometimes that can make the original work seem less fresh. Um, okay. Well, speaking of our own modern age, uh, I have Bronze Age mindset here. <laughs> well, this is like the, the new reaction greatest hits. Um, so Bronze Age mindset, obviously this is the book written by, um, this is the book written by Bronze Age pervert, uh, famous from podcast and Twitter, fa uh, Twitter notoriety. Um, this is a unique text. It's a series of aphorisms and discussions of how we live in the modern world and how we shouldn't live and why everything you thought you knew as a Reddit atheist is actually wrong. You know, you know grug brain and muscles is better than being technically right in peer reviewed research and a lot of other more cutting and more primal revelations that come from this author. It's, a, it's intentionally and explicitly written in poor English, in, in agrammatic English. And uh, that's part of its artistry. It, it's proud of its own grug brain nature. And, um, and because of that, it's kind of, it, it's in itself a piece of art. And uh, it's a great book. Again, um, the, I, you know, notice I haven't read this book. Uh, I've listened to the audio book because um, uh, for the longest time I couldn't find this uh, book uh, readily available. And the audio book was. So, um, you know, something you keep them on yourself to have them. Um, you know, when I got the book, uh, from, from, I don't know where, where I got it from. When I finally got the book, I think I read, you know, the first three or four chapters and I'm like, okay, yeah, it's the book I heard on audiobook. Um, you know, on to all the other stuff that, that I need to read. That's on my long, long reading list. All right. Speaking of reactionary essentials, um, the, the grand Mac daddy of the Italian elite school, uh, if you discount Roman authors, uh, Machiavelli, the other great Florentinian thinker, um, Florentinian, that, that's not a word, is it? Uh, Tuscan thinker, that's better. They're both Tuscans, right? Uh, Florence is the capital of Tuscany. Um, uh, Nico Machiavelli's The Prince, this is his treatise on politics, famously delivered as a set of letters to a prince, prince who is employing him and embodying his concept of real politic. This is political dynamics attempting to be, attempting to divorce politics from morality. This is, the, and this is a problem, obviously, with most um, major ancient texts, although I've heard it said that ancient thinkers did this as well. I certainly don't think this is well done in, 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 many, in, in, in Greek politics. I feel that in many ways... Uh, morality seeps into political considerations, uh, but uh, but Nico, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli intentionally tries to divorce what ought to be the case in politics from what is the case, and he comes up with a particular brutal understanding of how political leaders should should act to take power and to seize power. Now, does this mean Machiavelli has is a nihilist? Does this mean he doesn't have moral persuasions? Absolutely not. He has a particular family in, in Tuscany who he absolutely hates. And he has a dream of a grand unified Italy brought uh, to power by, by a very uh, powerful and confident prince who he sees as the only solution uh, to, to Italy's political problems. Uh, this book is so short, you can read it in one sitting. I think I literally read this book to my wife when we were engaged or dating uh, it, it reads easy. It's, you know, and who doesn't want to say they've read The Prince, right? Um, well, and reading The Prince is one thing, but understanding it. I mean, very famously, The Prince was condemned by, I believe, the Catholic Church and, and later Christian thinkers for being more or less uh, an invitation to, to immorality. And, um, and, you know, there's certainly a case for that. There's the Machiavellian personality trait, 
where you simply just use people for your own selfish selfish purposes. Uh, Machiavelli himself was not a Machiavellian personality. I think he was an altruist. I think it was his design to, to simply discuss political reality in the abstract. Very famously, the great prince himself, Frederick the Great, wrote a book called The Anti-Machiavelli, where, where he, he designs it as a retort to Machiavelli. Uh, and his point in, 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 in The Anti-Machiavelli was that the, 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 basically it's like honesty is the best policy. His, his idea is that the only, A, his point is power should be absolutely concentrated in the form of the prince, but at the same, at the same time, the only way that a prince can properly keep his power and properly be a prince to his own people is to always be acting within their best interest as, as the sort of unipolar embodiment of their own interests. This is, I believe that the, he was the progenitor of the original cameralism, which, which Yarvin later uh, reformulated as neo cameralism. This is sort of the quintessential example of the CEO as king type deal. But anyway, um, read Machiavelli's The Prince, in short. But another book, and I just said there's, there's no absolutely must-reads in, 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 in politics and philosophy because it's all based on where you are as a person. This might be the one exception, uh, The Abolition of Man. Uh, this is an incredibly easy-to-read set of two essays, or it's one essay divided into two distinct parts. It's incredibly easy to read. It puts the problem of the modern condition in stark relief, and it asks a question to the reader that should be the question everyone is constantly asking themselves about the eventual fate of humanity inside a rapidly technologically developing society. And for some reason, nobody's asking this question. Uh, you, I, 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 I say you have to read this book. If you were a modern person who's taking the modern human condition seriously, uh, do yourself a favor, buy the audiobook, listen to the free audiobook on, I think it might be on my channel, it probably is on Skeptical Waves channel, uh, listen to the analysis, the, the post game by Benjamin McLean on his channel, uh, but just read the book, this is, literally you can read this in one sitting, this is the size of a New Yorker essay, um, and it's absolutely essential. And it's absolutely essential to read this book also if you're a right-winger twin with the concept of transhumanism. I don't want to hear anything from a transhumanist unless they've grappled with the questions that C.S. Lewis poses in this essay. So that's all I'll say about it, um, other than read it. All right, um, coming to the end of the first box. Um, okay, let's just do rapid fire. Uh, Carl Schmitz, the concept of the political. I also think I have another Carl Schmidt here, um, but I can't find it right now, so I'll show them at once. There are two Carl Schmidt essays I've read. Uh, one is political theology. The other one is the concept of the political. Um, to my knowledge, they're the only Carl Schmidt uh, books you need to read. They, they capture the core of his philosophy, uh, the core right-wing idea that, that politics is the friend-enemy distinction, that all politics comes down to is, is a theological belief. And in political... In political theology, uh, Carl Schmitt draws heavily on Joseph de Maistre. He draws heavily on Joseph de Maistre to make his point. And in, in many ways, I see political theology as being an extension of Joseph de Maistre, as being sort of a modernization of Joseph de Maistre uh, post the, the sociological revolution. Now, obviously, Carl Schmitt was a mid-century German, which made his works very, very unpopular in the academy. Uh, but I believe that there, there have been a lot of people who've been rediscovering him. Uh, not just our circle. I think that many people in the Modern Academy are rediscovering Carl Schmitt and Schmittian politics um, as a thing. So, so that is, that's good. Um, again, you know, if you're just looking for um, a quick rundown of um, of these authors, I think you know R. N. McIntyre did did a great job just making ten minute YouTube videos where he hits the main points of, of Carl Schmitt. And, uh, you know, um, deep dives might be a little bit harder. I'm seeing right now that I do have a deep dive. Um, I have um, C.A. Bond's uh, Nemesis. 
So C.A. Bond is a modern uh, right-wing author. Um, I heard he went off the Twitter deep end a little bit recently, uh, but but he's a great writer. I read a little bit of this. This is his take on Bertrand de Juvenal. Now, I read a little bit of this and not all of it because I had never finished reading Bertrand de Juvenal's On Power, and it felt really sacrilegious to read a criticism and an extension on de Juvenal before I read the actual author himself. Uh, so this is sitting on my shelf, um, reminding me that I really need to go back and finish Bertrand de Juvenal's On Power, which is another sort of core right-wing political author. All right, making good headway here. Um, <clears throat> speaking of analyses, we have uh, Contra and Mundum. Uh, I purchased this, never read it. I've read most of Joseph de Maistre, but this is a later day Catholic author. Uh, I don't know if he's an integralist person, uh, but, but he's a modern day Catholic author writing a, a modern day update on Joseph de Maistre. Um, haven't gotten around to this book yet. Really looking forward to it. Uh, but, you know, join the queue at this stage, right? Um, here is the, the one Hegel book I've read, Reason in History. Uh, totally indecipherable. Uh, great. Um, Hegel is one of the foundational authors of, of continental philosophy. Obviously, he's the direct influence on Marx. Of all the German idealists, his ideas seem to be the most eternal Although a lot of ideas that we um, that we associate with Hegel, I think the thesis and the antithesis one. I think it was I think it was earlier German idealists who developed those ideas. I think it's an incorrect attribution to give those ideas to Hegel. But you know, I read this book of all books that I've read and felt like I never understood. This one's at the top of the list. I, you know, I could talk about things he's read or. He, he speaks in aphorisms about broad concepts and and he builds on them. And if you don't see, if you don't accept the aphorisms immediately, then it just feels like you're building on air and it feels like the text leaves you behind really quickly. And I, I'm not so sure how to really process that as a modern reader. There's not a lot of argument as to why that is necessarily the case. So I, I find Hegel to be eternally perplexing. I do wonder how many modern Hegel scholars are only Hegel scholars because essentially, you know, Marxism has warmed over Hegelianism and, and Marxism is politically popular. Uh, you know, I've always, I've always wondered that to myself. Um, all right, more, more books on politics. Um, we have Peter Kropotkin's The Conquest of Bread, uh, the, the, the text that spawned YouTube BreadTube, though I, very, I doubt very many have read this. I hated this book. The guy writes like an idiot. I mean, he was an aristocrat. He was a part, he was an amateur scientist like most aristocrats in the 19th century, uh, a very famous anarchist. Uh, but, but he has this, this way, I mean, you know, if Hegel delivers these esoteric uh, statements about the relationship of of reason and passion in the abstract with no justification. What you encounter in anarchist thinking is just assertions about human nature that you flatly know to be false. Uh, like the assertions that if we start divvying up houses, like if we just nationalize houses and then divvy up, div give them to people first come first served, that there'll be no conflict or no political conflict over real estate and people's relative uh, positions, having a good house or a bad one, or living in a good neighborhood or a bad one, it's flatly and obviously false that people will will not fight over resources when they're being divvied up in a democratic fashion. And it, he asserts it multiple times with that argument, and it feels like even he hasn't critically examined this or, have, or has come up with any arguments for it. He's just convinced himself that it's true because he thinks it's a romantic and nice idea, and now he's based his entire philosophy on it. Um, I, I don't know how people think like this. You know, I, this is, of all the books that have convinced me that right-wingers and left-wingers think in fundamentally different ways, uh, this probably has convinced me that right-wingers and left-wingers think in fundamentally different ways. Uh, reading Marx, I feel like I kind of get it. 
I feel like Marx is a train that's on this course and I just got off the train at this station and, and the Marx train, you know, went on without me. Uh, with, 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 with the conquest of bread, 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 I feel like I'm in a funhouse mirror. I feel like the person is not, his brain's not moving in a way that I feel is, is valid or that's understandable. I feel like it's, um, it, it's just sloppy and sentimental uh, claptrap. Uh, that's that's designed to impress people because because it's 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 a vision of society where there's fundamentally no democratic political conflict with with which you know any realistic interaction with democratic systems I tell everyone to do this just join a co-op a housing co-op a food co-op anything where you have to make real decisions where there are real financial consequences that are put to a vote and, and tell me if that works. Uh, like Peter Kropotkin's idea, uh, idealized version of anarchism? Uh, the answer is obviously no. The answer is that this is not how people actually do things. And, uh, and, and, and in any experience with humanity in a realistic sense would immediately teach you that. Uh, so, you know, I actually kind of enjoyed, uh, did I read this or do I listen to it on audiobook? I think I did both. Uh, I enjoyed it. Um, but, you know, I, it's, it's bad. <laughs> it's just bad. It's just bad thinking. How, mu how much credit can I really give to people uh, for, for that kind of, uh, you know, seventh grade sentimentalism? Uh, not much. I wonder if I should put this into fiction. So this is uh, one of, when, when I was a kid, when I was 12 years old, and I started getting interested in ideas, I talked to my dad, who's an amateur philosopher himself, and I said, what can I read to kind of, you know, I'm interested in philosophy. What should I read to start myself out on this journey? And he had to be this book. This is Voltaire's Candide, uh, which is, um, and I, I've, I've read this book like five, six times in my life. Uh, I even read, on our third date, I think I read this book to my wife uh, in its entirety at, on, on like a car ride or something. And uh, it's um, it's incredibly unromantic. It's incredibly witty. It's the story of uh, a poor relation who who suffers all sorts of misfortunes at the hands of invading armies or circumstances. Um, in I think it it supposedly takes place sometime around the War of Religions, like the Thirty Years' War. And it's 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 it, what it is. You know, that, that's the plot of it. It's this guy who's suffering all of these misfortunes as he's pursuing this woman who he eventually gets in a very anticlimactic way. And um, that, that's the plot of the, this, this short little novella. Uh, but what it actually is is a satire on the Christianity of Leibniz. Leibniz is very famously the, uh, the polymath who was one of the co-founders of or the co-discoverers of calculus along with Isaac Newton, and like Isaac Newton before him, he was also an amateur philosopher and theologian, and he postulated that we lived in the best of all possible worlds. So uh, in, in this book, there is a character, uh, Dr. Pengala something, who, who repeats Leibniz's proposition that we live in the best of all possible worlds, and the misfortunes that they constantly suffer uh, are a rebuke that, well, maybe we don't live in the best of possible worlds. But that's not the reason why people remember this book. People remember this book because even three or 400 years, I think it's closer to 300, but still, you know, uh, late 17th century, even after hundreds of years, this book is still absolutely hilarious. Uh, and, you know, it, you know, if you've got an airplane ride and, and you, want to, you want something more enriching than a pulp novel, uh, this reads as easily as a pulp novel. And uh, you can tell people that you're reading Voltaire and it immediately sounds um, good. I'm shelving that with fiction books. Then they get closer to fiction. Um, here is a not Susan Friendly copy. The Industrial Society and Its Future by Theodore Kaczynski. Uh, I believe this is, this is the, I think this is the one, yes, uh, famous first introduction. The Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. Um, you know, a good book, Hard to argue against. Very, very short. Uh, you get caught reading this on the bus, the people will give you slant eyes. Uh, or or a suspicious, suspicious slant, slant eyes. That, 
I think that I think that's just like the you know suspicious looking expression that's not a ethnic slur <laughs> yes in addition to uh in addition to recommending books written by terrorists i i'm also uh use it copious amounts of ethnic slurs uh, when, when i'm discussing them um uh so this is you know read it if you want to uh if you want to feel particularly depressed about how our, our technological society is going to progress towards its own doom uh, my wife got me this uh, book, which I'd never read, called The, the Collapse of Complex Societies. Uh, she saw me reading all this stuff, and she got me this. I haven't read it. Uh, I guess this is an actual anthropological text, um, but I don't know. Um, it's written by Joseph A. Tainter. Uh, it's been on my shelf ever since, and uh, I haven't felt yet a reason to remove it. Um, ah, here's political theology. We already discussed Carl Schmitt, so I'll just shelve it with the rest of Carl Schmitt here. Uh, next to the concept of political. I kind of have a hard time with the shelf itself. All right. Going down the line for the first box. Okay, so we have again. This is more. This is more theology. We have uh, um, G.K. Chesterton's Saint Thomas Aquinas and a collection of G.K. Chesterton's essays. Um, I probably should shelve this differently since most of them are not about politics, but both both of them are absolutely delicious. Um, I probably should comment on. Uh, on uh, G.K. Chesterton's um, uh, Thomas Aquinas, or actually just Thomas Aquinas generally. G.K. Chesterton's Thomas Aquinas is a discussion of the man's life and a broad view of his contribution in a way that will be accessible to readers of the, the early 20th century. Um, Thomas Aquinas, the actual writer, is a very, very, very difficult read. Summa Theological is unapproachable, and even most of the modern criticisms of Thomas Aquinas are really, really hard to digest. I was part of a theology reading group for a while when I was living in Seattle, and we had attempted to read Thomas Aquinas and failed because it was, it was really hard and people weren't quite following it. And then we attempted to read a... Uh, a modern interpreter of Aquinas, and, and that also, you know, completely lost people. And we we, we ended up having to go to I think Fulton Sheen's, uh, uh, Archbishop uh, Fulton Sheen's uh, discussion of Aquinas before we, we got anywhere with the subject matter. Uh, Thomas Aquinas's work is very very inaccessible, and I know very few Catholics who can honestly get through his work and get anything out of it because it's just written in a very very dry way. And that is, you know, like I said, that that is, I, I say that understanding that that Thomas Aquinas is just definitively, perhaps intellectually the most impactful person in, in all of um, in in all of uh, Western history. He opened the the he opened the door on the entire Renaissance, on the entire scientific revolution, in my opinion, in in a way that very few other people you, know, you could say anything similar about. Um, here is another collection of essays, uh, some by G.K. Chesterton, uh, some by G.K. Chesterton. This is The Hound of Distributism. Uh, this is a collected essays on distributism. Uh, I read a fair number of them. I liked some of them. I didn't like others. Um, I feel I've read so many books on distributism, and I still have such a poor handle on it. Um, the video on distributism will probably be perpetually something that I'm working on for the channel, but never get around to actually doing. You know, probably making multiple hours of videos uh, about my book collections not helping <laughs> in that effort, considering how constrained my time is uh, um, ordinarily. Um, Heroes and Hero Worship. Um, this is another Carlyle, obviously. This is a series of lectures that he gave about heroes and hero worship across Western history. Um, I bought this book never read it uh i read um i read part of it for a stream i did with lambda 
uh, on on one of the on some of the stuff he wrote about. Um, what, what I think it was in particular, it was um, Martin Luther, who's one of the heroes uh, that he discusses. And I listened to it, the audiobook version um, with limited success. Like I said, Carlyle is not someone I feel translates very well into an audio format because his work is so thick. I bought this so I could return to it on a later date and, and read it more deeply. And with most of the essays that I, I haven't discussed in depth with people online, I haven't gotten around to, to reading all parts of it. Um, but it is what it is. I probably should shelve it with the rest of the Carlisle if I could find it. Um, yeah, there's the later day pamphlets, right? Put that right there. Okay, so that's the first box. On to the next box. Um, I think I haven't misplaced this. Oh, um, one last one from this box. Again, this is theology, and it's and moreover as a fictional rendition, so I might have to shelve this with the fiction. This is C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce. This is his vision of heaven and hell. Uh, this is an amazing book if you're interested in Christian visions of the afterlife. If everyone has a hard time imagining eternal punishment or eternal reward, I would obviously recommend this book. The Great Divorce is a reference to the poet William Blake, famous poet and artist. He did the, the Red Dragon that was made famous by the, the Hannibal Lecter movie and book of the same name. Uh, he also did a set of wonderful poems. He's one of my favorite poets of all time. And one of the grand poems he wrote and illustrated was The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, which in, which in key romantic fashion uh, proposes heretically the concept that in some ways, you know, evil is needed, you know, in some ways, evil was needed so that the great, a greater good could be discovered, or that's what's implied. And C.S. Lewis, in this book, the great divorce, divorce refers to, is that while in some ways, in, in our ordinary lives, there is an interplay of good and evil that's, that's layered and that's complex, and you know, you, that, that, that's sort of hard to distinguish, there's a marriage of heaven and hell in our temporal realities, in the ultimate reality, there, there is a final parting way between good and evil, where good goes this direction and evil goes in the entirely opposite direction. And any pathway back from evil to good has to be done by retracing your steps. There's not going to be a circling back where evil meets good somewhere in the future. There's an ultimate parting of ways. And, and that's the division between heaven and hell that C.S. Lewis depicts, and that's what he discusses in this book. Uh, an amazing book, highly recommended. It's hard to know what shelf it goes on. I guess it will go on the shelf for the time being, for what it's for whatever it's worth. Um, I always associate the Great Divorce with uh, with the abolition of man because I believe when I bought them first an audiobook, they were they were packaged together. So so that is what it is. Um, I'm now completely out of my depth. I think that this is... <laughs> the boxes are kind of getting away from me here. Um, yes. So, second box of politics and history. Second books on politics and history. Oh, <laughs> here is an ancient book that I haven't read or I tried to read this. Uh, St. Thomas of More's Utopia. Uh, classic work, obviously, St. Uh, Thomas More was the famous ex-chancellor of England who refused to approve Henry VIII's approval uh, marriage to Anne Boleyn, or really what, what, is it, what, what was his annulment from Catherine of Aragorn, and was uh, due to his refusal to, to accede to Parliament's act of uh, succession, Due to his refusal to, to accede to those demands as passed in law, he was executed. And through most of his life, he remained silent. Uh, and uh, due to what almost certainly was perjury by one of his associates, 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 even in his silence, he was executed for treason, for refusing to acknowledge that the children of Anne Boleyn, or, or the, or I said, the validity of, of Henry's church, 
apart from Rome was valid. But before he was executed, uh, before he was even imprisoned in the Tower of London, he wrote this very famous book called Utopia, his vision uh, of idealized societies. I never got around to reading this book. It's, it's not highly regarded. It's not highly discussed in Catholic circles. It's known as being kind of a bizarre book. Um, but, but no, honestly, I've never, I've never gotten around to reading this. Um, but, um, uh, I always aspire to, uh, mainly because St. Thomas More is such a hero of mine uh, as a Catholic saint, uh, a person who perfectly combines legal prudence with, with a Christian refusal, uh, to lie and, and to not live in truth. And as Christians who are forced constantly in the modern era uh, to live in lies, uh, that that's that's a lesson that we need to take. <laughs> okay, well, this is a book, uh, James Burnham's The Managerial Revolution. Read the Machiavellians, never got around to reading The Managerial Revolution. Um, most people in, in modern right-wing thought agree that The Managerial Revolution, while it's, it's more commonly discussed in academia, is by far the weaker of Burnham's books. Um, but I, I never got around to reading this, unfortunately. It's, it kind of got to the bottom of my, um, of my reactionary book stack. So I will put this somewhere uh, discreet and get back to it sometime. I don't think I'm the only person that has a bookshelf with a lot of books in it that they haven't read. I think that probably that's most millennials, in fact. Um, okay, so here is a very strange book. Got to deactivate my screen saver again. Thomas Carlyle's Magnum Opus. Not so much politics, uh, more history. So uh, this is uh, Thomas Carlyle's Magnus Open, Opus, The French Revolution. This, uh, so I got this in hardback from my father, again, who owned a used bookstore, it looks like a fairly nice book. It's got illustrations of the French Revolution. And, um, you know, it's, it's a very nice book. I got halfway through this book about... This is a, like most Carlyle, this is a bizarre book. He writes... I am not the first person to coin this description of the book, but he writes uh, about the French Revolution as if he were witnessing it while it happened almost like he was a sports commentator narrating a game of football or a game of basketball. Like, then this person does this, and this person does that. And of course, this is Thomas Carlyle we're talking about, so it, the, the prose is, is, is Byzantine and thick um, with, with Victorian meaning and weight. And so uh, this book is an absolute whirlwind. Um, I, I feel like I got a lot out of the part I read, but there was a part, what, what kind of caps us my attempt to read this book through was that you cannot read this book without having a thoroughgoing understanding of the French Revolution. And the second you, the second he starts describing something that you're not aware of historically, and you're reading it through this Carlylean lens where, where he's narrating with this verbose language and, and, and in, this, in this weird tense, uh, you, you immediately get lost and feel like he's just talking past you in gibberish. And, and of course, is that a failing of Carlyle? Obviously not. That's a failing of my own understanding of history. But it did stop in the tracks uh, my, my attempt to read Carlyle's magnum opus. But it did earn a place on my shelf um, forever. Okay. Uh, God. The problem is that these political books are always so schizophrenic. Um, they're always so schizophrenic. Here I have another book by C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. Um, maybe I can shelf all the C.S. Lewis books right in the same place. That might be a good idea. So Mere Christianity, this, you know, I really don't know who this book is for, to be quite honest. If you went back to the 2007, 2008 God debates, you know, with William Lane Craig and Christopher Hitchens, uh, this would be sort of the go-to apologetic book for, for that brand of evangelical Christian. It's like the basic entry point to the general Christian worldview. 
and one with a particular 20th century flavor to it. It's very ecumenical. It's very ethics focused. It's very practical in its orientation. I don't know a single person who is convinced by this book. And it's also pitched in a very middle brow direction, unfortunately. This was pitched to the common man in C.S. Lewis's time. This book was created from a series of radio broadcasts C.S. Lewis did during World War II uh, for the BBC. And um, it's, uh, and so it's pitched to what in 1943 was a lowbrow audience. But in the subsequent 60 years, it's way too highbrow for a lowbrow uh, reader. And in some sense, it's way too lowbrow for a sophisticated uh, philosopher. So I, I never recommend this book to anyone because I feel that I'll either be insulting somebody if I give it to them or I'll be going over their head. I'm sure there is somebody who mere Christianity is this perfect for. I've never met them. Uh, but but I, I have heard, although I don't think I've ever met the person who's been convinced by mere Christianity, I have heard that it's helped a lot of people understand the basics, so I can't knock it. Um, and I, I guess I, that's not a good explanation. That's not a good explanation about why I own it. Uh, but you know, it is what it is. All right. <laughs> oh wow, this book. Um, I got through most of this, uh, but this is a pamphlet. Progress and Poverty by Henry George. So most people are aware that there are many schools of economics and political thought uh, from the early 20th century that did not survive to our uh, present time period. And one of them was Georgism, uh, based on the works of the economist Henry George, who was another one of these people like Hiller Belloc and G.K. Chesterton, who was trying to come up with some kind of alternative to capitalism or laissez-faire, and, and socialism. And uh, this was one of his main works. And uh, I don't know, are there Georgists around? But I think his primary idea was, was a tax on land and then an attempt to redistribute land and to keep land circulating. I don't know if he was one of the advocates for a land bank. I know that was one of the original ideas coming out of the distributists in, in the early 20th century. And, and I believe this ambition was shared by Georgists, but, but you know, it's been a while since I've read this, so I, I could be wrong about this. Uh, it's not coming to me right now. Um, I, I don't know if I can really recommend this book, but if you're looking for an alternative to modern uh, 20th century ideas, uh, you could do a lot worse than Henry George. I'll say that, certainly. A large pamphlet book can go there, I guess. <clears throat> okay, well, this is a fun little pamphlet everyone should read. Uh, so this is actually published by Zero Books. This is, I mean, to be quite honest, uh, we wouldn't be talking about Zero Books at all if they hadn't published this book. This book is the real thing that put them on the map as a Marxist publishing house. It's Mark Fisher's Capitalist Realism. This is his pamphlet about the inescapability uh, of the modern imagination from, from late modernity. From, from the consumerism of the late 20th century. Everything is commodified. Everything is, is built into a, a constant uh, feedback loop between supply and demand, between popularity ratings, and all concepts of meeting and transcendence. And indeed, as Mark Fisher discovered, even the idea of progress is simply plowed into this machine, cycled back again. Think of Kurt Cobain, who, who's a follower of the punk movement, which is you know, a radically anti-consumeristic idea in, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, later, he realizes that there's no way to be a punk band that's popular or, or a grunge band that's popular because if, if, you, if you embody the sort of anti-consumerist attitude in, in your own message, that itself becomes a consumeristic product. And, and that's the core of our Mark Fisher's capitalist realism. 
in, in many ways, this is the managerial state. Uh, the, the, the same consequence that Burnham discusses, the same consequences that Theodore Kaczynski discusses, but this time it's from a more socialist and Marxist perspective, uh, where we're capturing the socialist and Marxist perspective. Um, they come to the same sort of depressing conclusion that modern thought and modern ideology is caught in a technological and consumeristic trap that it can't escape from. I don't know if this is what caused Mark Fisher to kill himself. I believe he committed suicide. Uh, but this is certainly his most famous work. Uh, again, guys, you can read this in a sitting. Well worth your time. If, you're, if you feel like you want to understand how, in many ways, reactionary thought and leftist thought dovetails. Uh, but, but this is, and I, to my knowledge, Zero Books has never published uh, a groundbreaking seminal work that you just need to read uh, other than this. Uh, but, you know, this is, this is the one. And hey, you know, it only takes one, right, to justify your existence, right? <laughs> it, you know, if I could come up with, with a work as, as groundbreaking and as hopeful as capitalist realism in my entire life, uh, you know, I would be, I would be accomplished, right? Um, you know, but I guess that that's subjective. Um, here is an interesting text. Uh, people remember me talking about Walker Percy from the fiction section, perhaps, with books like Love and the Ruin and, and the Movie Watcher and The Second Coming, which I confess I hadn't read, even though that's the only one I, I read by Walker Percy that's on my fiction shelf currently. Um, you know, it's always, that's always how it happens. The book you haven't read is the one that's on your shelf and the book that you have read and influenced your life. You like, you gave to somebody else like years back. Um, but this is a book of his that I had read. I read this in a book group, uh, my Catholic book group. It was a big hit, uh, not particularly accessible. This is Walker Percy's magnum philosophical opus, Lost in the Cosmos, Lost in the Cosmos. So this is a tour de force in which... Uh, Walker Percy strings together um, a bunch of incredibly schizophrenic perspectives on, on different things, uh, on life, on self-help, on, on, on modern perceptions of narrative quality. And, he, he, and it basically simulates how the modern mind is, 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 is ranked into getting all these sort of contradictory narratives. This is how the modern mind reacts living in the post-moral society, in the post-truth society. And Walker Percy takes all of these disparate threads and he weaves them together into what his worldview is, into, into sort of the, 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 I don't want to say neo-Christian, but in, in, in just sort of the classically Christian, the classically Western worldview. It, how he, he shows how it all arrives back at the center at the end of it all. In, in some ways, this reminds me, uh, what is it, Putnam's uh, Prometheus Rising, the guy who wrote the Illuminatus trilogy also wrote this schizophrenic uh, philosophical take called Prometheus Rising, and in many ways, Lost in the Cosmos, it, uh, Lost in the Cosmos, is the it's the Christian reply to to these psychedelic philosophical tour de forces um, that that I think comes to a much more edifying conclusion, a much more fruitful conclusion. Uh, I would obviously recommend this. My only caveat is that. You know, you're going to read a few chapters of this book and you're going to be totally lost. Uh, this book, the, the point is not easy to see at any given point in the book. And uh, I'm not even so sure if the point is so easy to see at the end of the book necessarily. But if you read this in the right company, if you read this with a, my, the right mindset, it, it's, it's a truly good book. It's a truly edifying book. And I think it's a, certainly an anecdote, antidote to sort of the 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 staid and, and, and predictable um, psychedelic thinking you might see in something like a Gravity's Rainbow or 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 an Illuminatus trilogy or whatever, but you know that's on the shelf. <clears throat> um, the books here probably not the ones we want to read here or talk about here. Um, we are definitely getting more into the history. And less the philosophy. Oh, here's Capital Volume. <laughs> here's Capital Volume 2. That can go on the Mark shelf. Stacking these things on, on uh, multiple shelves certainly is not easy. Um, but, but there we go. At least not when the camera is rolling. Ah, okay, yes. So 
this is a speaking of crazy schizophrenic books that illustrate a philosophical worldview but don't seem to go anywhere um probably the thomas carlyle you want to read that isn't the french revolution is sartre restartus this is his it very weird um it's basically his like parody of a historian philosopher uh that that tries to construct a history of the human race based on clothing um hence uh it, what the it, i believe sartre restartus is the tailor restored uh, i couldn't make heads or tails out of this but it was certainly a delightful read with, with kind of a lot of key carlylean insights sprinkled into it if you can understand this book and truly understand this book uh please 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 get in contact with me let's do a live stream discussing it because of, of all the books that I've read and not understood that I want to understand, I don't think I'll ever understand Hegel. This is kind of at the top of the list. So, um, you know, uh, classic, great book. Uh, I'm not going to say like I understand what was trying to be communicated, though. Uh, yeah, over my head. Oh, um, okay, so this is another one of these sort of... Uh, uh, this is René Guénon. Another one of these early 20th century reactionary authors, a contemporary of people like Evola on the continent, probably one of the people with the weirdest faces in all of existence. You, you see his face and you feel like it's not like an unattractive one. It's very symmetrical, but his nose is enormous. It's like devouring his entire face. And, and he's a Frenchman uh, who converted to Islam. And he believed that, uh, you know, the modern world was in crisis, that that this is a consistent theme meaning had been drained away from it and that we were going to descend into chaos without some kind of rediscovery of vitality and uh, for my money i got more out of this than i got out of julius savola's revolt against the modern world but i would in my mind they are very similar texts they are very similar texts and they they i feel like they come to very similar conclusions and a reader probably would, would get very similar things out of them. Um, in, in all of these things, what, what I think most people, when, when people read Julius Avola or read René Guénon, um, the, the most important thing to get out of them is that the, the world is in crisis. And that crisis is very, very easy to see. And it's very, very easy to feel. And it's very, very easy to experience on a visceral level. And that all of our modern tools, all of the tools that we've gotten from the Enlightenment, all of the academics that are trying to build on things like Adam Smith and Hegel or, or Marx more, more approximately, they're all kind of talking around the core spiritual crisis that we haven't taken head on yet. And, you know, I think Ganon and Evola and other more modern people, uh, they all have solutions that look slightly different, but at least they're struggling with the problem, the, the problem of modernity that really needs to be addressed. Um, okay, um, I'm gonna put this, probably should put this next to Julius Avola, because uh, kind of a kind of a contemporary work. Um, <laughs> Speaking of a framework that traps our modern perception, I haven't read this since college, uh, but this is the quintessential book of liberalism. Uh, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. This is, this is more than anything else, the book that spawned the 20th century. Uh, you can't underrate it. You can't put it down because there is no mode of our own contemporary thinking uh, that is liberal, uh, either on the conservative side or certainly on the progressive side, that is untouched by the thinking of John Stuart Mill. Uh, this is where you get sort of the idea of, of individualism, the idea of liberty being uh, the, the kind of radically uh, free choice. Uh, a lot of ideas, um, in, you know, about modern, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say modern, is it modern utilitarianism? A, a lot of ideas that, 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 prominently feature into consequentialist thinking have their 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 origin in, in this book um that being said i see i see miller more as a prison to escape at this point in my life than than a, than a philosopher that needs to be revivified in the modern world 
I think we kind of have ridden the mill bandwagon as far as it possibly can uh, can go or possibly could have gone. And and so we're still stuck trying to escape this this pathway, uh, trying to find something that's radically new. But but still, you know, worth reading. No history of the 20th century is complete without John Stuart Mill. That is for sure. Um, but speaking of, um, yeah, I have this book, the more contemporary stuff. So um, obviously Rod Dreher, uh, he's, I don't know, he's not reactionary. He's kind of this, I think he's kind of a doofus really at this stage of my life. But he, he very famously read Alistair McIntyre's After Virtue and excerpted one um, Alistair McIntyre discusses what the solution to modernity is, what the solution Christians should take to the post-moral society. And his conclusion is that they should try to rediscover the, the spirituality of St. Benedict. St. Benedict obviously was, not obviously, but, but for those who aren't aware, he was one of the originators of the modern, or the, of, of, the, of the medieval monastic tradition. He came up, he, he had a monastery in the, in the Alps, I believe, and he established the rule of St. Benedict that discussed the, the ways in which monks should pursue a life of prayer apart from society. And in many ways, people attribute St. Benedict with the rediscovery of spirituality in the Middle Ages. The monasteries sowed the seeds from what eventually would become uh, the Aquinas rebirth of, 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 of thought. And, and then after that, uh, the Renaissance um, and uh, so Rod Dreher kind of cutely, his political project is the Benedict Option, which is never fully specified and it's never discussed in anywhere near the amount of detail that you would need to to be a serious intellectual idea. It's something along the lines that Christians should pursue a separate piece from the mainstream society, but, but the details are never gone into. Uh, and in... in in hindsight, it looks kind of like this cute idea where um, uh, people say, well, really what you're saying, Dreher, Rod, is you're saying we should all run for the hills. And Rod Dreher can say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not saying we should run for the hills. But then it's never really clear what he is advocating for. If you were to look at Rod Dreher's own life at this stage, it, what you really should be doing is is, is uh, living your life... Um, uh, in Europe, while uh, your community uh, falls apart in North America, which apparently seems to be, uh, you know, the, the, the lived example of Benedict Option. Um, but uh, a person who, though, I, I, I do respect, who is a disciple of Rod Dreher's, uh, who is a, a, a convert from atheism to Christianity. I actually interviewed her uh, for a podcast. Uh, Leila Bresco. Um, I think she married one of the editors of First Thing or one of the junior editors of First Thing, Things magazine. And she wrote a follow-up um, book uh, called Building the Benedict Option uh, where she tried to put meat on the bones of Rodri, her idea. Um, is this an, an actual serious philosophical take on... Um, on uh, uh, on, on, on how to construct a, a post uh, a postmodern political reality for Christians who've been exiled from the mainstream? No. But this is kind of a handy dandy how you can make your own parish better incrementally. This is a very practical, dare I say, a very feminine guide uh, to how you can make Christian communities better in the modern world. And, and for that, I really appreciate it. I, I really like Leia Labresco. I like her thought. I know a lot of reactionaries will, will roll their eyes um, because a lot of it seems very, very 1990s. Uh, a lot of it seems like, oh, well, we're going to deal with the crisis of modernity by not acknowledging it. Uh, by continuing, I mean, in, in the, in the, John Paul II, quintessential, he's a saint, he's a hero of mine. He, in many ways, saved the Catholic Church. He was a way forward. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, I think we need to kind of take the next step beyond what John Paul II was talking about. Uh, John Paul II offered a way around a crisis. And would I hate to say it, I think, I think in many ways the pontificate of Francis 
has, has landed us back in the crisis that John Paul II was trying to walk around. And, and I think a lot of reactionaries will see uh, thinkers like Labresco and Sargent and, and the rest of the first things crowd and think to themselves, well, this is just 1990s Orthodox Catholicism. Uh, they're not acknowledging the crisis we're in. Uh, they're, they're just, they're just uh, whistling past the graveyard. I think that these people are an asset. I think that in many ways they're, they are spiritually more advanced than their critics, which will ultimately count for more than having you know, a cynical Machiavellian worldview you know, injected into your Christianity like uh, I for my sins uh, I do because I feel it's true. So I'm always reading first things. I'm always reading Orthodox Christians who are trying to follow in the tradition of, of, of John Paul II. I've kind of, as you may have gathered, I'm kind of over Dreher at this point in my life, but, but I'll be reading Labresco um, whenever she publishes a new book, which might be a while because she just had an, uh, another kid. Um, uh, as, as published on social media, I'm not, um, I'm not revealing personal details. Um, but, you know, I, I enjoyed this book a lot. All right. Okay, so the last and not the least. Okay, two volumes... The Collected Works of Aristotle, The Collected Works of Plato. Um, okay, so, you know, C.S. Lewis makes fun of people who have The Collected Works of Aristotle and The Collected Works of Plato on their shelves next to each other because most of the time when you buy a big, fat, hardcover book like this, you never read it, right? You never read it because uh, this book, literally, like its physical form, is unreadable. Uh, this is hard to wield it's you can't read this on a bus uh and uh most people who buy this never read it the same thing is true with, with the dialogues of plato and to be honest if i just purchased this from a bookstore i would never have read these books but i have read these books and the way i read them was that i um late in college late in my undergraduate was part of a great books reading uh group and we worked our way through all of the books of Aristotle. Well, not all of them, most of them. And most of the Plato, uh, Plato dialogues. Every week we would read a new section and we would discuss it and we would summarize it. And, and that community of people allowed me to kind of get through and, and think about ancient ideas. And obviously the two most seminal uh, contributors to the Western uh, political project, Aristotle and Plato. Uh, absolutely different perspectives, certainly. Um, but but just, I think more than talking about Aristotle and Plato, everyone knows that you know the, these are the authors that that are the the foundation of Western philosophy. Um, but but very few people read them because I think that in order to read them properly, and this is especially with Plato because of the dialogue form of of his work, you need to have a community to discuss it with and to process it, and to bring you up to speed. When I was an undergraduate, I was no way prepared to take on Aristotle on his own terms. Um, but luckily for me, there are people there who were, and they could, they could put his ideas into context. When Aristotle talks about you know, monarchy in some ways being preferable to democracy, or when he talks about a certain idea, like the virtues in the abstract, if I was a high schooler or even a college student, I, the way I would process that would be, wow, there were some, uh, the Greeks have these crazy ideas about virtue that are totally unsubstantiated by modern sociology. Uh, certainly, Aristotle's ideas of the four cardinal virtues can be successfully filed in the same uh, dismissive folder as I put Aristotle's idea of, of the four elements, right? Uh, we don't believe in the four elements anymore, so why should I believe in his, his political uh, taxonomy? When you read this in a group of people who are more uh, classically inclined, uh, your natural inclination to dismiss these ideas out of hand or just to not process them, uh, you can work through that a lot better. So whenever people ask me you know, wh whether I should read these, my immediate recommendation is, get a group of people together who are reading these things either online or in real life, preferably on life, uh, preferably in real life, and uh, just take pieces of them, 
read a little piece, discuss it. Read a little piece, discuss it. Uh, rinse and repeat. Uh, this will have to go on the bottom shelf. Um, okay, I think that I am completely out of uh, politics and now completely on to history. Uh, yes, all right, history. Open up the next box of books here. And um, yeah, I think we can go pretty quickly through the history because I don't really have nearly as much to say about it as I have to say with politics. Um, what big pile of books do we have here? Oh, we have the Medieval Russians. I bought several books on Medieval Russia when I was reading through Loris, and I never got around to reading them. Uh, we have um, we have several. We have the murder of the middle class. Uh, my wife bought me two books, three books, um, a book she thought I would uh, like. Well, the first one I'm not going to read. Uh, I, my wife probably can hear me when I say this, so I probably should be. Uh, the first one I'm not going to read is Bill O'Reilly's Killing the Mob. Um, so um, my wife obviously kind of has more, more normie con sensibilities than I do. And she was a big uh, Bill O'Reilly fan when I met her. And, um, and so she, she gave me this Bill O'Reilly book. <laughs> I think we might even have one of Bill O'Reilly's kids books uh, that's signed by him or something like that. Um, I, I roll my eyes, of course. But uh, uh, supposedly he's actually a very compelling writer, uh, if you want. And this is his book about, I think, the, the capture of Al Capone and, and the big mob crackdowns that, you know, that, that came in the... Uh, by was it J. Edgar Hoover who was the FBI um, the director who really commenced that? Mm -hmm. Oh, it was okay. My wife is listening to me. <laughs> okay, I uh, well, thank you very much for the book. Whatever. <laughs> um, the two books I am really looking forward to reading that she got me um, were uh, The Murder of the Middle Class by Alan Root and uh, Ray Suarez's The Old Neighborhood. Uh, both of these are discussing the destruction of the urban middle class, of the urban um, ethnic communities, basically largely Catholic and largely Gentile ethnic communities. Uh, as you, as you're, you might be aware. If, I think didn't um, who wrote Slaughter of Cities? Is that uh, is that E. Michael Jones or is that uh, Kevin uh, Kevin McDonald? I think it's Kevin McDonald actually, but I believe E. Michael Jones wrote about this too. One of the greatest phenomenon that's never discussed inside contemporary American politics is the literal ethnic cleansing of American cities between the early 60s and the late uh, and, and, the, and the 90s. In this country, there used to be highly cohesive urban Gentile white communities in this country that were largely Catholic, some Protestant, uh, that had ethnic tradition, traditions with which they... Uh, continued which had replacement birth rates and in the subsequent periods our cities are our cities are completely cleared out of gentile or white people or or people of an indigenous european ethnic persuasion and all of those people uh, fled to suburbia uh to communities that were i mean more let's be honest more deracinated than the communities that they had come from and that were less connected to to the to mainstream American political life. Uh, it, it's it's the great tragedy. It's it's directly related also to to the to the destruction of the middle class. Um, of these authors, I think Root is a neocon, and I think I think Ray Suarez. He he's literally an NPR guy, right? Um, but they're describing um, they're describing the same phenomenon. Now, I, I'm not looking forward to the Suarez, uh, the Suarez book because I'm pretty sure that he's going to attribute a disruption of the middle class to, the, to, to, to neoliberalism and, and to racism. But you can't tell the story of the destruction of these ethnic urban communities without telling the story of the massively increasing crime rates and the massively falling price of labor. Without those, two, and, and also the forced integration of schools, the busing. Without those components, 
uh, being part of the story, which they're never part of when liberals discuss them. You'll never be able to understand what actually happened in the destruction of the middle class and in the destruction of the cities in, in the 20th century. Um, uh, speaking of equally disgusting Catholic ethnic cleansings, um, here is uh, uh, Oliver Cromwell's biography. I think my wife gave me this to me as well. She knows what an anti-Cromwell fan I am. Um, I'm absolutely in love with the 1970, I think it's 1976 uh, movie Cromwell, who has Alec Guinness, who plays, he absolutely destroys his portrayal of Charles I. Alec Guinness is the actor who portrayed Obi-Wan Kenobi. And uh, he plays Charles I with this magnetism that is just amazing. You also get, um, um, you also get a, a very uh, flamboyant portrayal. And this is a flamboyant character, although he was very, very straight <laughs> in real life, of Prince Rupert of the Rhine who's a very colorful historical character of the period, a cavalier, the cavalier, basically, the cavalier general who, who eventually lost Charles's war for him. Um, Oliver Cromwell, the victor of the English Civil War, uh, is, is talked about here. It's also the subject of the movie. Um, I didn't get around to reading this book, um, but, but I look more... Uh, I look forward to more reasons why I should really dislike Oliver Cromwell beyond the reasons why I already dislike him. His anti-Catholicism, his destruction, destruction of the medieval English folk tradition, his absolute um, pillaging of, uh, of uh, English cathedrals, the smashing of, of relics, the destruction of beautiful um, stained glass art that, that is still extant in, 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 in France and in Germany. And oh well, just to just just to toss one more on the fire, uh, the 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 complete um, genocidal invasion, uh, maybe genocidal is a little strong, but but the the democidal conquest of of Ireland, um, you know, so not a popular person in my opinion, uh, but you know may, maybe the book will change my mind, may, maybe it'll teach me that um, I was wrong about uh, about Catholicism. <laughs> Charles Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell didn't do nothing wrong. Isn't there a YouTube channel by the name of Oliver Cromwell didn't do nothing wrong? Um, okay, so this is a little bit, um, perhaps this, this next selection is a little bit, uh, well, it's a little bit close to home, but this is, um, so uh, this is a friend of the channel, um, uh, Justine Brown, uh, Hollywood Utopia. So I'm a California native, so this is a, play on the concept of uh, Hollywood Babylon. So Hollywood Babylon is all of the unwholesome, destructive elements of Hollywood history. And, um, and uh, Justine Brown, uh, she, uh, she kind of wrote the antithesis to this. So, um, you know, this is, um, this is uh, close to my heart. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't read through this book altogether. I, I read parts of it because I always wanted to, my wife wanted to go to Southern California. And while we were living in California, I'm like, oh, this is easy. You know, we'll just pop on down to Southern California and go to Disneyland and, and see the sites, which you know aren't very many. Death Valley, Disneyland. I'm, maybe there's a few other ones. I, you know, typical Northern Californian has a very cynical attitude towards Southern California. And, you know, when I got this book, I'm like, oh, my God, you know, we'll use this as, as a way of, of looking through Hollywood through different, through different eyes. Um, and, of course, because of COVID, we never got to take that trip. Um, I sympathize with Justine Brown in, in the fact that as a Californian, no one will ever believe you when you tell them. That, that California was a very, very special place. It was a very magical place before it eventually became the cesspit of progressivism that it is today. Uh, there was a promise there and there was a magic there that you just, is very hard to rediscover. For instance, Hitchcock, numerous uh, of his very, very famous movies are Californian. Um, I don't know if Psycho was in California, I, uh, but 
But certainly Vertigo very famously was in San Francisco. It had to be, right? That was Vertigo was about San Francisco in the 1950s. And even in the 1950s, Vertigo was about the culture that San Francisco had lost. Uh, but also Birds very famously takes place in Bodega Bay. Uh, all the very famous uh, genres of film noir think very famously Chinatown takes place in L.A. Uh, film noir, you think of it being Chicago because Chicago was a very famous uh, gangland. Uh, but actually most of the famous noir takes place in Los Angeles. So California has all of this rich history, all, all of this wholesomeness, all of this stuff that we just can't forget. And, you know, what are we going to remember from it? What are we going to remember from, from Hollywood? We're going to remember Hollywood Babylon. And so um, maybe, you know, uh, when, when we look back upon the, the, the burning pile of caca that is California right now, I hope we can remember something good from it. And, and Justine Brown has in Yeoman's work um, documenting, I mean, a very important slice, but, but you know, my, the, the Northern California in me will say, I think that the, the good side of Hollywood is, is, in the grand scheme of things, a very small slice of, of what was very good in California. I'm going to put this off to the side um, as part of a larger thing that all needs to be... Uh, this was my... Uh, discussed together. Uh, this was my Christmas present for this year. My parents gave me uh, The Night in History. Um, I've read a thousand books on knights and uh, medieval um, times. I haven't gotten around to this one yet. Um, I guess I have a justification for not reading this one because uh, it's... Um, it's uh, uh, you know, I just... I, I'm recently... Just recently came into possession of this book. Um, among the other books about Russia that I bought uh, along when I was reading the, the fiction book Loris is The Land of the Firebird. I love this one because I appreciated the fact that it was demarcated with pictures. So I could skip right to the chapter I wanted to read and read just those few chapters. So I read just those few chapters in this book and then I kind of put it down. Um, I actually discovered this book because Rod Dreher recommended it to me. He, I think he's a member of the Russian Church, uh, Russian Orthodox Church. I, sh I say he recommended it to me like he recommended it to me personally. I, I read it off of his blog, and, it, and I was um, I was kind of uh, intrigued by it. I am very intrigued by by Russia, uh, not least of which because it's it's they they're the Russian authors are the great masters of the novel. Obviously, you might have heard me discuss. If you watch the earlier versions of this, uh, War and Peace and Brothers Karamazov, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, one of my favorite novels that's not currently on my bookshelf, but probably should be, would be Gogol's Lost Souls, which is a seminal work of Russian literature. Not a great read in terms of an enthralling plot, the way Crime and Punishment is, but still but still a very, um, a, 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 it makes you think, I should say, right? And it's, it's also a big influence on Flannery O'Connor who listed that book as one of her main influences in writing Southern Gothic fiction uh, almost 100 years later. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, for a Catholic and not an Orthodox person, I have this deep fascination with Russian Orthodoxy and, and Russian history, and in particular Russian medieval history. I mean, you know, you know Catherine the Great as well, too, but, but in particular the, the medieval section. Um, that's a good one. On uh, the medieval idea of marriage, I read a little bit of this uh, for, uh, I mean, you know, a lot of these books have way too much details in them, and I was really trying to find one idea out of it, uh, about trying to trace how Christian marriage concepts evolved over time. Um, I think I, thought this, I found this in a great bookstore in, um, in, in Victoria, Vancouver Island, not Victoria, but a surrounding town. And I, you know, I immediately fell in love with it, so bought it on the spot. I swear I have books about history that um, are uh, are are not just about the Middle Ages. <laughs> Believe it or not, right? Believe it or not. This is my wife's book uh, that she read. I did not read this. It's about the people who uh, participated in the Holocaust and the other massacres in. Um, 
in, uh, in, in the Third Reich. Um, I'd have to ask her about it. Um, I'm, always, I'm always a little bit, you know, I'm always a little bit, whenever people are trying to discuss uh, the Third Reich and they're discussing it in terms of human evil, I, I'm of the, I, obviously, I believe that the Third Reich was a very evil regime, but I'm not of the opinion that it was somehow uniquely evil among all historical events. Like this is the ne plus ultra of all human evil. Uh, no people have ever been more evil than the mid-century Germans. I think that's baloney. I think that uh, I think that what you see in the Third Reich is a very ordinary kind of misgovernments. I think it's a very common mistake in the 20th century. Obviously, I would challenge people other than the racial stuff, other than the racial motivation. Very little brutality was was shown in Nazi Germany that was not repeated or, or prefigured even in, in the communist regimes, eh, both before and after Hitler. So, I mean, maybe I'm dropping the bomb of saying that. Uh, but to me, you know, once you're killing millions upon millions of people, um, you know, I, I really think the phenomenon needs to be explored more generally as a phenomenon of the 20th century and not just as you know, must-jazz, 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 must mustache man bad, and mid-century Germans bad. Um, <laughs> another book my wife has, uh, this is by Michael Behe, a uh, notorious uh, proponent of intelligent design. Um, I think I showed this this book to my, um, to my uh, father, and he did a double take because he's, you know, a big Darwinian. Uh, he, he received Thomas Nagel much better. Um, and what can I say? Uh, I think that intelligent design probably gets a bad rap uh, because it had really, really middle, middle brow proponents in the mid 2000s. And I think that there are probably a lot of arguments that Michael Behe puts forward. The modern evolutionists like uh, Richard Dawkins dismiss out of hand. To me, I think that criticisms of evolution are uh, really need to be ha entertained, in my opinion. Uh, evolution itself has kind of a tautological dimension to it. And there are a lot of questions about the process of evolution that haven't really been answered. Uh, not to mention, you know, if you are part of the thought crime section of, of the internet, you're aware that there are certain corollaries of human evolution that we know are underexplored because they literally cancel Nobel winning scientists for even speculating about this. Uh, you know, you can hear it every every day on Edward Dutton's channel, right? So, you know, I would like to think that we have uh, an open-minded debate on evolution. Uh, but given that, I know for a fact that there are entire, there are entire fields of, of evolutionary um, history and evolutionary psychology that we can't even explore uh, you know, uh, an honest discussion about Darwin's flaws will have to wait uh, for a more honest age of human existence. And it's not really my thing in the interim. So, you know, uh, that book I haven't read and will never read. <laughs> I, I know the arguments and, um, you know, that is what it is. Uh, this is a book of medieval for folklore from the age of Charlemagne mixed with history. I read a few of these. They're great. Um, medieval folklore is always good. I don't know why I have it shelved in history, but um, it's Bullfinch. So Thomas Bullfinch was a very famous writer of mythology. Um, always good for that stuff. Bullfinch's mythology is, um, you know, you, if, you, if you read a lot of mythology, you'll recognize the name, right? Okay, um... So, so my father obviously grew up uh, in, in not in mid-century Germany, but during that time period, uh, inside um, inside occupied territory, and uh, he has a lot of interest in the Third Reich, and he read a lot of books about it, and um, I, I brought the problem I just mentioned uh, to 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 him, where you know I'm afraid of having moralism uh, mixed in with my history about the mid-century Germans. And when I asked him what book he he recommended, he recommended this book. Uh, so, so I wanted to get like, I want to have a primary source about the Third Reich that's not filtered through Allied propaganda. 
and he gave me Albert Speer's Inside the Third Reich. This is a memoir of the Third Reich written by a person who was a, uh, I think, a low level, um, uh, a low level government bureaucrat inside the Third Reich. And this is how Hitler's government worked from inside Hitler's government. I haven't got around to reading this. I will read this book, though. Um, although it kind of shares the same problem as, as, you know, who's having an honest conversation about the actual, you know, who, who wants to have a non-cartoon version of, of uh, uh, his, history? Who wants to actually discuss a non-cartoon history of the Third Reich? Given that any kind of non-cartoon history of the Third Reich is going to immediately get you canceled. Uh, you know, pe people thought that downfall was uh, was sugarcoating was 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 which I think is a very honest portrayal of Hitler's last forty eight hours alive. Uh, people were saying that that was you know that could never get made today because it portrays Hitler somewhat sympathetically. So you know I will forever keep this book and, and read it in preparation for an honest conversation about the Third Reich, which will probably never happen. <laughs> but, you know, I, I really value that book. Um, any kind of, um, any kind of uh, uh, honest history, I'd say is, a, uh, or so not honest history, primary history, history from the people who were actually there is very, very valuable to me. Um, this is, um, Uh, last few books of this genre. Um, okay. Um, might as well start here. Um, I'm going to start with... Uh, so, I kind of picked this up from Powell's books in Portland. I kind of fell in love with it. So, Sartre Restartus is Carlyle's uh, fictional parody history of uh, understanding the world through clothing, right? The tailor is resurrected or restored in Latin. Um, so exactly what can you learn from the progression of history just by looking at the costumes of history? I, I think you can actually learn a lot. Um, so this is just like every culture, uh, every historical period in costume showing the progression through time. Um, I have flipped through this book a, a fair number of times just because seeing the progression of the actual costumes uh, gives you just such an insight into how people actually lived, into how people thought. The cost, as Shakespeare said, clothing does not make the man, but clothing does proclaim him. And clothing does give you an insight into what people thought were valuable. I'll always remember that quote from G.K. Chesterton, where he says, this is from Orthodoxy, uh, where he says the... Uh, that the medieval man was more humble than, than the modern millionaire. Uh, he, he wore gold vestments on the outside and a hair shirt on the inside, which meant that he understood that he was uh, a higher up person. And he did people a favor by representing that publicly so he could be seen as the holder of power and so that he could also uh, put his best foot fo forward. He could, he, could, he could make the world a more beautiful place while at the same time keeping his hair shirt, his penance, his pain on the inside. Whereas the modern millionaire, he wears, what does he wear? He wears drab black on the outside and then where does he keep his gold? On the inside, if he does wear gold at all, or more modernly, he keeps his gold hidden away. The modern millionaire dresses like a slob and keeps his true wealth in his true true power where it can really do malicious damage, where it can really do malicious damage, hidden away in Swiss bank accounts, spread up among innumerable assets that we'll never see, so on and so forth. All right, <laughs> yet another book about uh, the famous uh, medieval mystics. So, you know, this is like Hildegard von Bingen, uh, people like that. Ah. I can't even remember if I've read that book at this stage. So many books on England, or in medieval England in particular. Ah, so um, 
most people who know me know that I was super into uh, American music and American folklore. And I'm always on the lookout for American folklore tomes. And this is one that I picked up at Powell's Books in Portland. I use this periodically as a reference. Uh, I don't think American folklore is particularly rich or good. A lot of it's tall tales. A lot of it's very, very regional. Um, but, but given that the American musical tradition is so rich, um, I'm always kind of uh, cross-referencing it with, um, with, with, with sort of its, its tall tales. And, and with its um, and with its um, uh, uh, folk tales. Uh, although I don't think the American folktale tradition is particularly rich, I do think the American ghost story tradition is is very obviously. America, in in some ways, it's a newer country, but it's more haunted than the old world. Paradoxically, uh, less has happened, but we seem to have more spooks. Wasn't that what uh, Burroughs said in Naked Lunch? He said. Uh, America is a tainted place. Something went wrong here before the Indians. The land itself seems old. I don't know. I like that Imagistics. Here we have my wife's uh, Renaissance songbook. I think she did a course in Renaissance uh, song. And so uh, she has, I think I have it with my history books just because. Probably should go with the music books, but. Considering I have so much books, uh, so many books on medieval uh, Renaissance folklore and mystics and all the like, what's one more among the among the among the pattern? Okay, so this is last but not least. Last but not least. Oh, uh, one 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 before the final category. Uh, the White Nile by Alan Moorhead. So this is a really amazing, I think it's an early 20th century, fully illustrated uh, book about the exploration of Africa, uh, of East Africa by Western Westerners. So for the majority of time, it, it, people don't know this, but but for the majority of history, uh, I mean, not even history, for obviously for the majority of history, but but... But right up until the really the end of the 19th century, Africa was completely unexplored. What we knew of Africa was just for trading with people uh, on, you know, on, on the periphery, South Africa, uh, Madagascar, and then obviously the, 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 the slave uh, ports on, on the West. But the entire interior, interior was unexplored. People did not know the source of the Nile. People, you know, people had heard of a place called Timbuktu, but a lot of Victorians thought Timbuktu was, was fictional. Got my seltzer water here. Um, and then in the 19th century, a bunch of intrepid explorers like Livingston and, and Rhodes, well, I think Rhodes was much, much later. But, but a lot of intrepid explorers actually began coming into the interior and, and exploring it and documenting it. And this is the, the White Nile and the Blue Nile is about that process, about, about exploring Africa, about documenting its peoples, about describing how it existed in the 19th century. And what I remember very, very uh, prominently about the White Nile and the Blue Nile uh, was just how backwards a lot of the North African slave cultures looked. Uh, they come out very, very unflatteringly in this portrayal. Um, but just, you know, I mean, and come on, this is a fully illustrated book about Africa. It's, it's just beautiful. Um, you know, you can't not love these types of books. You know, these, these types of uh, illustrations. I don't know. Um, I, I doubt you could pick this up on Amazon, uh, but they don't make them like they used to. They don't, they don't make books about history and geography where you read it and it feels like you're traveling to an alien planet and exploring an alien people for the first time. Everything now is not only homogenized culturally, but it's also featured through this stifling lens of, of politics where all sorts of possibility are kind of filtered out. Um, anyway, very good book. All right, let's take the last three. The last three are very special to me. Because this is the history, uh, I did research recently, the history of the Danish Swabians. So this is my father's ethnicity. And uh, I did research uh, not only about 
uh, recent German migrations in the 20th century. This is the only book in English. Um, uh, and then I also did, uh, <clears throat> my father found this book about, um, this is completely in German, uh, but this is about the, uh, the, the home city he was born in, which is currently in Serbia, uh, Apatine. And, um, yeah, this, this discusses the German colony that was there and no longer exists post-World War II. And then uh, a book that I'm per very proud to have found, uh, an illustrated history of the Danish Swabians. These are the German colonists that colonized, uh, that colonized uh, Eastern Europe or along the Danube in the 18th century and that were subsequently ethnically cleansed in World War II. This is a wonderful book. It's all in German, uh, totally out of print. Uh, the illustrations on every page uh, about the history of these people. Um, you know, and the, some of the German's simple enough so that even I can kind of wing it. But, you know, I say I research these books. I mainly use online sources. And then my father read these in their German and explained them to me. And, of course, the pictures are essential for putting together the, 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 the puzzle. Uh, I recommend everyone who's interested in history to, to go back and trace your family lineage back as far as you can. You'll find something interesting there, I guarantee it. Uh, some people have boring family lineages, but, but put together a documentary, make a movie. I, I put together a sort of a, a movie of my, I, a documentary of my father's own life and his description of his ancestors. And just the first 15 minutes of that movie where he discusses uh, these people going back to the 18th century is just enthralling. And it really, um, it really kind of put you into, uh, the reason why modern people find history boring is that we feel that we're not part of history. We feel that we're separated from it. History is something that happened to other people. No, we are actually living history in the same way that we're living politics. And because of that, um, the first real way to become acquainted with history is to trace your own family lineage back and to make it part of your own identity. Then with that in hand, think about your own line stretching backwards and the political decisions that were made that influenced them. The Teutonic movements of human action and human displacement that led you to believe, that led you to be where you are, that led your grandparents and great grandparents to be where they were. And then imagine how those same forces might carry forward into the future. And I mean, that will make you interested in history. And when you're interested in history and when you're mapping it out in, and when you're mapping it out in your own mind, you'll begin to engage with it and, and kind of build it up as part of your own character more. So with, with that, those three last very personal books that should end this section on history. And I guess I will begin again I don't know with what, either either poetry or with, with graphic novels to, to have kind of a welcome respite for all this heavy stuff. But I'll see you in the next section. All right, so welcome back to the next part of the bookshelf. Uh, right now I've been doing this for a while, so to break up sort of the more heavy fare, I think tonight I'm going to be looking at the graphic novel collection I have. Uh, so for a very long time throughout most of my 20s, I was a big fan of the graphic novel as a form of art and as a form of communication. And this is kind of the pretension that most 20-year-olds have about their favorite media form or their favorite kind of uh, unappreciated nerd hobby. You know, if, if only people could appreciate the esoteric qualities of comic books, then, you know, the, the society would be changed. But, but because of that fascination with graphic novels in my early 20s, I have, over the course of the subsequent decade and a half, accumulated a lot of, um, a lot of fairly interesting graphic novels, uh, some of them for adults, some of them for children, and I just kind of grouped them together, and I think they're interesting enough to talk about and explain and, and go a little bit further on. I know a lot of my audience appreciates graphic novels and are interested in uh, reads that might be enlightening uh, and and enriching for people who 
uh, don't really necessarily. <laughs> they're they're typical millennials, and they don't have the patience to go through uh, a proper text, or or they just appreciate having the visual quality of it right there in front of them. Uh, I don't think there's going to be many sort of classic comic strip comics or or Marvel comics. I think there's a few exceptions, but I'll just get right into it. Uh, so starting from the top of the box, oh, an exception to the rule that I just laid out. Um, so this is Pogo. Um, so Pogo, uh, just people see the cover here, you might recognize this character. Um, this is a, a classic American uh, sort of newspaper comic strip that was known in the 1930s and 40s. I think this was prior to Peanuts, actually. So it was prior to most of the mainstream comics that uh, comic strips that we 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 know from the newspaper uh, modernly, like you know Calvin and Hobbes or Peanuts or Hagar the Horrible or whatever. Um, and this one is uh, this is by Walt Kelly, and uh, Walt Kelly was a uh, I think he was a Southern gentleman, a su Southern gentleman, and he wanted to do sort of a comic strip uh, that that brought along newspaper humor and also some philosophical themes, some. Uh, vague po uh, poetic uh, perspectives on the world and he came up with Pogo and Pogo is a comic about a possum and the rest of his swamp buddies obviously these are all animals that come from the southern United States and their various adventures uh, it you know it's it's a very innocent comic um, I kind of associate it with things like Bloom County although Bloom County is way more political and um, it's famous for just sort of little witticisms that get inserted in, into it the, the most famous uh the most famous phrase that you might recognize from Pogo is, we have met the enemy and he is us. Uh, that's sort of one of the things that the, the possum Pogo says. And, um, you know, you got lots of little things there. I mean, you can see the art style here. It's very, you know, very, I think it's 1940s kind of newspaper print. But I found this at the used bookshop and I had to pick it up because it's just, I think it is a very seminal uh, part of, of American uh, graphics and comic illustration. So, put that there. I imagine I'll be going a little bit faster through these because I um, there isn't a lot. There, well, there's there's some things that I can say about a lot of these things. The next one on my list, um, I don't know if I have all of them here. I can never keep track of it. So, I mentioned at the beginning that I got really into graphic novels of artistic variety. And, uh, you know, I obviously developed this fascination in high school and carried it on throughout my 20s. And uh, people ask about the ones that got me into the, uh, into the, 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 I wouldn't say passion, but got me interested in, in the medium. And, you know, it's the typical ones like Watchmen or V for Vendetta. Although, uh, subsequently, I have a much lower opinion of those too than uh, since the movies came out. For some reason, uh, once V for Vendetta became a thing that every uh, midwit uh, leftist undergraduate philosophy student thought was profound, uh, kind of the specialness of it uh, seemed to fade away. Uh, the edginess kind of became something that was a consumer product. Uh, that's kind of shallow in itself because the popularity of something shouldn't make it less enjoyable, but for that particular thing, it did. But I don't think it's really possible to ruin this series for myself uh, just because I have a sort of a sentimental attachment to it, even though it's very similar. It comes from a similar era. And this is the um, the Sandman series by Neil Gaiman. So this is uh, the thing that got me into... So uh, this is the thing that, that sort of made me a fan of Neil Gaiman when I first discovered it in the 90s and uh, kept me reading him right up until things like Coraline and uh, Good Omens. And um, how do I describe this? So uh, Neil Gaiman was, uh, he was commissioned to do a, a series of kind of short comics in the DC universe uh, surrounding Sandman, which was at that time a DC comic book character. And instead of actually writing a comic about the character Sandman, the superhero, he wrote uh, a, a, a series of short stories uh, about the Lord of Dreams, like the actual literal Sandman that causes people to go to sleep and dream, like this immortal god. And the the, the first set of stories, and, and subsequently this was the pattern throughout, is that this, this immortal being would kind of interact in these little vignettes 
uh, with other mortals. And, and originally this was very explicitly in the DC universe. Like the Sandman interacts with um, uh, the Martian from the Justice League or John Constantine from the Constantine franchise or whatever. And then later on, it just becomes sort of an element of urban realism where they're just interacting with ordinary people. And the stories are really about uh, a variety of philosophical topics. And Neil Gaiman is a very a surprisingly well-read Englishman for a comic book artist from the 1990s. And he was able to draw all these disparate elements into Sandman. Uh, he was a big fan of G.K. Chesterton. As a matter of fact, I discovered G.K. Chesterton through, um, through the Sandman because he's literally a character in the Sandman called Fiddler's Green which, you know, might give you an idea of where I got the name for my substack. And um, I don't know, it's just, it's just, it's just great. Uh, so really what it is, is, a, is this, it's a sh set of short stories. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of illustrated similarly to a DC comic, but they really play out more like um, fantasy short stories. And they're, they're all around a consistent theme of dreaming. Uh, and some of them involve the character of Morpheus or the Sandman more or less. Sometimes he's sometimes he's just in the background. Sometimes he's literally the protagonist of the story, and and they they try to kind of grasp at a central um, dimension of humanness in a way that very few comics do. And uh, and at the same time, they'll, they'll, he'll Neil Gaiman will go across genres. He'll do you know one story about the Sandman will take place in the Arabian Nights. Another one will take place in medieval Russia. Uh, get a third will take place in New York, and another one will take place in Hell, and uh, you know all sorts of weird stuff and and crossing over folklore. And simultaneously, all the mythologies can be true at once. And um, all of the gods of the various pantheons all interact with the god of dreams, right? Because everyone dreams. That's one of the, the, the eternal things that all sentient creatures can do. And so Neil Gaiman is able to sort of sample of all, all of the things that he's read about and kind of draw them into a broader character study. That's Neil Gaiman at his best. Um, you know, this is really... I, I've really... I've read it a little bit, and I, I, I hate to say that I wasn't really as enthralled with my rereading of this as was I was when I originally discovered the series as like a teenager. And, you know, as, as probably you can expect once you've read, once you've read all the primary sources that Neil Gaiman is drawing from, uh, their sort of postmodern remix is a little less uh, fresh. But what I really appreciate about early Neil Gaiman, and what I think still makes him a very good writer, um, at least up into Coraline, I'm, I'm afraid that I, I, I really... I saw some woke elements creep into his stuff, and I kind of just backed away because I didn't want to see the car crash. For all I know, he's still doing great stuff. Uh, but what made him a really good writer back in the day was that even though all of his ideas are taken from other places, even though he borrows liberally and just dumps them into a giant remix, and uh, and that's kind of a bored, uh, that's kind of a stale archetype at this stage. What makes him such a good, such a good writer is that he just takes stories. And he lets the stories kind of go wherever they need to, by the logic, by their own internal logic, by by their own, but the humanness of the characters kind of leads where the story goes. And so each of the stories, even though it's kind of gimmicky, even though it's like, oh, well, let's do a story about Marco Polo, or let's do a story about, you know, this Egyptian prince or whatever. Like, even though, um, you know, you can kind of see them just kind of throwing darts at the board and, and, and doing a different story about that. Uh, the fact that Neil Gaiman has has a good ear for dialogue and a good understanding of how human the humans kind of progress through 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 the narrative of their own lives means that all the stories kind of still feel organic, and and much more than sort of Alan Moore's Watchmen or V for Vendetta or these other kind of great you know this is comics as art from the nineteen eighties and nineties. Uh, this one's my favorite. Uh, there are about 10 volumes, and the short stories together tell a lar larger story. Then maybe there's only eight. I I'm missing a bunch here because I, I lent them out to people. I still do, and I never get them back. So uh, that is what it is. <laughs> um, let's see, going down the list. I have this one. This is a comic about the Carter family. The Carter family was the originators of American folk music, at least in its recorded form, uh, from the 1920s. They were sort of the OG old-time uh, recording group. 
uh, what would later, uh, much, well, about 15 or 20 years later, become bluegrass through Bill Monroe, uh, but was then sort of, would eventually become the Grand Old Opry and stuff like that. Um, sort of the 1930s folk revival, uh, this would lead to it. Um, you know, I got this thing as a promotional at a folk festival. Um, it's a very unromantic picture of the Carter family. Uh, I will not say it's very interesting. You know, a lot of um, these comics, a lot of a lot of comics that are historical, they'll just tell a story and they won't. They'll tell a history that you could read in the book just as well. And there's no need for illustrations. There's no like, unlike in Sandman, where you're you know. The, the artists who, and there's different artists basically every single issue in Sandman. And the artists really make use of, of the fact that they have a visual palette and they'll do all sorts of crazy stuff and they'll represent things in a weird way that adds to the story. Um, you know, these historical ones, they're just, you could read the story in like a 20 page book and it would be the exact same thing. Uh, you know, I don't even know why I still have this other than I got it for free. Um, and, you know, obviously. The Carter family, everyone should know about them. They're, I mean, they're hugely influential in American music. Um, obviously, uh, what was it? The granddaughter, June Carter Cash, very famously uh, married Johnny Cash and was part of his act. Um, I still think that there are some descendants who are still making music in, you know, in, in Nashville or whatever, but I, I haven't really kept up, so um, we'll see. Uh, okay. Going over... Um, Going over uh, uh, kind of comics I probably don't want in my uh, collection. Uh, I have the ultimate Catholic comic book. This is a Kickstarter I funded. Uh, I'm like, oh, uh, so this person did a variety of sort of funny. Um, uh, he did a, uh, like two or three sort of funny Catholic jokes in comic form. And every, all the Catholic movies was like, oh, my God, this guy's really talented. Uh, and so they, they added to this Kickstarter and got this book published. Um this is a problem. This is it's too reverent to be really like satirical. It is it doesn't take any risks, and because of that, it can't be really really funny. It, even the Babylon B takes more risks, which kind of tells you where this humor is coming from. This is very much sort of 2015 Catholic humor, where people are still trying to be you know on the good side of PC. And I, I think subsequent efforts at Christian humor have been much more effective. I think a lot of people have been been getting braver. I've noticed that the the Babylon B has been getting uh, a lot braver. The, the problem with um, you know religious comedy always is that comedy is essentially a subversive. And then um, so the, the the thing is is that and that's not to say that religious people can't have comedy or there there can't be respectful comedy or there can't be uh, uh, boundaries. But the problem is is that when you're doing pious comedy. Um, there either has to be a limit on the piety or there either has to be a limit on the comedy. And so you're, you're walking into that genre with your hands tied behind your back. At least Babylon B, and I think the reason why they do it effectively is that the, their, their, their identity as Christians is kind of kept behind a veil. And so they can subsequently make fun of themselves uh, make and, and the boundaries and, and make fun of other red staters and evangelicals and the boundaries are less explicit. Once once the, the book literally has a crucifix on the cover, uh, I don't think you're going to be doing comedy effectively. And that's not to say we shouldn't have Catholic comedians. We absolutely should. And there have been some really, really good ones. But I think this was the, the project just was not um, well conceived from the get go. But I paid for the Kickstarter, so I'm still keeping it right. Um, speaking of uh, a comic that deeply reflects um, uh, peop, uh, a Catholic religion or a Catholic religious question. I picked this is the last uh, sort of graphic novel I ever purchased that was um, uh, uh, sort of uh, a um, the last one I purchased that I read <laughs> and enjoyed of any variety. And this is uh, Boxers and Saints by uh, Jean Luen Yang. So Jean Luen Yang is a Chinese American Catholic, and he did. Uh, Boxers and Saints is, uh, so if people, sorry, I don't have this right. Uh, so it's a two part series and it's about the Boxer Rebellion. And one of the volumes is about, about the Boxer Rebellion from the perspective of the native Taoists. And the other one is uh, a perspective from the Catholic converts. So the Boxer Rebellion was an anti-imperialist peasant revolt basically in late 19th century China. And it was it was um, coordinated by a bunch of uh, Taoists that were 
very, very, I think it was mostly Taoists. It was, well, native Chinese religion, right? They, they were very upset about foreign incursions and in, in particular, the incursion of Christianity. And uh, this resulted in an incredibly violent rebellion um, that, that ended up killing a bunch of Christian Chinese converts and ended up burning down a, a few uh, small cities until it was put down uh, by by foreign intervention. But I think it was the U.S. Marines and, and the and, and maybe and I think the British too. Um, I, I, I don't. I think it was a multinational force of Western powers that put the Boxer Rebellion down. And um, and and I, I love this because um, you know there's always this this problem between. Uh, all of us, you know, Europeans, Asians, uh, Africans, whatever, is that you, you always will have sort of a, uh, a pagan soul and a Christian soul uh, kind of kept in, in a team. And, and sometimes these two forces come into conflict. And this is, these are two very, very sympathetic portrayals of the same conflict, uh, the same events uh, from different religion, from people of the same ethnicity, they're both Chinese but of different religions, and um, I thought the visual medium worked really, really well to to capture this. Uh, I thought it would it was it would be it it's it's it works better as a graphic novel, and I really enjoyed it. You know, I mean, if you're not interested in Chinese history or Catholic history, would it be you know really important for you to pick up this book? Probably not. It, it is it is very much a history kind of graphic novel but it's one that captures a real human moment and that uses uh the graphic medium to really elaborate on the emotions of that human moment so i really i really appreciated this one um you know and i also like the fact that it, it was i i think it was ultimately more sympathetic to the catholic side of the conflict uh but but it really i think it captured what it would feel like to be, you know, on the receiving end of imperialism. I mean, I think a lot of people can understand that emotion, uh, you know, maybe maybe sometime in their past or maybe sometime uh, more in a more contemporary capacity. Uh, so, you know, that is what it is. Um, <laughs> um, one one web comic that I, I absolutely loved when I was in graduate school was Piled Higher and Deeper. Uh, PhD. Uh, it's by a Stanford graduate student called George Cham. Uh, you can see all of these. It's just basically grad student jokes about how lame grad students are. Um, but I, I really found this funny. And, you know, it's, it's more or less just inside jokes. I wouldn't expect people to, to li like it. Um, okay, another uh, uh, newspaper comic. I think this is the last one of these, uh, if you discount one particular exception. Uh, Bloom County. This is probably my favorite 1980s uh, comic that ran in newspapers. It's Reagan era politics with animals and uh, various different people uh, who, who are reacting to life in America in the 1980s. And it's really funny. Um, you know, it's a little bit like Doonesbury, I guess. But I thought this was, I always thought this was more, uh, this was more genuine than Doonesbury. I always thought that the politics was more organic and um, and the, the jokes landed better. So, I don't know. Bloom County is a, a great gem. I think the author tried to resurrect the character of Opus in a variety of different other comics that he did later, uh, but it never really worked as well as the original 1980s Bloom County, which had, I think, a pretty limited run. I think it was about seven years between 1981 and 88, I think. Yeah, I think it was pretty much only during the Reagan administration <clears throat> but you know, I could be wrong about that. Um, all right, um, let's keep on going. Um, I have um, Marianne Satrapi's Persepolis. Uh, this was turned into a movie that I thought was pretty good. It's basically an autobiography of this uh, woman's life, this Iranian woman's life, growing up as a young girl uh, in Iran and then immigrating to Paris. Um, I don't know what to say about this, really. I thought that uh, this is very much in the French style of, um, of comic illustration. And it's something that I think, it's a style that I think was done very much better by the comic artist David B., who I'll, I'll talk about later, as one of my favorite sort of French style comic artists, or French style graphic novelists, if you will. And um, you know, I think this has turned into a movie. Uh, but 
The problem is that the author doesn't really have any point. Uh, the point was, I suppose, that she was really against the Islamic Revolution, but at the same time felt kind of alienated from Western life. Uh, which is something that I can I can sympathize with, but I don't think that there were any larger ideas, and and I, I don't know. Unlike the other ones, uh, there were no sort of conflicts I could tap into. Um, I guess living you know living under a society whose morals you don't disagree you disagree with or who you feel is uh, lying to you, I think that was an emotion felt early on was this idea that uh, as a young girl the author realizes that most of the stuff. She's hearing about the Iran-Iraq war that's going on um, from the outside. It's just basically government propaganda. And, and that's like a major coming of age for her when she realizes like the government's lying to us. And, and more so than you know the restrictions on what music you can listen to or, or the headgear you have to wear. Uh, that's like, that's the real thing, right? That's the real thing because uh, people can tolerate restrictions, but they have to at some level live in truth. All right, um, so I mentioned David B. I might as well go through this now. Uh, get it all together. Um, so this is a, a French artist called David B. I don't know what his uh, last name is, but he writes under that, um, under that uh, uh, pseudonym. And uh, he, uh, he does uh, sort of, again, French style, black and white comics. Uh, sort of surreal psychological style. Um, this is his most famous one, Epileptic, about him growing up with uh, an epileptic uh, older brother, and he was he was some uh, he was the son of uh, a French imperial administrator in Algeria. I don't remember if he's half Algerian himself, but <clears throat> he definitely has this this deep connection to sort of the, the, the old empire and the Muslim world and, um, and, and also France. And this is sort of the story of his life. Um, epileptic is usually the one people, um, people mention about David B. Uh, he's, he's brilliant at capturing the dream state, uh, the psychology in stark black and white pictures. And it's, um, it's, it's really amazing how he does that. And, uh, uh, I have a few other ones, uh, his other incidents in the night, um, which I, I kind of picked up because it it, um, it it takes place, it starts taking place, I should, I should say, in, in a particular, uh, in a particularly really cluttered bookstore that I remember entering in Paris. And uh, I, I recognized the bookstore from its comic depiction. Uh, while I was there, I, I, I walked into the store and this is, must be the most cluttered bookstore in all human existence, just piles of books. And um, and, uh, and maybe there's multiple ones like that in Paris, and it's sort of a it's sort of a surrealistic journey that evolves from there. Again, David B is uh, this, this this master of capturing uh, dreams and hauntings that, that are born of psychology. So you see the dream, you see the character operating in dream logic, and then you see the consequences of that in their lives. Uh, so, you know, he did these. Uh, another one that really sticks out in my mind that he did was Armed Garden, which covers a, a variety of the most famous heresies of the, um, of, of the what was it, the 15th century, I believe. Uh, so he, he, there, in the 15th century, there were all of these strange heresies that appeared in both uh, Islam and in Christianity. One of them is this strange syncretic Zoroastrian religion that comes out of Persia with this strange character. This is a real character called the Veiled Prophet who, who always wore a veil around his face when he fought. No one would ever see his face and he was very mysterious. And, and he fought against the very famous Caliph Halun al-Rashid. The other two are, um, uh, are uh, the uh, Bohemian heresies, uh, the Taborites and... Um, uh, the other, the, the Zan Zizek or whatever his name is, the, the guy that was turned into a drum by his followers so he could lead them in death. Uh, this, uh, these, these are really crazy heresies that I remember hearing about from my father when, you know, you hear about the, the history of the Holy Roman Empire. And this is one of the really, there are all of these bizarre variations on Christianity that came out of Bohemia in in the uh in the late renaissance and and they're absolutely bizarre twistings of christianity 
And David Bede does an amazing rendition of, of, the, the, of the Islamic history, heresies and the Christian heresies uh, where, where you see the beliefs of the people embodied in, in how they're fighting. Like their literal views on the spiritual world are also part of their armies fighting for dominance, either of uh, Mesopotamia or, or of, uh, of Bohemia and Germany and, and, and the greater Holy Roman Empire. And I actually don't have that book because I believe I lent it to somebody. I never got it back, uh, but but I'll rebuy it whenever I find it. So there's that author. Um, okay, so this is one. Um, what do I say about this? Uh, this is a graphic novel that depicts uh, the crisis of foundations in mathematics that occurred in the early 20th century. It's broadly about the life of Bertrand Russell, who was sort of, I think he was the last, and maybe someone can correct me if I'm wrong about this. I think that if you exclude Wittgenstein, who was one of his contemporaries and one of his uh, co-authors, I believe, Bertrand Russell is really the last serious contributor both to mathematics and to philosophy. Uh, we know uh, Bertrand Russell today as being sort of the prime example of uh, the early 20th century atheist. And... Um, but but I think he's probably he better should be known as the person who tried and failed to put together a formalized foundation for all mathematics, and it was eventually shown to be a futile endeavor. And this will bring you through the the entirety of Bertrand Russell to Wittgenstein to Gödel, who eventually says shows that the proposition was false. They don't really discuss directly God belief in logic comics. That's the horrible name of this thing. But I feel it's always in the background because while Bertrand Russell was a committed atheist, uh, both Gödel and Wittgenstein, who are the other sort of big giants uh, and the, who, are, who are contributors to philosophy and, and mathematics, they were both theists. And they were both firm believers that in some sense, I think in the words of Wittgenstein, the universe does not contain the explanation to itself. And, um, and I don't know, is this comic great probably not probably you do better by by reading i think i have several books on bertrand russell and, and girdle and um this is uh but you know if you again if you like seeing uh history played out in panel and bubble form then you could do worse than this um ah well here is a gem i found an absolute gem uh i said did I say that I might have actually gotten this one after I got Boxers and Saints? So if that wasn't the last graphic novel I bought, and that was like seven years ago, right? So that's a while back. Uh, this certainly is. So this is a um, horror uh, graphic novel uh, by Emily uh, Carroll. It's Emily. Yeah, so Emily Carroll. Um, so I heard this, I, I got this title from Leah Labresco's blog, and uh, it was a horror graphic novel, a horror graphic novel. And as always with me, uh, I, I think that the best way to consume horror is through movies and through, um, and through radio plays and through just verbal storytelling and maybe plays sometimes can be quite scary. Uh, but I'm I'm hugely skeptical. I mean, I you know I love Lovecraft. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but I've never I have I've very seldom been like frightened. Like I can remember one time when I was genuinely frightened by a Lovecraft story, and um, or felt like kind of the horror movie sensation. Uh, this graphic novel is just beautiful. It, it convinced me that you could do a uh, horror in in sort of um, graphic novel form. Uh, you know, all it is is short stories, uh, but it is amazing. Um, you know, and I, I really liked it. That being said, when I put that book on my shelf, and I don't know if I have this book or whether I gave it away, <clears throat> but I would be remiss to say that if this isn't part of the collection, it definitely should be. That would be uh, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, which is a kid's collection of classic American horror stories uh, really targeted sort of the fourth or fifth grade reading level. And the illustrations in that are horrific. They're, they're, they're black and white stenciled and they are just haunting and they're still in my mind. 
I actually forget who the author for that was, um, but just type scary stories to tell in the dark into any book search engine and it will pick up the collections. I believe there were three volumes of that, uh, one, two, and three. And I think it was made into a Netflix movie. Again, I didn't dare watch it because I'm sure that they would ruin it. Uh, but, but that as a kid, uh, the stories were scary and they were really the, the best when you read them out. Uh, I think, again, a, a story, a scary story, you know, with all respects to James's Turn of the Screw and H.P. Lovecraft, I think that really scary stories have to be simple enough to be read aloud, and, and those certainly are. Um, and, and the illustrations just are, you know, chef's kiss. Um, so, okay, making good time here. <laughs> Another David B. that I forgot to shelf here. And... Um, I thought I was done with the webcomics. Uh, another one of my favorite webcomics from back in the day. Uh, this is a collection of Saturday morning breakfast cereal. Uh, so this is a, a staple of my atheist phase. Um, so Saturday morning breakfast cereal is uh, it's a it's a comic series by uh, who the the guy who did it was Zach Weiner. A horrible name, uh, but he was a. He created. He was sort of this, you know, atheist, secularist, a uh, cynic, who who uh, who did like a comic series, and the comics really have this very. Um, it's kind of a Rick and Morty before Rick and Morty, because the general pattern of the comics, uh, and, and they're very much you know four or five panel or, or single panel far side style, uh, uh, humor comic strips. The single pa the single pattern is uh, you think you're saying something bad. And then the caption makes it even more cynical. It makes it even more soul crushing. It makes it even more feeling like you know all meaning is is, is stupid and, and 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 drained from the universe. Uh, eventually, I think Zach Weiner and a, a set of his friends went on to create sort of a YouTube show for a few years between 2012. I think it was 2011 and 2013, where they did sort of renditions of kind of. Saturday morning breakfast cereal type uh, humor. And then I think the whole thing imploded. I noticed that, you know, around about the time of the Great Awakening is when uh, the sort of we're going to offend everyone with our irreverent atheism that kind of fell through. And you could see that a lot of them were kind of concerned to toll a political orthodoxy. And once the political orthodoxy kind of intruded into the consciousness of the creators, I don't think they could maintain their cynical view of the world anymore. It, it kind of took over everything as, 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 as you would expect. Of course, looking back on it, I mean, you know, all, all it is is sort of mocking you. It's, it's sort of mocking your internal moral instinct. So, you know, looking back on it, is it, is it fresh? You know, it was certainly fresh in 2007. <laughs> is it fresh now? I don't know, right? Um, it, it, but it, and I suspect it is. I suspect that cynicism and we're going to break all the boundaries style humor is always going to be funny. Uh, but, you no, know, I kind of realize what game is being played now. I realize that, you know, this is kind of degenerate style and it wasn't anything that lasted. It, it wasn't a style that could sustain itself into the future. And you know, right now, I think I, I saw Zach Weiner most recently on Twitter uh, spewing out some kind of progressive nonsense. Uh, current thing is, um, you know, oh my God, think of the so and so. Let's all go fight for Ukraine. I, I don't want to put words in the guy's mouth, but you know, this this guy is obviously very, is as is, is, is rule breaking as he was in 2006. Uh, he's completely captured by the orthodoxy, uh, orthodox leftism at this stage, uh, which is disappointing, you know. Um, uh, another ghost story um, Anya's ghost I think someone gave this to me for a Christmas, Christmas or birthday present it's you know again I don't think that this ever needed to be uh, a, uh, a comic um, this is very much like it almost kind of reminds me of one story from the Sandman it's just like a little vignette about a girl who encounters a ghost and the mini adventure she goes on um, there, the, the, the graphic form isn't really used, in my opinion. It, it could have easily been told in text. And it's, it's sort of, the story is too small and doesn't have any kind of external meaning in it that, that I've really felt it, it, it justified it, it being sort of like the self-contained thing. And so it kind of just felt like a throwaway. 
So I don't really have anything to say about this. I, I've heard some people love this story, uh, but it didn't really connect with me. Um, okay. Getting to some of the ones that are interesting. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so here's a weird selection. I, someone gave this to me again, and I've kept this for like decades. Um, this is uh, uh, the great the great works of Western literature uh, as depicted in in comic form, as if they appeared in like a um, as if they appeared in a newspaper. Like so, you have um, the Metamorphosis in the style of Peanuts, or you have Dante's Inferno in the style of uh, Bazooka Joe, or you have um, you have Wuthering Heights in the style of Tales of the Crypt. Or you have crime and punishment in the style of Batman. Um, you know, I don't know. It, this is utterly meaningless, but I, every time I pick it up, I laugh at it. So I've kept it for a, uh, you know a decade, even though it's pretty stupid. Um, I, another thing that I know is bad, but I still keep it around. Uh, so Flannery O'Connor was actually a uh, cartoonist for her college newspaper, uh, and I have a collection of her uh, of her. Um, cartooning that she did and, and it's really basic stuff uh it's you know it's little witticisms that probably were funny in context of the actual college environment she went to in the south in like 1949 or whatever or probably it was more like 1956 or something i, I don't exactly remember how how her age laid out across um the decades um but you know i have it just because it's Flannery O'Connor, and I like to say that I have everything that Flannery O'Connor ever wrote. Uh, she wasn't much of a comic illustrator. It was mostly inside jokes, and, and thank God she found the written word eventually because she proved herself to be the master of that more than, than panel comics. But still keeping it around. All right, um... <laughs> Uh, a little comic called Intellectual Poopery um, by none other than Nina Paley. Now, Nina Paley, I heard she's good friends with um, Geo of, of Giant Geo Art Productions, who, who I really like. Um, and, you know, to be honest, like Nina Paley, she's very progressive, or at least she was 10 years ago. Uh, there's indications that she might be a thought criminal otherwise. Uh, she, she has some unorthodoxy if she's hanging out with um, uh, us thought criminals, right, in any capacity. And um, sh that, that little comic is her arguments against intellectual property. She famously put one of these comics into a song called Property Is Not Theft, uh, which you can see on YouTube. It's like two dogs thinking about how property is not theft. Uh, or sorry, sorry, sharing is not theft. That's not, not property is not theft. Sharing is not theft. Uh, copying is not theft. That's what it's called. Copying is not theft. And it's an argument that intellectual property shouldn't exist because it fundamentally doesn't, it does not apply in the same way that like thieving does, right? If you copy something, uh, the other person still has their copy left. Now, obviously, if you steal a physical object, they don't. Um, and uh, so uh, she was a big, uh, she was a big proponent of the whole open software movement of the whole anti-intellectual property movement. And she, she made a brilliant, 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 um, uh, she made a brilliant um, uh, movie called, the, the movie is called uh, Sita Sings the Blues. That is it, that's it. And Sita Sings the Blues was, um, uh, it was a combination of the myth of Ramayana uh, Nina Paley's own personal life, and it was put to the musical soundtrack of this jazz singer from the 1930s. I'm blanking on her name, uh, but she's, uh, was it Annette Hirsch something? I forget. I, I'm, I'm mangling and I can't look it up right now. But it's one particular jazz singer from the 1920s who you, you've probably heard before, and she's very much associated with the kind of Betty Boop um, you know, a uh, flapper kind of lounge singer, tragic starlet, or tragic pre-movie starlet, but, you know, tragic singer from the 1920s. And this juxtaposition of the Hindu myth with the personal life with the jazz is absolutely amazing. Uh, it's, it's definitely up there on my list of movies as, as, or as original animated uh, movies, and it was 
and Nina, Nina Paley basically gave it away for free. And um, yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, uh, what else was I going to say about it? My one, I kind of was a little bit down on, on Paley because of her association with the Voluntary Human Extinction Project, uh, which is kind of one of my, my blacklist causes. I believe that she was a supporter of that. So originally I thought, Ugh, you know, this person... This person is going to it's going to turn out to be not not a very it's going to be kind of like this this mind that's been captured by leftism uh but you know looking at her more recent stuff it looks like she's really been able to you know cross a lot of orthodox boundaries and and think outside of the box on this so you know may, maybe this is something that i am um, you know i i, I should uh, i should give her another look in what she's doing currently but you know um Okay, looking into the organization of this whole thing. Um, I will list these two. I guess um, these are two kind of, these are very meta. I have Making Comics and Understanding Comics uh, by Scott McCloud. Um, I was, at one point I was really interested in the potential of like making a webcomic. And people told me to read these to understand it. Uh, this kind of gives you the lingo, both of how you might want to criticize a, a, a comic or a graphic novel, and also how you might put one together. Uh, they're comics themselves, and they're kind of delightful. Um, you know, I wouldn't recommend them for just general people, but if you're looking to, if you're really into graphic novels, and you're really into sort of uh, understanding the history and, and the ways they communicate you and the terminology. And uh, you, you can pick up these comics, that, the, pick up these graphic novels, or well, really, what they are is not not really novels. They're they're graphic um, graphic manuals. That doesn't sound doesn't quite have the same ring to it, now does it? Um, another two books that I have in my graphic uh, novel collection, even though they're more children's books, are um, well, one of them has the cover ripped off, but this is a Dinotopia by was it james gurney yeah james gurney i got it so dinotopia is a, a child's book uh, beautifully illustrated uh, about an island where dinosaurs live oh i that's upside down uh where dinosaurs live and live in peace with humans so it, it's it's kind of um yeah there we go that's kind of the illustrations you get and it, it, it reads, it, it's supposedly supposed to be the illustrated journals of this Victorian explorer, sort of like a Jules Verne character or an H.G. Wells character, and very much in the style of, um, of Jules Verne or H.G. Wells. The, this science fiction is that classic journey to the moon type deal where the explorer gets there and they meet interesting people and they document their journey as if they were coming to a foreign land and writing home about it. And... Uh, here, you know, it's it's um, it's funny. The main character is even. I think the main character even looks like a young H.G. Wells, and uh, and it's about a father and son who get marooned on this island where dinosaurs and humans live in peace and harmony in this common society. Apparently, dinosaurs in the society have the intelligence of humans, and it just it's just delightful. Um, it's just delightful. Uh, the the illustrations. Every page is illustrated, and uh, there's there's sort of a, a, an adventure dynamic on it. There's there's a first half which is just exploring the world of Dinotopia, and then there's a second half where they kind of do a journey to the center of the Earth type deal. And um, what what strikes me looking at it in hindsight is, is you really can see in Dinotopia, and, and any of these sort of early 19th century visions of utopia what the early socialists were imagining for their end state for humanity. Uh, they were imagining a type of socialism, a type of propertyless society where everyone were Victorian aristocratic gentlemen, where, where all women were, all women were kind of intrepid and caring and compassionate and, and uh, prudent and temperate and where all men were wise and and considered and uh, disciplined, and where 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 honor and dignity was maintained in everything, and 
you know, it's so it's so funny because you're you're looking at this book basically to get images of people riding dinosaurs and in going through these elaborate Victorian cities, these sort of gleaming cities that look like they come from uh, the Wizard of Oz or something like that. Uh, but but more than the dinosaurs being resurrected, it's the Victorian optimism or the Victorian socialist optimism uh, for 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 a completely robust society of order that exists under socialist rules. Obviously, totally impossible. It, it again, it makes the typical socialist uh, pretension that you you can arrive at the end of something and then continue it on. And like uh, you, you can arrive after five hundred years of Christian monarchy with a Victorian man, and then assume that if all constraints that led to the Victorian man are obliterated, that that Victorian man will just con continue operating and and perpetuating himself. Victorian man and Victorian woman, I should say, in, in, in perpetuity, without the constraints and without the forces that brought him into existence to begin with. Um, with that being said, it's it's a beautiful vision. It's a beautiful vision, and it's a beautiful book, and it, it's it's utopian Jules Verne optimism from the 19th century with dinosaurs that are fully illustrated. What's not to love about this? These these series of books. Uh, all right. Okay, so I guess I would be remiss if I didn't mention this one. Um, this is Frank Miller's magnum opus, The Dark Knight Returns. Um, this is what essentially gave way to the Batman craze of the 1990s and later to the literal Dark Knight series in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Nolan's version. It's been a while since I've read this. Um, I liked it in high school, uh, but I'm not really a Batman fan. But this what this is the novel. This is just comic history. This is the novel that really caused Batman to be. I mean, he was always a little bit like a noir hero, but this is what really created the super uh, hero as uh, a reincarnation of that noir idea. And uh, I don't really want to explain it because I don't know. I mean, you can read it. This is a classic graphic novel. Uh, I think there's even several animated movies about it, so I don't think anyone really needs to see this uh, or hear, hear me talk about it that, you know, hasn't already got it down in one sense or the other. Uh, reorganizing. Uh, speaking of classics, well, I guess I'll do this one first. Um, so this is... Um, this is a comic book series that I really enjoyed. I think in my last year of high school, uh, this one's called Bone, and um, it's an adventure story. Uh, it's just basically a standard fantasy adventure. Uh, it's written by the author Jeff Smith, and um, uh, I don't know what there is to say about this. It's about three sort of cartoon characters that come from sort of a silly comic book universe think of something like mickey mouse or like actually literally because the the three cartoon characters that 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 sort of break through the dimensions uh are are literally um they, they literally correspond to the three primary disney characters there's like a a mickey character a donald character and a goofy character uh, or like a, a sincere character an angry character and a goofy like uh you know a literally goofy uh personality character and then they break sort of this dimensional boundary and they end up in this serious comic world. They end up in this in this world that's sort of like a Lord of the Rings world where like really dark things are happening. And and there's like this epic battle of good and evil. And, and the whole thing is, um, the whole thing's humor relies on the contrast between uh, the wacky cartoon characters and, and the serious human characters who are fighting this battle between good and evil. And, um, you know, I really like this one. I thought it, it hit the perfect notes. And it, it also, it's also a callback to um, Disney's golden age. Uh, people forget this, but Disney had this amazing tradition of creating really great, wholesome family entertainment uh, around their primary characters of like Mickey, Donald, and Goofy. And, and if not that, that, then just generally great adventure uh, stories. And this is the kind of cultural product they wish they could produce again sort of an, an adventure story that just exists in its own rules and that has sort of 
it's kind of, I mean, if this was a movie, it would be fun for the whole family, right? Um, I don't know. It's, it's fun. It's not particularly serious, but um, an oldie but a goodie. All right. Um, so here is a classic. Now, okay, so this is, this is literally the book of Genesis in illustrated form. Uh, this is, um, where to begin with this? Uh, well, first of all, uh, this is by R. Crumb. So R. Crumb is the seminal originator of the independent comic scene in the post. I mean, obviously there were independent comic scenes uh, pre-1960s, but this is the guy who really put uh, the independent comic stuff uh, on, on the map in the 1960s and led to later stuff like American Splendor and the rest of the sort of hipster comic uh, genres. And um, his most recent work, I think this is the most recent work, is to illustrate the book of Genesis. And uh, R. Crumb, he has this very ugly comic style where, where all the characters look like they're, you know, very heady, hairy and sweaty. And, and they all have very uh, oblong bodies. Um, and, um, you know, I was, I got this, I picked, I read, read this at the library expecting it to be really irreverent. Uh, about the book of Genesis. Obviously, it's depicting sort of, um, you know, of all the books that atheists like to mock, uh, Genesis usually is at the top because it has all of the crazy stuff, or not, not crazy stuff, uh, pardon me. <laughs> uh, not to imply that the, the holy book is crazy, but it has all of the, um, you know, mythopoetic images of like the Noah and his, uh, the talking snake and all the stuff in Sodom and Gomorrah. And, um, but but actually, R. Crumb's sort of very, very human and oblong character style and his unironic depiction of events just sequentially in panels, it perfectly captures the very unironic way that Genesis is told. And um, I read this and then I immediately read it again and I, I loved every panel of it. And I couldn't believe that uh, R. Crumb's style worked so well with Genesis. Now, is this how I imagine the literal book of Genesis? Is this, you know, is this going to transform your idea of, of religion and, and the creation of the universe? Absolutely not. Um, but, but this is just an indication of just how uh, somebody can retell pro literally the oldest story in the Western canon, if you, if you exclude the epic of Gilgamesh, and it, they can retell it and it feels like you're reading a new story for the very first time. So, I have a special place in my heart for that one. Um, okay, so um, another one. Uh, this is one of my favorites of all time, uh, The Rabbi's Cat. So, I might do a video on this sometime in the future. Um, so, this graphic novel is about a community of Sephardic Jews living in Algeria in the 1920s. So uh, definitely before World War II. World War II isn't even on the horizon, and they're not Ashkenazi to begin with. And um, it's uh, about a rabbi whose cat can uh, somehow magically is imbued with speech because he eats a parrot. And unfortunately for the rabbi, the cat is a completely cynical atheist and, and torments the rabbi by rebuking all of his religious beliefs. And that's just the first chapter. It goes on to it goes on with the characters, uh, the daughter who's depicted on the cover, and um, and and, the, and her husband, and and the various other characters uh, having adventures in North Africa, and uh, coming to um, you know revelations about religion and, and the nature of identity. Uh, the author uh, Jean Safar is a Sephardic Jew himself, who I think is. I think he's a big anti-Zionist, in fact. Um, uh, but, but I love. First of all, I love. And I know, as as someone who's not Jewish, I love the fact that, for once, you're hearing a story um, about this religious group that is not dominated by uh, the the Ashkenazi experience. You know, uh, don't ban me, Susan, right? Uh, and it has a completely different perspective. Like, there's none of the typical. You know, you think about. Um, all of the stereotypes we have about uh, Jewish media or Jewish perspectives on the world, and 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 w whether they value things like martial virtue or 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 directness, and 
I won't say that all of those stereotypes are thrown in the trash in this book, but a lot of them are, right? And, and you see this 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 other world that's just uh, completely different. I mean, not to mention the fact that I mean, I don't know if you can get a good idea, but I just find sort of the French. Oh, this is not ugh, uh, the horrible examples here, but I find sort of the the French uh, illustrations with the color to be uh, just just perfect for the subject matter. So this is just. Um, what is the ultimate point of the rabbi's cat? If, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the conclusion is. I know what the topic is, what the, what the, what the topic is, the topic is basically about ethnicity and religion and how, uh, everyone is sort of, um, everyone wants to kind of find a place where, where they are, uh, the native people. Where, where, where their where their religion is going where their religion and their people are going to have their homelands and uh, some people uh, you know some people will travel across the entirety of the African continent and, and they'll never find a place where where their uh, where, where their their home right they, they will forever be diasporic and, um, and and yet you can find authenticity in that right and and I know, you know, most people on the right wing, they hear that sentiment and they'll immediately suspect it, right? And especially from uh, the, the religious source that, that this comes from. Although I want to emphasize again, not the ethnic source, very definitively not the same ethnic source. Um, but I think it's true. I think that there, there's some deep truth that's being expressed in the rabbi's cat about the reality of being at the same time an authentic community and also one that may be eternally diasporic. And uh, I think it's some wisdom that people will, that, that, that many communities will have to take on board as they're, as they're facing down their own radical dispossession in the 21st century. Uh, wisdom like this will have to be taken on board if we want to uh, survive. As, as people who, who are both faithful to God and also who are handing down uh, a, a tradition that has that has value and meaning. And, uh, you know, the, the rabbi's cat is very reverent about people who who take uh, value and meaning uh, in, in, in their own in their own ethnicity, in their own religions, uh, regardless of whether they're Gentile or Jew or or or. Um, Christian or Muslim, I think. I, I, I very much liked it, and maybe someone has a criticism. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think Kevin Williams should, should read this book, but uh, I, I would recommend it to anyone else. Um, originally, The Rabbi's Cat was written in Fre French. It's a French graphic novel, uh, but it's been translated to English. And there has actually been a very good movie that, it, that literally you can just watch the movie. It, it's the it, even the artistic style of the movie captures the artistic style of the comic um, to an absolute T, and uh, it was really good. I think it hit. It didn't get everything, but it caught the main highlights, in my opinion. Uh, moving right along to a comic that is um, probably one of the most influential of all time. Uh, the Incal by Jarodowski and Mobius. So um, this is a psychedelic French uh, adventure comic uh, that um, it's not showing up because of the gloss very well. It, it takes place in some far-flung uh, future world and it, it talks about the pursuit of this sort of MacGuffin, MacGuffin called the Incal. And uh, this this is a comic that spawned Jarodowski and Mobius, you may recognize. So they were part of a group of uh, French and American authors who were science fiction visionaries who wanted to completely reimagine uh, pulp and science fiction and, and psychedelic movie making from all these different perspectives. Uh, Jarodowski was a, a film director. I think he did Magic Mountain which is a, you know, a, a surrealistic film. And he also famously almost did Dune before it was taken over by David Lynch and ruined. There is even a documentary called Jarodowski's Dune uh, detailing the effort. But, but this, in comic book form, is the magnum effort of Jarodowski and Mobius. And it, it, it portrays this utterly wacky, um, dark world uh, where, you know, where this, this sort of private eye type character 
is trying to find out what he can do with this incredibly powerful object and is being pursued by all of these nefarious forces. And in the process of, of navigating this world, you come into all sorts of crazy things, like these weird suicide cults, these weird mutants, and, and every single panel is like a new strange thing that you, you're, you have to comprehend and take on board. It's almost like Voyage Talk Tourists meets uh, Heavy Metal Magazine, if I could describe it that way. Um, but I don't know. Again, this is, um, insofar as comics go, uh, the NCAL is one of the most influential uh, science fiction works uh, taken, uh, stolen. Uh, the images used here have been stolen by innumerable uh, movies from the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Whenever they want to create some new weird science fiction con uh, concept, uh, a lot of them come from this comic book. So, or this graphic novel, pardon me. All right, am I almost to the end of the graphic novels? I think I am. Um, yeah, almost. I will stop with the last of the graphic novels and the first, I think, of the art books. All right, so, um, let's see. Um, I said at the beginning that uh, I had um, started off the graphic novels really with Neil Gaiman's Sandman and... Uh, uh, that's partially true, uh, but the first the first thing that I ever kind of came across that really captured my imagination about um, comics was uh, Windsor McCoy's Little Nemo in Slumberland. Uh, so strangely enough, um, uh, this is kind of embarrassing to admit it, but uh, when I was a child, I was really into the video game that came out for Nintendo uh, by the same name, Little Nemo in Dreamland or whatever, right? And then one day I was going through a comic shop and I saw that uh, uh, this book was for sale. This book was uh, um, a uh, it was uh, it was apparently a comic book, and uh, Little Nemo in Slumberland was not just um, it was a video game, but it was actually uh, one of the first one of the literal well, I don't know, first there were ones in the 19th century, but this was a very famous comic book that ran in the Chicago Tribune, I think. Uh, in like 1905 up to World War I. And, and these were just um, amazing full panel comics uh, of, of all sorts of like wondrous things that you can see from sort of the Edwardian imagination of America. Uh, think of like the, the John Melius movies, The Journey to the Moon, uh, these, these huge tableaus of people, these wonderful palaces. It's about a, uh, it's obviously self-explanatory, it's about this child, uh, Nemo, who every night in his sleep uh, journeys to Wonderland and has all these wonderful adventures there. And then at, 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 you know, at the end of the panel, he always wakes up the, at the end back in his bed. And if you go through it, it's like, a con some of them are episodic, some of them are like continuous stories. Some of them are like his house, um, his house uh, uh, grows legs and starts walking around. Uh, or, or the whole world turns upside down. Um, some of them feature a continuous story where he's trying to get to this city called Slumberland uh, to meet this princess. And um, uh, yeah, what, what else is there to say about this? Uh, more than anything else, looking back on it as an adult, uh, again, it's like Dinotopia. Uh, what you are immediately struck with, especially from American works from this time, is the amazing amount of optimism that just explodes out of every page. Uh, this this uh, comic, and, and it's it's even more powerful when you see it illustrated uh, in, in panel form, uh, these comics were created by people who were, who had conquered the world and who were planning on redesigning a wonderful utopia, who were, who were planning on creating a whole world of, of virtuous people, of beautiful people, and and of altruistic people, and um, you know the the person Windsor McCoy. I think he was a uh, he was an early progressive. I'm pretty sure he was a progressive because I think I saw some of his uh, political cartoons, Windsor McKay. Um, but more so than that, you're just getting this picture into uh, early 20th century America, sort of like the Bioshock Infinite America, uh, a world of complete optimism. Half of the most wondrous cartoons are just Nemo going around his ordinary life in 1905 America 
and, and you seeing what new what Chicago looked like. What did urban Chicago look like in 1905, right? What did urban Chicago look like in 1905? It was actually a p pretty. I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, this was this was literally. I mean, it was about 10 years after the Great Columbia Exposition with with the White City and the Ferris wheel. But it was very much a city that felt like it was on the rise and it felt that it was the wave of the future. And um, because of that, it, uh, it, it, you know, the optimism is just explodes out of every page. And, and you can't help reading it and capturing some of that optimism every time you, you read through Little Nemo um, as a primary source from that era. Uh, fair warning, uh, there, there are depictions of uh, people of African persuasions who were less than flattering in, in Little Nemo, and that's probably stopped it from being uh, uh, celebrated in, in the modern day, even though I think that the author was himself, by the standards of 1905, a progressive. Um, but, but at any rate, I, I, I highly recommend these. And the, I, I think I literally got these when I was like, what, seven years old? And I still have, I still have the book now. And I converted a, 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 a million times. Um, but I think that is the end of the graphic novels. And I will go on to art books afterwards. All right, so this should be a fairly brief segment. Right now, I'm just going to go quickly through my art books. Uh, I don't really own very many of them, but I have to deal with them independently because they have to go above because most of them are too large. Um, I don't know. I, uh, art books are always very strange because there's nothing really much I can explain. I just have to kind of go through it and show you what I have. Um, I guess there's a few things that might be worth commenting on. Uh, one large book on classic Orthodox and Catholic icons. I forget who gave this to me, but it's... <laughs> oh no, I think I literally have some inserts in there that might have fallen out. I'll have to clip those later. But you know, most of the time, art books, do you read them? No, not really. Uh, they, well, you, you have them for reference. You have them uh, because you might want to flip through them. You have them as coffee table books. Uh, you know, I have uh, graphic novels of the Windsor McKay ones I did previously sitting there because they, they don't fit on the regular shelf. Uh, but, but, you know, you don't really read them. Um, you don't really read them. So uh, I'll have to go through them fairly quickly. Uh, my wife's uh, Tutankhamun book, this is just the, the art that was found in the famous Tomb of King Tut. Um, an Artistic History of Christianity by Owen Shadwick. Again, I know all of these things were probably gifts to me at some stage, but I'm not super aware of what uh, there really is to say about them. Oh, well, this is interesting now. Somehow got mixed in here. Uh, but I have um, two children's books. I, I'll have to reshelve these along with the fiction. Uh, but these are uh, the, two, the two versions of Mother Goose rhymes that I was raised with and that um, I am raising my son with. Uh, he's not quite ready for these books yet, I think, but he will be very, very soon. So I'm gonna keep these uh, well at hand. You know, it's always hard because uh, he's really at the point right now where he likes rhymes and like Dr. Seuss, uh, fairy tales. I mean, he likes singing, singing songs is kind of a good thing for him now, but, but I don't think long elaborate stories, uh, Hansel and Gretel, I think that's, 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 I need to wait a little bit longer for that. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> wow, I have an illustrated history of Flannery O'Connor's life you really realize you gravitate towards some authors when you do these book checks, but I guess I just compulsively have bought anything with Flannery O'Connor's name on it, uh, her expository essays, two copies of her stories, um, and literally the comics she did in college that, uh, you know, 
probably wouldn't uh, uh, have been noticed <laughs> if they were the only thing she had ever produced. Um, two things that I will talk a little bit about. Uh, books on Catholic churches. Now, I don't know about this one. I think this is just a standard. This is art inside Catholic churches. Uh, this one, however, is uh, a book that I really wish people uh, published more. I found it in the used bookstore, uh, read through it, and it's helped me um, understand churches much, much better. So this is like a, um, a sort of uh, an almanac, or, or a, I don't want to say a diagnostic manual, or a manual, or it's a guidebook uh, to the kind of things you'd find in cathedrals and classic churches, uh, their meaning, and how they regionally vary between churches, mostly European churches. And this, this shows you how you can explore your way around a typical church, whatever things called inside of it. So most people go through cathedrals and they just look at random objects and they don't process them. They don't go, okay, well, this is, you know, this is the tabernacle, this is the pulpit, this is the various, this is the chapels, and oh, this is this kind of uh, chapel, this is this kind of, uh, of devotional, and, and all this stuff. And if you, if you have this as you're going through churches in Europe, your, your ability to appreciate them and describe them uh, just grows by leaps and bounds. And so, you know, I, I think that this is just a, a resource, and asset I think people should should be aware of and, and have handy. Um, all right. So, actually, already at the end of the box here, but I'll mention this off, uh, artist in particular. Uh, I'm a big fan of Alfonso Mucha. He is a Czech artist. I believe he lived in Prague. Uh, you'll probably recognize these uh, these pictures. He did these incredibly um, sort of, I would call them Art Nouveau uh, tableaus, usually featuring women with long hair and, and very symmetrical features, uh, very beautiful women. A lot of his art was used in advertisements for things like cigars and, and absence and... Uh, and opera and plays. He also did a variety of popular calendars, and um, his art's just beautiful. Uh, it's, um, you know, uh, give me more examples here. Um, I don't know if I can really discuss uh, Alphonse Mucha as a uh, as a phenomenon outside of his art. I believe he died in World War II. Uh, he was a big Czech nationalist, a Slavic nationalist, so I think he ran afoul of the of the Germans, um, although I'm not, I'm not so aware of the details of his de death. Um, and uh, but he did absolutely phenomenal work uh, uh, while he was alive, and uh, uh, in, in his in his graphic design. So I have uh, I have those. Um, okay, so I'll discuss two books. You know, I have. Uh, one book discussing the history of Italian Renaissance art. That is something. But uh, there is one art book that I probably would be remiss if I didn't discuss in more detail. And that is Umberta Eco's The History of Beauty. Now, this book uh, really got me into art appreciation. When I got this, I think my first year of college, I believe that's when it came out. And I got it as a Christmas present. Now, Umberto Eco. Um, now, he was an artist that I read. Uh, artist. He was an author I read a lot of in high school. Uh, the Name of the Rose. Um, another one that's less well known called Foucault's Pendulum, and then Island of Lost Dreams. I think those are the three that I read of his. You'll notice that I don't really have him uh, in my collection right now, because while I really appreciated those in 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 high school and in early college. I kind of began thinking a little bit less of Echo, Echo as a thinker, uh, and I think it's Echo, right? I, I don't know exactly how to pronounce the anglicized, uh, if you were to literally say this, it would be Echo, right? Um, but uh, uh, I, I, I've kind of come to think less of him as a thinker because he was kind of, he very famously did that how to recognize fascism in like 20 points. And, and half of the points are like things that you would see in any kind of radical ideology or any kind of 
traditional ideology of any variety. So they basically identify everything as fascism in some in some way, in some degree, and so it just becomes like this ridiculous uh, this ridiculous uh, witch hunt. And I know the left was fond of using that uh, that like about two or three years ago. Um, but he was also, uh, you know, he was also a, a very famous medievalist and a very good medievalist. He had a, he had a very extensive understanding of the Middle Ages and, and of Western art, and uh, that's what allowed him to create, uh, you know, things like Name of the Rose. And Name of the, Name of the Rose is kind of um, interesting. Uh, you know, if you watch the movie or read the book. Uh, what you'll see in it is uh, just this utterly squalid depiction of monastic life in the late Middle Ages, uh, to the point where you know, to the point where the monks literally look like these deformed mutants from Warhammer 40k, uh, like in habits. They literally look like they're they're a weird mutant cult of monks, and and you know, I'm not without spoiling it. One of one of the key elements of this is that a certain number of these monks are essentially ex cathar heres heres heretics and uh, these these people just detest the bot they're sort of quasi gnostics and they detest the body and human emotions so much that they're almost they're almost on a quest to destroy all human joy from memory by by selectively destroying certain elements of knowledge in in this scriptorium that's sort of carrying down the ancient wisdom of, of Greek thinkers and classic Western ideas. And, um, you know, I don't know, it's, it's a delightful mystery book, uh, but I, I'm not so sure what the greater message is. And I'm not so sure even by the end of his life if Umberto Eco himself really understood uh, what his ideas were. But one thing I'm kind of internally in debt to him for is this book, which is sort of a, a very broad and encapsulated uh, kind of Jordan Petersonian uh, history of, of Western art uh, throughout the ages, uh, Renaissance to Victorian, uh, so on and so forth. You know, uh, and um, it, it, seeing things in museums it, it doesn't really dawn on you that that art is part of history. It's, it's an element of human communication that's in dialogue with all of the ages that have gone before it, and which is kind of a message in the bottle to all ages that, 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 that succeeded, right? And um, until you read an art history book or look at things in the context of art history, uh, you can't really appreciate individual works or just simply the decoration that exists in a museum. And you, you go through looking at all of these Rubenesque paintings and you go through looking at all of these uh, paintings of crucifixions, and you're wondering, well, why did this picture of a crucifixion uh, get framed and half a dozen other ones that were made, uh, you know, 700 years ago did not uh, get, get, get framed in, or called art or called meaningful? And that question is never answered by museums, but it is answered in the form of art history. And so this book convinced me in, in undergraduate to take a course on art history or several. And I don't know, I was doing engineering back then, but if you have electives, there were few electives that were more edifying than the course on art history. Uh, it, gave me, it gave me a language to understand art and to understand how art was really, the, it, it taught me more history than, than most history classes did. And it certainly taught me more about how art is, is perceived as a political force and how when you're looking at the history of art or when you're looking at a particular piece of art, uh, you're looking at someone's kind of manifest perception of the universe and its conflict with other people's perception of the universe at a very fundamental level. And, um, you know, okay, was Umberto Eco a shitlib? Uh, almost certainly. Uh, did he have kind of a twisted view on politics? Definitely. He was a brilliant medievalist. And I think, I don't know if his opinions really maintained, but his selections in this sort of incredibly dense rundown of Western art, um, I thought were really invaluable. So um, I guess I'll have to do another end of a part here and continue on uh, with either music or poetry. So this should be either the last or the second to last segment I'm doing. 
because I'm coming right to the end of my boxes of books, at least the boxes that I want to share in this video. I have a whole collection of engineering books and technical books that I think are probably not suited for discussion on the internet, and it'll spare you all of the technical jargon and, and bullshit that way. But I'm kind of reaching the, the last two genres. I, I said music, poetry, and I, I left out you know, a, a very large genre, which are my religious books, uh, worship books, uh, the, the sort of Catholic collection. So uh, in, in true fashion, I think I'll start with the, the religious texts, uh, maybe uh, a brief digression on to sort of the heretical stuff that I own. And then, and then work my way on to, to poetry and, and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, poetry and, and music. All right, so to, to get right on to the meat of the subject, uh, the religious books I own. Well, <sighs> Bibles. We have Bibles. I don't really know where to start with this. Um, well, I guess I'll start just discussing the general idea of owning a Bible. In, in my opinion, Bibles are reference books and prayer books, and you own a Bible for two reasons. One is to study it, and the other is to use it in some kind of uh, prayer repetition. Now, um, this is the, the Bible that I've used as reference for, God, 10 years since I returned to the church. It's the Catholic Study Bible. Uh, it's ugly. It looks like a college textbook. It weighs a ton and it's literally has tabs for all of the books. Uh, I don't even know what translation it is. It's the New American translation. Uh, I've used this. I very famously don't particularly like the translation on, on, on the Catholic Bible, but it is sort of like if I want to look something up, it's good. Um, I, I told people that I really like uh, the King James translation, and, and I had an old King James translation Bible a few years back that was re in really poor shape, and I think it got left by the wayside somewhere. So somehow I got two, not one uh, this Christmas, but two uh, King James translation Bibles on top of that. Uh, that I, I, I you know, and I, I'm uh, uh, guys, you know, I understand. The King James Bible, uh, it's Protestant. It's it's not, strictly speaking, an accurate translation of the Bible. It takes many liberties, but it is an absolute wonderful use of the English language. It, it, it is, it is English in its most spiritual. It's modern English, I should say, in its most spiritual form, and it's the English verse of of worship, as it has been spoken over the last three or four hundred years of our civilization and, and the force of that poetry can't be discounted so I, I think really no home should be without you know a king james version of the bible so uh that's the second thing my my, my apologies if i don't uh give give a rundown of the meaning uh, of the of the bible itself uh right as uh, of the most important collection of sacred texts uh, divinely inspired as I believe they are or, or simply uh, partially or entirely historical uh, as maybe a, a non-believer might and uh, I don't know if I can really just give you a rundown about why you should read the Bible but if you're an atheist uh, read the Bible and, and don't read it like those idiot new atheists from 2007 read it don't read it like a reddit editor reads it don't try to, you know, don't do the cinema sins version of the Bible. Uh, if you're an atheist or an agnostic, read the Bible with an eye towards how it would be perceived by your ancestors and by the people who wrote it. Try to view it as a historical document, and but also try to view it as a document, uh, as a key to unlocking meaning and a key to unlocking spirituality. And, and, and see if you cannot read it as much as possible in the eyes of those who, who wrote it and in the eyes of your ancestors who, who received it. I think the Bible says something different in every age. For instance, when I was first starting my uh, return to the church, uh, the Old Testament was almost entirely useless to me. It was all about the letters of Paul. It was all about the Gospels. Uh, but recently, as I've talked about on many live streams, 
I've actually found that in our own declining civilization, suddenly the Old Testament books, like the book of Kings, the book of Samuel, the book of, um, you know, a lot of the prophets, uh, a lot of the stuff like um, um, uh, the, the book of Jonah and all this stuff, uh, this is this is suddenly imbued with more meaning than than I would uh, than, than I would have thought, right? Um, this this is suddenly the verses that have sounded brutal just sound realistic, and, and the God that participates in in politics in a real way, uh, and, and and the God that's interested in the preservation of a people and a lineage and a church and, and a temple. Suddenly that just seems like a God who is actually human, a God that's actually embodied in the world, a God that you might actually want to have in a difficult time and in a civilization in crisis. And, and so that these, these characters that you, you once think are, are sort of removed from you in time suddenly seem like supremely modern figures. I think you know, when we talk, when we in the reactosphere, well, I hate the word reactosphere, but we, when we on the right wing, when we on the distant right, when some of us talk about the expectation of a king or a figure of restoration, I think we're thinking less of Julius Caesar and we're thinking more of King David. Uh, because what people want more than anything else is less somebody who's going to shore up an empire that would otherwise descend into chaos uh, under the pretense of just fighting for order. What we're looking for more is somebody who's going to reestablish a temple who's going to establish a, a, a new Brahmin class and, and to re-educate an entire civilization on how to perceive holiness and how to perceive real meaning and, uh, and, and how to essentially carry forward the necessary duties of a priest caste. And, um, you know, so I, I should say that, you know, when you, when you read the Bible, when you approach the Bible... You're, you're approaching a text that has shown its wisdom to, to so many different generations across such a broad length of time that, that you have to imagine that this text has fractal dimensions to it. Uh, the same sentence read in one millennia is not going to communicate the same sentence read in a different continent in a different millennia. Uh, but it still contains a truth, a singular truth that speaks with one voice across all periods of time. And whose believers, despite the fact that they lived in either India or China or Europe or America, they all came to very, very similar conclusions, one being inspired by this text in radically different time periods. If you approach the Bible with those kind of eyes, I think even as an atheist or even as a non-Christian, you'll get a lot, of, a lot out of it. The other thing to keep in mind, obviously, you know, this is something that, <laughs> you know, Archbishop or Bishop Robert Barron often was like, uh, want to say. He said, remember always that the Bible is a library and not a book. This isn't somebody who, who this isn't a book that speaks. It speaks with one divine voice, but it does not speak with one human voice. It speaks with many human voices and, and one divine will that motivates all of it. And so... And so you can't really expect Genesis to speak to you in the same way that Paul's letter to the Corinthians does. Um, anyway, um, so here, the last but not least, uh, I've got my two Vulgates, uh, my wife's Vulgate New Testament, and um, uh, a gift to me by a friend of the channel, Paul. Uh, you'll know who you are. Uh, yeah, one of the... Uh, one of the very few books in this collection that was actually given to me by an internet friend, but nevertheless, uh, thank you very much. Um, this is uh, uh, the Biblical Sacra. Uh, this is a Vulgate. This is a Latin version of the Bible. Um, I have always aspired to read Latin, and given that a large uh, a large part of having a Bible around is as a reference source, uh, this is the first Vulgate I've ever owned uh, in its completion. So thank you very much. Um, I'll put these up here, along with the rest of the Bibles. Um, one thing, though, uh, I said the other reason to own a Bible is that it's part of a religious practice. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll carry out a few sections here. Um, what oftentimes people do is, um, or, or this is... Uh, 
this is something that is a, is a tradition in Christianity, is that they'll have a book where the biblical excerpts are arranged in ways that you can read them uh, every day as a part of a sequential prayer. So most recently, I picked up um, the Abbey Psalter. This is just the Book of Psalms. Uh, if people know Christian practice, they'll know that the reading of the Psalms, uh, basically biblical poetry from, from, I mean, supposedly from the court of King David, but most likely a, a variety of poem uh, of poetic prayers that were read across the time period of the first temple. And these are amazing poetry. Uh, you'll, you'll recognize them immediately. Uh, they can be sung. They can be read. Uh, they're, they're a huge part of Christian worship. At the Sildings event that we went to, um, a morning prayer, as I'm used to, was uh, chanted psalms. And, um, you know, I've um, a little lapsed on this during my move, but uh, I've taken to reading, uh, 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 trying to read a psalm a night, uh, as part of uh, a, a genuine religious practice. Um, but this is, this is again, this is just psalms. This is not structured in any one given way. Uh, more, uh, these two things. Another way that these are structured are books of the hours. So these are prayers arranged as you might uh, read them inside a, um, a monastery, right? So uh, people are aware that in monasteries, uh, you, you pray five times a day, uh, you know, matins, vespers, uh, nocturne prime, um, all, all of these, uh, these, these various offices. It's not five times, I think it might be actually more like seven or eight, um, but, but these, 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 th this is a book of hours. Every hour has an associated prayer with it. Um, and, and, and so Thomas Merton, who was famously a Trappist monk, uh, has his own book of it, the hours. I know that there are a lot of people who are very skeptical of Thomas Merton. He famously wrote the book Seven Story Mountain about his journey to become a Trappist monk. Uh, I think he died under strange circumstances in Asia somewhere. And I know a lot of people who are big... Some people think he's a saint. Some people are more skeptical of his work, uh, as you have a right to be for someone who is so... He was... I believe he was someone... A character from the 1930s or 40s. So, so really in sort of the transition between older Christianity and more modern one. And I think he, he kind of, I think he had both orthodox and modern elements in his own thinking. Um, but but that's, uh, that's his. And, uh, you know, here is the Magnificat, which is a, uh, uh, an arrangement of Christian prayers uh, that, again, you can pray like the hours. So it's a combination of psalms, and, and common Christian prayer that, that you can use in worship. I imagine there's a lot of these in this box here. Um, well, I come to think of it, I haven't even really... Um, yeah, I mean, here's, here's the... My, my wife is, uh, well, professionally, at least for a little bit, she, she wrote sacred music. So here's a, Catholic, uh, a book of Catholic worship, uh, I believe for Mass. Um, general deliverance prayers given to laity and then uh, another version of the Holy Bible my god I'm kind of collecting these a little bit too much all right and this is an interesting find actually um, so I was at a junk sale in Seattle and so it's interesting because you really realize that if you live in an urban area uh, to live in an urban area in a modern American city is to literally live in the ruins of a great civilization that has gone before you. Uh, for instance, uh, in my time um, at uh, Seattle, I, I, a few years I organized large efforts to uh, lay flowers at the graves of clergy. So we did sort of the, the corporal works of mercy. So it was like visit the sick, um, uh, uh, visit the imprisoned, uh, uh, the homeless, the unclothed, etc., 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 and and one of the other things is bury the dead. That's a corporal act of mercy, a good deed you're supposed to do during Lent. And so what we would do for that was we would lay uh, flowers on the graves of of clergy in this Catholic cemetery. And 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 Seattle is not an old city, right? Seattle Seattle is a fairly new city. It. it 
it didn't exist uh, properly before like the 1880s really i mean i know that there's like prehistory to seattle that goes back before then but but it's you know it was a pretty it was a pretty small city before then right and you go through this catholic cemetery and just in the early 20th century alone when seattle was brand new uh there are just an enormous number of 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 clergy that are buried there uh such that orders have entire plots to themselves of just sisters uh, of of like the carmelite order or or dominicans or 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 um or, or franciscan or franciscan friars in another area and you have to realize that even in a city that did not have a catholic uh background in particular that wasn't particularly old the the amount of christian practice that existed in the past exceeded the amount that was currently being practiced by orders and orders and orders of magnitude and, and so you as christians you're really living in the ruins of that greater civilization and this is one thing that reminds me of this so i picked this up at a junk sale probably in 2015 and this is a uh, a bridal um a, 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 this was given to uh brides on, on their wedding night and it, it is a complete manual for how to conduct religious worship as as a wife inside the family and so it has important religious dates it has the prayers both in latin and in uh in english in vernacular uh it has novenas obviously prayers of the hours for for vespers and in matins and also hymns in common worship and this is sort of this was this was published as something you that would be issued to women uh, so that they could be spiritual leaders under their husband inside Christian households. And, um, you know, just the idea that you'd be, you'd be uh, given, given this uh, inside, you know, this, this one was issued, this was given in 1948, you know, and it has the witnesses in, inside the actual, the witnesses in the name of the bride and groom in the in the actual uh, manual this was distributed by the parish i i believe uh and it's, and it's amazing to think that that was what ma catholic marriages looked like like ordinary catholic marriages not like particularly devout people's marriages but ordinary catholic marriages in in the 1940s so i don't know uh, this is more of a sentimental memory than an actual religious book but uh it has a place nonetheless um okay this is a book that i think all catholics should own um and and certainly um i use this as a reference well not as much as i used to but this used to be something that was referenced a lot when i got into debates about theology and what catholics did and didn't believe this is the catechism of the catholic church this is a list of teachings which are, are things that the Catholic Church teaches and doctrines, which are sort of official teachings that are uh, ex cathedra teachings, unchangeable teachings um, of the Catholic Church. This is published and republished by the Vatican, and this contains the entirety of what Catholics uh, believe and, in fact, have to believe to be properly practicing Catholics under the guise of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Uh, it's a really invaluable resource, I find. Um, it's good to have around and it's also good to sort of dispel common myths about catholicism if someone asserts that catholics believe this or that and it's not in this book uh it, it probably is not the case um it is a very long book and it, not everything in the catechism is necessarily doctrine uh it, it is i think necessary to believe it and to be in good standing but it does not mean that it's necessarily a certain doctrines are absolutely certain and i don't believe everything in the catechism is is doctrine um but but nevertheless you know this is an amazing resource whenever i look at the size of this thing and, and, and i give it to protestants to look at i'm always reminded of that joke where um uh, you know the protestant goes to his pastor and he says okay you know uh father you know what is the absolute minimum number of things that i have to believe in order to be a good protestant Whereas the Catholic goes to his priest and he gets this huge, uh, you know, stack. This is literally it of the things that you have to believe as a Catholic. And the Catholic gets it and he looks and he goes, oh my God, look at all the wonderful things I get to believe as a Catholic. <laughs> Obviously a Protestant joke.
but um, it, there's some truth to it, right? There's a lot of truth to it. Um, you know, I used to own a lot of these, but I don't anymore. Uh, I think I might have given them away or something. They didn't follow me uh, from my from my from across the four or five moves I've done over the last five years. But I used to own a lot of letters uh, of the popes, a lot of uh, papal bulls that were very, very important. And I, I talked about a few of them in a, a video or in some essays I've done. But this is um, this is one that I kept. This is Rerum Novarum by Pope Leo the Thirteenth. Uh, this is from the early twentieth century, and this is uh, basically about the dignity of labor and social justice. This. Uh, letter by Pope Leo the Thirteenth is the basis, uh, the seed of Catholic social justice teaching. This is what the early distributists worked off of when the, when Hiller Belloc and G.K. Chesterton developed their ideas on, on how people could properly found a social movement that would embody the ideas of Christianity uh, while, while holding, uh, holding in tandem uh, ideas of liberty well, well, without erring either on the side of uh, usury-based capitalism or uh, godless materialist uh, Marxism. Uh, this is a great read. It's again, it's like eighty pages, but the pages are like you know large type. Uh, seniors could read them. Uh, you can read this in a in a single sitting. If you have a Catholic book group that reads periodically, even if the book group literally you know reads aloud in the actual sessions, uh, you can easily read this in one sitting. And it will create a lot of conversation about what Catholics are, are directed to believe as part of, of good social behavior um, and, 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 and a social life that brings forward dignity and justice. Um, again, very essential reading. I'm having a hard time reaching the shelf here, but uh, that is what it is. And I guess at the end of this, I have um, two works of theology. I have... St. Thomas Aquinas, an interpretation uh, by, um, well, it's, I guess it's a translation uh, of Thomas Aquinas, uh, partially of Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica, with commentary by Jean Porel Torel, uh, OP, meaning he's a Dominican priest, or I guess a Dominican laity. And, um, you know, we, I, in my Catholic reading group tried to get through this several times and we encountered a lot of problems. Uh, but I figure that if I ever was going to start in on Thomas Aquinas again, it would probably be through this book. So uh, I keep it around. Uh, that's precarious. Oh, oh well. Okay, and then last but not least, uh, the Confessions of St. Augustine. Um, this is my wife's version of the Confessions of St. Augustine, and this book is totally falling apart. Like, you know, it's just coming apart in my hands. I think I bought her a new version for uh, Christmas, but it obviously didn't come along in, in this, in this, uh, um, uh, in this set of boxes, but it will go here nonetheless. Um, you know, as, as you know, can, uh, St. Augustine, an essential author, um, uh, doesn't, I mean, it's good. It's good, and as a Christian, it really hits hard because... I think he gets to the heart of a lot of uh, Christian spiritual struggle. But I, I wouldn't recommend that if you're an atheist or you're an agnostic, don't, I wouldn't recommend um, starting with Augustine. I always, rec I always remember uh, getting uh, excerpts from St. Augustine just thrown at us in an undergraduate philosophy class and everyone kind of balking at it, thinking that this is just pious nonsense. St. Augustine is not pious nonsense. He is, in fact, very deep as a thinker. But I don't think that he really translates well into a non-Christian context. You kind of need to be on board with the concept of original sin at a very fundamental level in order for you to kind of grok uh, what he's laying out in the confessions. And, and an even deeper cut would be his city of God. Um, but, you know, that is what it is. Uh, so, hmm... How am I going to do this? Whatever, whatever, whatever. I guess I have a variety of um, of books for the heresy shelf. I always, I always joke that I keep a heresy shelf that uh, that that it has all the non Christian religious works that, that I have as reference. Um, 
Oh, the first one on the... I'll go through these quickly. Uh, this, I believe, was a work uh, by... Uh, I think it's a French theosophist. Uh, Dictionary of Symbols and Occultism by uh, uh, J.E. Serlot. This is back when I was really into Gnosticism. I think I picked this one up. But, uh, yeah, you know, definitely not Catholic spirituality. A little bit heretical. Um, the Book of Mormon. Um, you know, I got a few versions of these talking to Mormon missionaries. I, I went down to one copy on the move. Um, a book on occultism generally. <laughs> I don't even know why I have this book, but uh, there it is. Uh, straight into the heresy shelf it goes. Um, I don't know why this is in the pile of heresies, uh, but... Um, uh, the, the Pillow Book Guy from Crack Addict to CEO by, by Mike Lindell. I think this is my wife's book. Um, hey, uh, I'm sure this is, this is pious. Uh, it's literally a hologram as a cover. I, I can't imagine anything more tacky. I'm sure he's, he's a very genuine person. Uh, I always remember him uh, coming on in the middle of Tucker Carlson trying to sell me pillows. Uh, you know, but um, I probably shouldn't put him on the heresy shelf, but but whatever. Um, a guide to Freemasonry. Uh, I went to the big Freemasonry temple in Philadelphia, and I asked them for a book that would explain Freemasonry, and this is the best I could get, which explains absolutely nothing, by the way. Uh, but uh, it's it's fun to have anyway. I remember I had a friend who actually had like the interior manual that explains their actual beliefs that are supposedly secret. Um, but I, I was expecting to get that book, but apparently that book was not for sale at the actual Masonic Lodge. So um, not going to happen. Uh, a book about tarot. I don't know. Why do I keep these books around? And then, um, you know, a book of answers. It just, it's a magic eight ball, the book. You just, Pick out a page and um, you, you get an answer to whatever your question is. Um, ah, well, that was quick. And I should say, um, this is actually something I wanted to share with Charlemagne of all people. Uh, I, I used to collect a, uh, several of these books. This is a book of days, right? So people used to own these. Um, back in the day, people used to own almanacs and encyclopedias. People used to have, obviously, all of the knowledge in the household was stored in physical paper. And so they, they would have knowledge organized in a certain way that would be useful. Encyclopedias is one way. Almanacs are another way, where you have like everything you need to know as a law clerk, or everything you need to know as some other profession, right? And, and the Book of Days is uh, what people would use to figure out uh, how to celebrate days. So on each day, one page for every uh, day in the entire year, uh, you get sort of a description about famous people who were born on that day, famous things that happened that day, if the day is associated with a certain flower or a certain poem or a great historical event or a battle that took place on this day. I know that Charlemagne was creating a, a book of days for the online Sildings community to kind of celebrate uh, famous sort of right-wing or non-progressive ideas. Uh, this is what kind of led to things like, I think it was actually inspired by, thing, uh, inspired, uh, by things the academic agent was doing, like Julius Avola Day or Carlisle Day or, or whatnot. Um, but, you know, if you want, I think these things are kind of cool to have around. Because if you if you are if you if you have a vacation day or something, or if you're looking for something to celebrate or something to remember on any given day, you can just flip one of these things open and immediately find <laughs> what's special about this day of the year in particular. Um, you know, so it, it's kind of a reminder uh, too about just how you know it's just kind of a reminder uh, about how people's lives were organized in the past, how. Everything, everything had kind of a rhythm. Everything had kind of a season to it. Uh, days and weeks had rhythm. And that rhythm completely colored the emotions people would be feeling. Uh, people's lives would have patterns to them that would be persisted. And the tradition would carry forward that pattern. 
And, and that's kind of an order that's very, very difficult to imagine in our present day. Everything, every single thing we do in, in the modern world is completely dominated by news media, by politics, and whatever the news media decides politically is the next current thing. You, you can't have a book of days as a modern, uh, ordinary person because any celebration you would have about any given day that was permanent enough to put into paper would distract necessarily from whatever hysteria the modern media is trying to cook up <laughs> to get you interested or, or moving in one direction. Um, really, the mark of an independent thinker is to have a certain consistency in life is to have a certain uh, pattern and rhythm that is independent from what external forces are trying to drag you towards, independent from what uh, other people are trying to... Every, everything that we experience in the modern world is stimulus, response, stimulus, response. Whereas uh, people who, who owned and used book of days, books of days, uh, their lives were dictated by the patterns of the seasons, by, by the holy days of obligation, uh, by history itself, by, by a great beauty that was recognized uh, by, by their parents and grandparents before them. Uh, nobody could manipulate that. No one could hack that. Because in order to sort of enter into that cycle and enter into that pattern... Uh, whatever was considered to be true, good, or beautiful would have to sort of be above the petty politics of the moment. And in modern people's lives, what do they have that is really above the petty politics of the moment? Well, I, I apologize if that last shelf was a little bit uh, dry, obviously. Nothing I can say can, can revivify books about Catholic prayer or the Bible uh, I hope that doesn't indicate that I'm not passionate about those topics, but I, I feel very incapable of adding anything. Uh, but going straight on from that, I think a, a related genre that's not too dissimilar is poetry. And, and I have a big box of poetry here and, and probably a lot to say about it. Um, I'll tackle it in no particular order, I guess. Or maybe I'll start with one in particular. Um, and this is the poem I talk about the most in my channel. I talk about it all the time. Uh, Dante's The Divine Comedy. Uh, you knew it was coming, guys, right? Uh, I, I've talked about Dante's The Divine Comedy so much. I don't really want to take up more time talking about it now. Um, it's just something you have to read in order to understand how the medieval mind worked, how the pre-modern mind worked. And even to sort of understand what pre, uh, pre-Enlightenment pre politics looked like and pre-Machiavellian politics looked like. Um, I'm, I'm kind of reminded of the fact. I mean, first of all, you know, Dante wrote in Divine Comedy a spiritual book. He also wrote a, 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 a religious book and, and a vision of how he believed spirituality should evolve. A very unironic view of the medieval world, a very unironic view of medieval Catholicism, but a lot of subtlety there as well. It is also undeniably a political book and contains within it a political worldview. And, and if this wasn't enough for you in the Divine Comedy, Dante goes on to write about politics in the book De, Monar uh, De Monarchia, which, you know, if you... If Fans of James Burnham are aware that James Burnham spends the first like chapter or two just tearing Dante apart for his naive impression of politics, and 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 deciding that no, actually it was the uh, Tuscan that came after Dante Alighieri, um, Niccolo Machiavelli, who was really the the master of understanding how politics actually works, and um, you know uh, Burnham paints Dante as a complete sentimentalist that is ensconced with this romantic notion of how Christendom should, Christendom should be arranged. He's so ensconced with that idealistic vision that he misses the forest for the trees. Of all the things that James Burnham talks about, that is something that I have to take issue with. Because I think that you can't really do politics in a sincere way without having inspired and, and, and you know... <laughs> 
quite sincere, a quite unironic image of a re religious idea. I don't think you can do on teleological politics. I think that you know we can we and we ac academics can discuss politics in a non teleological way, as Machiavelli did and as Hobbes might have done, right? But you can't do politics in a non teleological way. Uh, you can't you can't live politics in a non teleological way. You can't do governance in a non teleological way. You can't wield power in a non teleological way. You cannot create a new priest caste or a new Brahmin caste without a sincere, unironic view on how the world should be, on how the kingdom of God should actually be instantiated in whatever flawed way on earth. And Dante Alighieri, more than anyone else I can think of off the top of my head, attempts to bridge the divine vision of the Middle Ages, the vision of heaven and hell, um, with how politics should actually uh, be lived in, in the real world and how that intersects with history. Um, that's really what you're getting a vision of when, when, when you know, I mean, it's a, and it's a crazy story too. I mean, it, it, when, when you think about just the sweep of the narrative, it's Dante wandering through a forest and then getting dragged down to this incredibly gothic hell uh, before he has a harrowing journey up through purgatory. And then at the end... At, at, at sort of he comes to the boundary of heaven right he he's able to see paradise he's able to walk around heaven and see where the saints are but he can't view into deep heaven he can't view past the virgin mary the virgin mary is the last mortal that you can see before you hit the beatific vision sort of the event horizon of god himself um and and uh, so he goes through the entirety of, of the uh, of the spiritual landscape, and and in that there's a vision of history, there's a vision of politics, and it's all laid out in detail, and in beautiful language, even across multiple translations. I mean, here I have two of them, right? I think I, I can't remember which one I read. Well, I, oh, okay, it's obvious which one I read, right? Because this is the one that that this is this is the reference version, but these are two different translations. So this is the Kirkpatrick translation uh, that I read most recently. And I think this is the one that has the illustrations by Gustav Dory that are very famous. You know, Gustav Dory is the famous, um, you know, the famous uh, woodcut uh, um, carver who, who did things like Dante, obviously, in Paradise Lost. And I think he did Arabia Nights as well. And, and very famously, Samuel Taylor Coolridge's uh, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. You know, one of the great um, romantic poems of the 19th century. Um, okay, wow, there's a lot here. <laughs> um, I'm going to go quickly. I have uh, Sir Gwain and the Green Knight. This is, again, one of the books I read with my wife when we were um, dating. Uh, recently turned into a movie. It wasn't as bad as it could have been, uh, but there's no beating the original um, medieval poem. Uh, this is, I think this is, if this isn't, I don't know if this is older than The Death of King Arthur, uh, the, the, Morta, the Morta of Arthur uh, by Mallory. I believe it's by Mallory. Uh, but this is certainly, if it's, if it's not the oldest, it's the second oldest tale of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. An absolutely beautiful and haunting tale of a knight that has to pursue this, this ghost, this green knight. Who, 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 who he has to submit himself to and, and, and uh, have the knight um, cut his head off. Um, it's an essential uh, view of the medieval ages and the medieval understanding of chivalry. And, um, you know, good, good book to have um, and good book to put next to Dante. <laughs> Although it's not staying next to Dante. Um, Another good book to kind of ship with Dante is Divine Comedy. A lot of, another book that I think is very different, but is oftentimes mentioned in the same breath as Dante's Divine Comedy is, um, you guessed it, uh, John Milton's Paradise Lost. Now, unlike uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, which is famously written not in Latin, but in uh, Tuscan Italian, uh, John Milton's Paradise Lost is written in English, you know, so you're not reading a translation of this. And this is a snapshot, in, like John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, this is a snapshot into uh, English Protestant Christianity of, of the era of Oliver Cromwell, of, of sort of Puritan 
uh, Protestant Christianity. Um, John Milton, I believe, was a Puritan himself, and he sets aside to to write an extension of Genesis that will tell the story of um, of Satan's fall from grace and his infiltration into the Garden of Eden and the corruption of Adam and Eve. Now, um, very famously, um, what can you say about this book? Um, I don't know. I obviously I read this in high school where I was, you know, I was going into my atheist phase at that time. And, uh, you know, I had the same reaction to it that most high schoolers did, is that what most people remember from John Milton's uh, Paradise Lost is that, you know, unlike Dante, who, who envisions, uh, to, to Dante, God and Satan are kind of these impenetrable boundaries, right? Satan is a black hole, uh, God is sort of a, a, a light barrier to a greater universe. And he can't really understand Satan or God as characters simply as endpoints where it's impossible to move beyond. But, you know, fast forward, what is it? This was, Dante was written in 1300, almost exactly on 1300. I think it's literally written on the turn of the century at 1300. Well, I mean, fast forward 300 years, 350 years, and you get to John Milton's Paradise Lost, and suddenly Satan and God, um, they're like comic book characters. They're like pagan gods. I mean, they're having a war in heaven. And people very famously remember this because Satan is, uh, is you know, like in The Master and Margareta, or like in Goethe's Faust, which is, again, you know, another 150 years after paradise lost he's a very romantic character he's a he's a trickster i mean you uh you you can sympathize with him it, it starts from his point of view when he's he's organizing the fallen angels after they've fallen from grace and, and you're looking back up to heaven and you get the famous line it is better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven and um and uh and it, and it details like his, his his incessant, insane battle to retake heaven, to corrupt what God has created, and and in turn, God the Father, you know, maybe this is me misremembering it from my read it as an edgy teenager. He kind of seems like this um, Louis the the Fourteenth kind of Sun King character, you know, albeit a perfect one, but very much sort of a king on a throne and, and less uh, an eternal entity that's beyond human comprehension. And, and as such, it's very, very hard not to see, you know, Satan's act of rebellion as kind of a revolutionary struggle. And this is, you know, this is where you get sort of the famous, obviously this was Samuel Johnson would have been from the opposite perspective of Milton, but he, he, I think he famously pointed out that Milton's revolutionary ideology, you know, his, his sort of republicanism of the Cromwellian era may have been, um, may have been uh, at odds with his, uh, his Puritan Christianity uh, because Samuel Johnson says that, you know, uh, Satan was the first Whig. Satan was the first enemy of the crown. And... Um, you know, I, I might, I might, I feel like I'm. Someone's going to own me, and someone's going to tell me that uh, John Milton was actually uh, a detractor of Cromwell. I'm, I'm pretty sure though he was a Puritan, right? Like I'm, I'm not wrong in thinking that. Um, you know, I probably should reread this again. Um, but this is, you know, again, John Milton. This is a masterpiece of the English language. Uh, you know, a, a seminal work um, that 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 gets you from the era of Shakespeare to the era of. Uh, of Jonathan Swift and, and Samuel Johnson. And, um, you know, obviously it has all these delightful quotes. And, and most of the images we have of uh, Satan waging this, you know, this very physical war of the fallen angels against the father with like literal cannons and, and like demonic engines. Uh, part of this almost feels very warhammery. And, and sure enough, you know, most of the image, most of the gothic image that's taken from, from grim, dark futures like Warhammer is, is lifted straight from uh, the sort of uh, 17th and 18th century uh, um, uh, Puritan view of heaven and hell, literally having a battle between the two of them. And, uh, you know, Milton captures this perfectly in English prose. And, you know, it reads perfectly well. You know, you don't need a translation. It's not like Beowulf or, or even Shakespeare. It's, it's much more modern even than that. And it feels that way. Okay, um... 
I'll do a digression. Um, this is a book, one of the first poems I was ever uh, given as a child. It is um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's Hiawatha. It's a story about an Iroquois prince uh, in poem form and, and his journey to become a man. And it's an absolute beautiful poem. I have the illustrated version here. Um, something that, you know, obviously I'm going to try hard to hand down to uh, my, my son when he's, <laughs> he's kind of in a book destroying phase right now. So I'm, I'm feeling a little bit cautious, uh, you know, handing some of these things over before it's the proper time. But, you know, that is what it is. Um, here is uh, a contemporary uh, poet, uh, an American poet that people oftentimes goes by the wayside. Um, Edgar Lee Masters, the Spoon River Anthology. Now, if you've ever been through America and go through graveyards as I like to do, uh, uh, you'll never forget this book because what, what Edgar Lee Masters does in this is he pretends, or maybe he actually did this to uh, an older American town. I believe he wrote in the early 20th century, uh, 1910s, I think. There's recordings of him, and the recordings are fairly good, which leads me to believe that he was early 20th century and not 19th century. Um, and um, he uh, he goes through... Um, he goes through uh, a graveyard, and for every tombstone, he writes a very, very short story, or a very, very short poem uh, about that person's life, told from the perspective of that person. So if this person had to tell a poem about the wisdom that was contained in their entire life in like two stanzas, what would the ghost of that person tell, tell the author, tell the poet? And so what this, this book, this anthology represents is sort of the voices of the dead coming back to life and telling the living the great tragedies of their life, the great triumphs, the great mysteries. What were, what were the, if you were forced to communicate the meaning of your life in a short poem, in a very short piece of language, from the dead to the living, what would you say and what would you expect to hear from each of the tombstones that you visit uh, as you're traveling through an older American town. Once you read this, once you experience it, um, this anthology is going to sit with you uh, whenever you go to an older area. So, I don't know. I think that, you know, for Americans in particular, who, who have a tendency to, tendency to become very radically deracinated and separated from their own cultural heritage, I don't think you can go wrong with the Spoon River anthology. It's it's not it's it's just, it's just essential. All right, well, um, so um, this is a collection of poems that was given to me uh, by a friend. Uh, I'm not gonna obviously I can't use names uh, by a friend at the Sildings event. Uh, now I always appreciate this, and I, I've read a few of them. Uh, well, really on the plane ride back, but you know this is a brand new book. Uh, so, uh, given how much my uh, bookcase has uh, already, um, you know, a lot of stuff on it that I haven't read, uh, please be forgiving. But he gave me a book uh, of Robert Burns' poems, and um, I guess this also contains Thomas Carlyle's poems as well. Uh, Carlyle's essay. Okay, so it's it's Thomas's Carlyle's essay on 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 Robert Burns. So Robert Burns is the great poet of um, Scotland. Uh, people might remember on this channel. I I do Burns Night celebrations periodically, um, where we do readings of Robert Burns poems. A lot of his poems were turned into folk songs. Uh, very famously, the most famous one is "Auld Lang Syne." Uh, the Parting Glass is also a very famous one. But you'll recognize it if you. Um, if you listen to Celtic uh, folk tales or, or folk folk songs, you'll recognize a lot of of Robert um, Burns's libretto at, at put to music, and and this is a, a selection of his poems. And um, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know who you are. I, I feel um, more comfortable using Paul's name, who gave me the Vulgate, because. Uh, he uses that name <laughs> in the internet, and I know that he's not going to be uh, bashful about it. So, um, 
you know, I uh, I appreciate uh, I I appreciate I've always wanted to have sort of a PO box so people who wanted to actually write me physical letters could could write in and I could read them on stream or whatever because I really do like feeling like I'm actually building friendships when when I do this vlogging stuff and um, you know I think it's important to build to build friendships and to have in real life connections I I felt like that Sildings event was just absolutely phenomenal. Um, but given that I have to, uh, I have to keep on going with this stuff. I'll, I'll do two in quick succession. Um, one of them, uh, Beowulf. This is the translation by Sam S. Henley. I read this in college. Um, this is, of course, J.R.L. Tolkien's Great Love. Um, I actually, you know, this is so funny. Is you may notice that I have several books by J.R.L. Tolkien. I do not actually own the Lord of the Rings. I had like a really crap version of it. And I know that my wife owns a hardback version of Lord of the Rings in Canada. And we've never been able to get it down. So, you know, why, why rebuy a book that you know you own anyway, right? So, um, you know, so you, you will notice that I don't have Tolkien's uh, Hobbit or Lord of the Rings. And moreover, you know, I, I don't have the Silmarion and Children of Hurin, who, which are the books I actually like more. But Tolkien's great, uh, you know, his, his great study, his great focus on this life was reinterpretations of Beowulf. Which I think you know Tolkien correctly imagines is is um, is essentially a Christianization of ancient pagan Anglo-Saxon wisdom. Beowulf obviously tells us tells the story uh, of uh, of a Danish uh, king, um, or I, I think he's Danish, uh, but you know that's where the Anglo-Saxons originally came from before they migrated to England, or was then called Britain. And, and he, this, this ancient king does battles with a series of demons, most famously Grendel, and then later a, a dragon that ends up uh, killing him. And, uh, and, and, and Tolkien's great idea was that the lament of Beowulf at the end is sort of the edifying catharsis by which the ancient, uh, or not the ancient, I guess the, 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 the Anglo-Saxons of late antiquity, uh, they sought to sort of proactively Christianize and in commune with their ancient pagan ancestors while still drawing it into a broader Christian story. And, and that was Tolkien's idea on Beowulf. It, it's still a wonderful poem. Obviously, um, you know, if you read this, this is old English. Uh, you have to read a translation, uh, even though it is quote unquote English. Old English reads almost more like Dutch or something than, than actual modern English. Uh, unlike even Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Another book that I think, you know, my... I gave it to my wife and it's in Canada. <laughs> so otherwise it would be on the shelf, Canterbury Tales. Another book would be The Decameron. Um, another uh, a medieval poetry. You know, I own the book. I uh, read it a really long time ago. Um, and, it's, and it's in some box that's not here right now. Uh, you, you realize the gaps on your shelf uh, when, you, when you put the books away. Um, uh, but unlike The Canterbury Tales, which is written in Middle English, which you can kind of, you can kind of sort of read it, if if your if your mind's in that mode again, and um, and uh, and you uh, uh, you can't read old English, you, you have to actually translate it. Um, uh, you know, actually, speaking of the Canterbury Tales, I remember most recently um, using the introduction as a Canterbury Tales uh, as uh, as an indication about what gender meant before modern English. Like, what did gender mean? before the left took it to control over it in, in the early 20th century and it became a, a shibboleth for, for, for people to, to use against uh, crime thinkers. Well, you can encounter the word gender in the context of the introduction to the Canterbury Tales when Chaucer talks about the engendering of the flowers, which means the bringing forth. Gender obviously coming from Genesis to create, uh, gender meaning to procreate or to create uh, as the flowers do, uh, the new generation of them. Uh, um, I think it's like engender wrote in vine or something is the thing he says. Well, whatever. But the next book on um, the docket is Aesop's, I know this is technically folklore, but it's in my poetry section for some reason. Aesop's Fables. Um, guys, uh, this is a key element of cultural literacy as Westerners. Uh, these are fables written by Aesop, who was probably a Greek slave in Flavian Rome, I think. And um, he wrote a series of fables that encapsulated uh, 
uh, Greek folklore and uh, and Greek wisdom. And, and if you think, you know, you think that uh, obviously, you, you I think that like the sour grape story about the fox and the grapes is is one of them. Uh, the, the crow and, and the picture of the crow and the cheese. Uh, the lion who needs uh, the the lion and the mouse is another one, um, and uh, the story of the war horse and and it, these stories they're very simple but there's a lot of sophisticated wisdom in them. The one that I think of the most of is uh, the story of the frogs who wanted a king. Uh, king, the story of old King Long and the frogs call out for a king to Zeus, and Zeus gives them a log which does nothing like this log is your king because Zeus is irritated. Right. And, uh, the, uh, the frogs think that this is an insult to them. And so they ask, uh, Zeus for a powerful king. And so Zeus puts over them a stork, which then devours all the frogs. And the last frog to be devoured says, let it be known. We should always leave well enough alone. And uh, this was imagistically, uh, Robert Graves, who wrote I, Claudius, used the parable of the frogs who wanted a king in his discussion about how the Republic was displanted by the Empire and how um, you know they, they wanted a king because people were too weak and now they were getting these kings like Caligula and Nero who were terrible. And there's a lot of truth to that. I, however, uh, I take the opposite view that the Emperor and the Empire was necessary and the dissolution of the Republic was necessary which seems to be the majority of opinion of, of all scholars, uh, both, both, both ancient and modern, about, about that period of time. Uh, but, but every time, you know, what always stops me from becoming just a flat-out monarchist, uh, more, than, more than any kind of bullshit about constitutionalism or a mo liberty, is, is that ancient parody spoken by Aesop about the frogs who wanted a king. And they were totally unprepared uh, for for what was eventually given to them in the form of tyranny. You know, you could always make things worse. You can always make things worse with meddling. I, I think that the ultimate lesson being taught is a caution about changing things that are working, and less so a caution about monarchy, as as Graves imagined it, Nye Claudius. But still, point taken. <laughs> um, point taken. I'll continue on. Um, I have uh, oh, uh, uh, the 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 magic of Lewis Carroll. So these are um, these are actually more games than they are poems. But this is a bunch of riddles that are contained in in Lewis Carroll's things like Alice in Wonderland. And this author, John Fisher, um, creates a bunch of tricks to de demonstrate kind of a lot of a lot of sort of Lewis Carrollian. Uh, Car Carolian paradoxes that was fun of kind of harping on in Alice in Wonderland. So that's fun. Okay, well, I mentioned this author before. I'll mention him again here. We talked about him in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. It's no other than Blake. Um, God, I wish I had a better version of this. I have these pamphlets of uh, these horrible paperback pamphlets of some of his... Um, his, uh, his, his most famous collections of poems, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, Songs of Experience, and Songs of Innocence. And uh, this is where you'll find things like, um, you know, and you see, I guess the reason why I got these things is that they contain the original wood, the, the original uh, pamphlets that Blake wrote these poems on. Uh, Blake, Blake was a, caligula, a caligraf, calligrapher and an illustrator very famously, he did the famous red dragon painting that was used in the, the Hannibal Lecter thing. And uh, he, he wrote his poems down, which are very simple and very easy to memorize. And, and he would write, he would draw illustrations of them with the poems, which, which is still kept to this day. And uh, the illustrations really add to the, the poem and in experiencing it in its original form. And, and so, you know, I got these things. Um, you know, a question arises, and I guess this brings me to the next set of poetry books that I have here. Um, a question arises uh, very often is how you should consume poetry, 
how you should consume poetry, given that it's um, it's very difficult uh, to, uh, to, for instance, Blake, right? Like these little stanzas of poems, like Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, it's like four stanzas. Uh, no one's going to pull a book off the shelf and then start reading Blake poems willy-nilly. That's just not how you consume poetry. Poetry has to be read and poetry has to be recited in order to be appreciated. I feel, feel very strongly about this. And so I'm going to list here uh, the two, like this is 90% of my poetry consumption comes in these two forms. Um, I have sort of the top 500 poems um, and I have uh, poetry on record. Um, so the top 500 poems is just a collection of famous Western poems uh, compiled by some educator. Um, I know a lot of people are very, very, very cautious about uh, consuming best of. It feels like you're a poser owning something like this. You're absolutely not. Volumes like this are absolutely essential for people who want to consume poetry or become accustomed with it because it's only by interacting. So what, what happens is oftentimes what will happen is you hear about a poet and you're not familiar with him. Uh, so you just want to get a smattering of what this person was like. So you flip open this book and you read like his three most famous poems. And then immediately you have an introduction to that. You have a foot in the door. And have you experienced it in, in the most you know edifying way? Absolutely not. You probably haven't even understood the poem. But the book's there for you, and it's a learning tool. And it's a learning tool that I found you know, it's very, very, it's, it's better than having like, you know, no one, no one ever reads like volumes of poetry from one author. Like the, those ones from Blake, like I never opened those books, <laughs> right? Uh, they, they exist because, you know, I like the woodcuts or whatever they were, the illustrations. Uh, another way, an even better way to experience poetry um, is poetry on record. Now, this is my personally my favorite. Uh, collection. This is Poetry on Record from 1888 to 2006. And this has like the first like Edison phonograph recordings of, of, of Victorian poets. You can literally hear the very, very muffled words of Tennyson uh, and the very, very muffled words of, 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 of ancient, uh, you know, the, the Alfred Lord Tennyson and Walt Whitman. I think the first one that comes through very clearly is William Butler Yeats. And then, of course, you have um, modern 20th century poems. Now, I mean, modern 20th century poems, I mean, this is the thing. Like, you think, like, okay, well, you know, after 1960, it was all downhill. It's, it's funny, right? I mean, it's funny because people are writing really good poetry, like, all throughout the 70s. Uh, is it a little bit progressive? Is it a little bit degenerate? Uh, certainly, the, you can see the prefiguration of that. Uh, but, but but poetry doesn't really start dropping off until like the 80s and 90s. And I, I know uh, Curtis Yarvin famously mocked this um, this cred credentialism treadmill that had completely consumed uh, poetry. And that's because poetry had run out of consumers and was, was basically just comprised or constituted, the whole field of poetry was constituted of poets reading each other's poems back to each other, trying to get status and prestige. And, um, or trying to seem like you're the kind of person who reads poetry. This is the antidote to that. If you buy this audio recording, these CDs, you stick them in your car and on long car rides at night, don't listen to music, certainly don't listen to podcasts. Just listen to poets reading their own poems and their own words and let that wash over you for like 40 minutes. And that will be an experience you remember. Or, or just lay in your bed at night and listen to these poems as a podcast and, and think about them. And they're, they're read by their original authors. And, um, you know, so, so the, the meter is exactly how they would have it. Um, you know, I am a... I'll mention this other author. My, one of my favorite poets is William Butler Yeats. Um, you know, uh, the the uh, the Second Coming, the uh, sailing to Byzantium, uh, sailing to the lake and Isle, uh, the lake and Isle Innistreed, um, 
all of these uh, great poems. And uh, he was um, he, he's on that recording. And uh, you know, as I as I read something like um, the the second coming, uh, turning and turning in the widening gy- widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. Uh, and the way I read it is just kind of as plain verse, a very staid way. Um, Yeats reads it in this sing-songy way and swingy verse, and he says, "The thing I hate the most is 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 people who who read my poetry like it's prose." <laughs> and when he says that, you're kind of like, "That's me, right?" And he's like, "I did. I had a damn lot of work to get that poem into verse, and it's." And it's hard to hear me, people laboring to get it out of verse. <laughs> so it's it's funny to see that you know how these poets uh, read their own poems is is nothing like how how we read them in the contemporary world. Um, okay, I'll, I'll mention. Um, okay, this is a weird one. Uh, Joyce Kilmer's collection of Catholic poets. I've thumbed through this. Um, of all the poetry collections I've owned, this is probably the one I've I've toyed with the least because I I don't know. I mean, organizing my poets by religious affiliation has never been my my thing, and um, yeah, I mean, it's good to have. I guess it's good to have a collection of Catholic poem poets, uh, you know, right in there with the rest of them. But it's not something that. Uh, I find very useful as a tool. Um, here, I guess I also have uh, the complete uh, poems of Robert Burns. Of course, I use this for Burns Night. Uh, I did last time. It's a good book to have. Um, I guess I'll store it up here for the time being, since I'm running out of space. And uh, last but not least, I'm going to talk about two um, two books that I think are quite funny and uh, are um, are kind of gems, jewels among the rough. And that is uh, Shel, Silver, Shel Silverstein's Where the Sidewalk Ends. I grew up with these poems. I think this is a very American phenomenon, but I think most American kids recognize this. Again, I, I plan to share this with my child when he's a bit older. And then this one. Uh, Certainly, um, this is by a poet, not really poetry, uh, but this is a, a, a book that's very near and dear to my heart as, uh, as a Christian and as a political cynic, The Devil's Dictionary. Um, and uh, this is an incredibly politically incorrect book. It's, it's a bunch of cynical definitions written by Ambrose Bierce at the turn of the century. And his, his idea is like, well, people think that this is what this word means, but it actually means this, uh, if you're cynical about how politics works. So his definition of alliance is uh, um, uh, an, uh, an agreement among thieves who have their hands inserted so deeply in each other's pockets that their remaining hands can independently be used to plunder a third. Uh, and, and it's little inversions like that, like the definition of queen. And this is, I think, one of the key. I could do an entire video on this definition. His definition of queen is uh, is uh, a person who rule uh, a person who rules a kingdom when there is a king, and a person okay a person by whom uh, a country is ruled when there is a king, and a person through whom the country is ruled when there isn't a king. I mean, that's kind of clever, right? Because it implies that the queen has more power when she is the king's wife than when she is an independent sovereign herself. And I feel like in that one definition is almost all wisdom of monarchy itself. How could somebody have more power when they're in a subservient role than when they are in the primary one based on uh, the kind of thing that they actually are? And, you know, obviously there's un-PC um, definitions. Uh, look at the definition of African, which contains... Um, it, well, I'll tell you the definition. Uh, it's when a gamer... Uh, the definition of an African is a gamer word who votes for me. Um, so, you know, this would get you canceled immediately if you read it out on, on stream. So uh, that... I'll put it up here again. 
Uh, that, that's a great. I, I could do an entire live stream just on the, the stuff from a Devil's Dictionary. But that uh, that comprises the that that constitutes that has comprised the remainder of my poetry, and I will finish with my last section about odds and ends, and uh, the remaining books that I have to shelf. So, welcome to the final section of this very, very long video uh, detailing all the books that are currently in my bookshelf. Uh, this last section is just odds and ends, things that didn't quite fit into the other genres of books I've already gone over. Uh, obviously, I've said several times, I have a huge collection of technical books that I'm sparing my uh, listeners or watchers from me having to explain, uh, probably for the better. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, this is really only the tip of the iceberg, but, but there are a few selections that I felt I might have something interesting to say and uh, that, um, that I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, I don't know, I wanted to talk more about just to, you know, to kind of complete the entire vision of the video, if there even is one here. Um, just starting with, I think these are mostly technical books, but uh, I, I wanted to start by one uh, book. Uh, this is the least favorite book I've ever owned, and I, I keep it around just to remember how much I hate it. And this is C Cube Chic, uh, or as I like to call it, Cope, the Manual. So um, this is a book, I, I got this book when I worked in a cubicle when I was first an engineer. And, you know, I didn't particularly like my job and I was stuck in a cubicle for most of the day. And I was like, man, what if I could make my cubicle really like fun? And so I bought this book and, it, and it, all it is is a number of incredibly impractical ideas to make your cubicle look cool and also entirely counterproductive. And, 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 and I think it's, just in, it, it's the worst idea ever. If you work in a cubicle, uh, just come to peace with the fact that you work in a cubicle and enjoy the fact that its sparseness allows you to focus on your work. The idea that you want to just cover your cubicle with toys and distractions, uh, it's, it's cope, it's simultaneously lying about what your job actually entails. Uh, ultimately, you're not going to fool yourself. And in the meantime, you're creating something that makes you look incredibly unprofessional, distracts you, and probably will end up depressing you more than just having a blank cubicle ever will. Uh, it's always good that when you're in a space to, to sort of make sure that even if you want to decorate it and beautify it, make sure that the decoration doesn't fundamentally lie about what you're actually doing there. You know, don't try to make, um, don't try to make uh, a funeral home uh, in, into like a fiesta party area. And don't try to don't try to make sad spaces happy by sprucing them up, and don't try to make workspaces somehow into toy stores. And so I I keep this book just to remind myself uh, what a bad book is because this book is terrible. I've owned it for like ten or twelve, well, more like actually more like eight. I don't think I've owned it for that long, uh, but but I keep it around anyway. Um, a book actually that was surprisingly good. Um, I found this like literally on the street. <laughs> I don't know who owned it. It's called the Foxfire book. And uh, I found this on the streets of Berkeley. And uh, it's, it's kind of cool. I, I don't know it's, who it's written by. It just says the Foxfire book. Um, it doesn't have an author on it. It's edited with the introduction by somebody. And all it is 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 a series of how-to manuals on on how you could live in a in the country, from from like building your own house to to building uh, fires to slaughtering animals, uh, recipes for slaughtered animals, uh, you know plants you can eat from the wild, uh, snake lore, how to treat snake bites, how to make moonshine. Um, this is a great book, and it was literally just like on the streets <laughs> so, um i keep this one around just just because um 
of the books remaining, uh, really there's only two categories remaining. Uh, one is mathematics and the other is uh, music. Uh, obviously, I own a ton of books on mathematics, but I, I have a few select ones that you might, uh, that I think lay people might be interested in. I'll, I'll do the first uh, two ones, not for lay people. Um, the, the two mathematics books that if you're, if you're a mathematics person who's going into mathematics, um, I, I've always had two books that I felt were the best. Uh, the first one for theoretical mathematics is Krasig's Introduction to Functional Analysis with Application. And for applied mathematics, it's Introduction to Applied Mathematics by Gilbert Strang. Gilbert Strang from MIT. He's, he's a really great lecturer, too. Uh, thanks to MIT OpenCourseWare, if you want to learn linear algebra from, from one of the, the, the primary teachers of linear algebra, um, text writers in applied mathematics, uh, you, can, you can go see Gilbert Strang teach linear algebra. And that's fun. But okay, well, those are the two technical books from a mathematics shelf, but I have a variety of others here. Because um, I don't think mathematics is simply for the layperson. Uh, there are a number of mathematics books that I think you know everyone uh, or you know hobbyists might want to read. Uh, the first one is the Enjoyment of Mathematics. Um, this is by whew, Rodmacher and Topolitz. I think I read this in like high school, but this gives you like a broad overview of of kind of complicated mathematical problems, interesting mathematical fields of endeavor. Uh, areas where amateurs have been able to make contributions and just generally neat things inside the field of mathematics that you might be able to appreciate as someone who does math and uh, in their, and maybe even in their spare time and, and wants to understand the beauty of mathematics itself. So that, that's a fun one, right? All right, but you know maybe um, Maybe you're really on the more practical side. Go to the opposite one, opposite book on mathematics that I read in high school. How to Lie with Statistics. I don't know. And so I feel kind of controversial about this one. Um, now, How to Lie with Statistics, this is a very famous book. Uh, it's by Daryl Huff. Um, maybe in a previous age, this would, th this would be less common knowledge. But this brings you through sort of the basic uses of statistical chicanery uh, that you can use to confuse people and, um, and imply things come from numbers that, that don't. Uh, you know, you have things like confusing mean and median, uh, you know, confusing scales and distance and uh, changing units, uh, changing the definitions uh, of words and, and, and the categories you measure to get a different result. Overfit. I mean, if it, this is from a modern audience, I think more would be said about overfitting, or about p hacking, or about what I call artism. Uh, that's basically relying on r squared values to imply causation. Um, and then um, another one would be, I mean, uh, more variation within than between might be another <laughs> statistical use of bullshit. Um, you know, so I don't know. Uh, more and more, I've kind of grown to be suspicious of, of learning kind of formal fallacies or, or bullshit techniques in, in a list. It's good to know of them, but the only way that you really understand why they're problems and why they're mistakes in thinking is to encounter them either in your own thought when you make a mistake or to encounter that bullshit when it's used against you. Only then will you really recognize uh, the bullshit artistry at work, and then we'll be able to carry it forward. And I think that's you know that, that's a skill you really have to learn bullshit uh, in the field and, and not as a theory. So as good as how life with statistics is as a classic uh, layperson's introductory guide to bullshit, uh, I think it's of limited use. Um, so I have um, two books here. Um, one is about Bayesianism. So, as you might be aware, if you're in the right-wing sphere, uh, there is a theory called Bayes' theorem. It's a probability theory about how we can reconceptualize probability from being a study about the occurrence of things in large scales, like the study of populations, 
or this idea of recurring events to a, a measurement of belief and the propagation of belief over time. And this was a theory developed by Thomas Bayes right along with classic statistics in the 18th century. And uh, this was reintroduced basically in the late 20th century as uh, a method of heuristic machine learning. And it turned out to be a very, very fruitful avenue for uh, understanding and adapting beliefs about the universe to the extent where a number of people like Eliezer Yudakowsky and Scott Alexander uh, began thinking, uh, began uh, making extremist statements like, "All thinking is simply the application of Bayes' rule," and you know we solved in the question of intelligence, guys. It's just the application of Bayes' rule, and all humans are is belief engines, and all reason is is belief engines uh, carried out over time. And um, this is something that. Um, you know, I think Bayes' rule is a very useful rule. I think oftentimes these, the, the rationalist crowd takes it too far. Um, but, you know, this, this uh, book here, The Theory That Would Not Die, um, uh, by, what's the author of this one again? Uh, Sharon Birch McG McGain. That's a horrible name. Uh, but it takes you through, like, the inter the, how, how Bayes' theory was developed and how eventually it became seen as sort of a revolutionary perspective in how we think about um, knowledge and, and, and learning and, and um, improved understanding of the universe over time. Another perspective that people don't talk about enough is information theory. Um, so there were two, I think, great computer scientists or great contributors to our understanding of theoretical computer science in the 20th century. The first one, very famously, was Alan Turing. I think he's had several movies made about him. Uh, you understand him from the concept of the Turing machine, the basic theoretical computer. You also know of Turing from the Turing test, the test in artificial intelligence, where you determine whether something's intelligent based on whether you can distinguish it from a, a computer, right? Or, or from a real human, right? So if you fail a Turing test, you've mistaken an artificial intelligence for a real person. And uh, people talk less about um, Shannon. Uh, what was Shannon's name? I completely forget. Uh, was it John Shannon? He was the progenitor of information theory. And information theory is a way of conceptualizing knowledge uh, as as a measurement of entropy, as a measurement of uncertainty, and and so he has this idea of informational entropy, uh, where you can measure how much information is contained in messages, and how much is left out, and um, it's a very very interesting perspective, um, and and very deliciously, uh, you can actually come up with a direct one to one correspondence between physical entropy. In, in the form of chaos increasing over time in physical systems and informational entropy. Uh, like uh, basically the, 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 the certainty or uncertainty about the meaning of communications. And uh, I found this really, really interesting read. I think a layperson could understand this. Um, here I have a tutorial by James Stone, but I'm sure there's better books for lay people than that. Uh, the last set on mathematics, uh, really, I'm, you know, I'll only, only look at one. Now, uh, the books I've discussed here, I say they're for lay people, and with the, ex the, with the exception of how to lie with statistics, they probably aren't for lay people. This might be the exception. This is Douglas Hostetter's Gödel Escherbach. Uh, this book changed my entire perspective on the universe. It basically turned me into a deist overnight. And it's a discussion of um, three great thinkers. Uh, Gödel, who is the, the inventor of the, incom not the inventor, the discoverer of the incompleteness theorem and, and the dispeller of Bertrand Russell's idea that you could create a universal foundation for all mathematics. Escher, who is the famous artist who does like the waterfalls that circle around back on each other or the infinite staircases or the twisted, um, the twisted uh, passageways, the twisted Byzantine passageways that defy all logic and gravity. And then the last one is Bach, uh, you know, Johann Sebastian Bach, right? 
And, uh, and Douglas Hostetter is able to explain the connection between these three ideas inside the concept of a self-referential, a loop that refers to itself. And he's able to help you understand how the self-referential nature of a, of a fuge from Bach, uh, a self-referential picture uh, from Escher, and, and Gödel's famous uh, demonstration that logic itself is, is sort of fundamentally incomplete when it comes to describing truth in, in complex systems. Uh, they're all basically the same idea and can be expressed in the same ways. And it it's absolutely just a wonderful book. It, it's told in a variety of ways, one of them being a dialogue between a turtle and Achilles and the famous Zeno's paradox. And then later, um, you know, the author brings you through all these different examples that help you understand this idea, this very complex idea, in, in a very, very, very um, interesting and exciting way. So uh, I'll leave the mathematics there and go on to the final category, um, music. All right. <laughs> so again, I'm really just hitting the uh, the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, my wife has a degree in music, so right behind me on a lower shelf that you can't see is an entire range of her music tech theory textbooks from college, not to mention in another bookshelf off screen where you have row after row of sheet music. Uh, that being said, there's like a few music books, quote unquote, that like I think are actual books. Um, one of them is this book, NPR's Guide on Building a Classical Music Collection. Again, I feel like a pleb for saying this, but I think there actually is a use in, in getting an overarching guide to classical music so that you can get kind of an atlas. Uh, don't just listen to classical music. I mean, I guess you could just turn on the classical station and listen to it, and that's usually fairly good. But in my opinion, classical music is best when listened to in a deliberate fashion. And in order to be able to do that, you need to be able to understand what classical music is and what this artist, uh, what this artist, what this composer was like, and what that composer was like, and what the best recordings might be. Um, I mean, NPR. The fact that NPR produced this is probably an indication that this book is horribly middle brow. I still found it useful. And, you know, back in the 90s when this book was produced, NPR was actually, you know, not completely insufferably ideological. It actually produced some good stuff. So um, still, still a good read. Not really a good read, a good resource to have, in my opinion. Um, here again, I have uh, two song books. Um, one, I don't know why I have this around other than it being kind of delightful. Oops. And that is the uh, Treasury of Libretto by Gilbert and Sullivan. Now I have, uh, I think, the more or less the complete works of Gilbert and Sullivan on on vinyl. Um, but you know, I, I also got a book with with their um, libretto, and I, I don't know. I really love Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, I, does anyone actually read the music, uh, the songs? Uh, Obviously, I am the very modern of a modern major general. Would you could you could learn that one without actually being a professional musician and, and recite it to impress your friends? Uh, but really, the only way to consume Gilbert and Sullivan is um, is as uh, is as uh, uh, going to professionally produce plays. And and if anyone hasn't gone to a Gilbert and Sullivan play, uh, don't put that on your bucket list. Uh, do it as soon as you can. They're really delightful. Uh, they're filled with optimism, and it's just contagious. Anyone who thinks the Victorian age oh, was a dour place without humor um, hasn't uh, experienced the extreme joy and innocence that exists in something like the HMS Pinafore uh, or, or the Mikado or something like that. Uh, the other kind of uh, treasury I have is um, Stephen Foster, a treasury of Stephen Foster. Uh, these are songs you actually can sing. Uh, Stephen Foster is uh, the great American songwriter, and this is his illustrated uh, songs. And, you know, like Camp Town Ladies, uh, what are some of those other ones? Old Lemuel, but that's not a very well-known one. 
Little Jimmy Dow. These are all folk songs that you can sing, or if you play instruments, uh, you can play folk songs too. Um, I don't know if I'd really put this on a music stand, but you know, it's good to have around. Um, as for some books that have kind of taught me something, um, you know, I I used to be very avid into playing folk music, and um, someone gave me this book uh, called Free Play about trying to develop your own musical style, and it's by Stefan uh, Nakmanovich, and uh, it's his it's his um, own experience learning how to improvise playing the violin. And you know, I never really improvised, but but I have read this and kind of got the sense of what it would mean to develop your own musical style. And so this is a really a seminal um, book. Uh, well, I don't know if it really changed my life or anything, uh, but it, it was it was an interesting thing to kind of read and and see how how a creative mind works around a problem of of bringing forward something new uh, in a live setting. Arguably, you say I, maybe maybe I'm incorporating the concepts of free play into my own live streaming because I certainly do a lot more live streaming than I do um, uh, improvisation in any musical sense. Uh, but anyway, that's that is what it is. Uh, another book that I really got a lot out of um, is uh, Country Music USA. So Country Music USA tells the history of American country music and American old-time music, and uh, the larger story of American folk music, from things like the Carter family, to the Grand Ole Opry, to Bill Monroe, to Hank Williams, uh, to even Garth Brooks, right, and, and modern bluegrass. Um, this isn't a hagiography, I should say. Uh, the history of American uh, folk music, at least in the 20th century, is a history of bakers. Um, you know, the Carter family, they were kind of hillbillies, but their their folk music was an intentional collection by the patriarch of the Carter family. And and they were very much a produced act. Uh, they, they were, uh, he, he created the Carter family as a product that he could sell records around. And, and the same thing is true for uh, things like Bill Monroe. Like Bill Monroe, the king of the Grand Ole Opry, the inventor of bluegrass. Uh, bluegrass was a new genre. Sure, it used old, it used old songs like old timey songs from the nineteenth century that he had taken, but this whole idea that you would, um, you know, you take uh, the banjo, which is an African instrument, and you would combine it with, um, you combine it with guitars and bass, and and then a mandolin. The mandolin was um, was Bill Monroe's instrument, and it was. I mean, the man before then, the mandolin was was an it was an Italian instrument that Italian immigrants played, in in, in like urban areas, right? But this was the m instrument that Bill Monroe happened to know, so it got incorporated into this sort of old time rural music, and the idea that you, you would then take that kind of old timey music and you'd play it like really, really, really fast, that was a new innovation that was come up by with uh, that was come up with. Uh, by Bill Monroe in, in the late 30s and early 40s. And, uh, you know, there was nothing like that before then. So it, when you hear a lot of folk music, a lot of these American folk music recordings, you are hearing something traditional, but, but there's lots of filters to that. I think the best music movie about American folk music is Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Because it perfectly captures uh, the, the interplay between authentic lived reality in the music and phoniness, like the the, the protagonist of uh, of O Brother Where Art Thou, who who literally ends up kind of inventing bluegrass in this alternative history version of of uh, of, of 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 the invention of bluegrass. I, I assume like a just so story in that regard. Um, he's a con artist, right? He's a con artist pretending to be uh, an old timer, or uh, pretending to be a hillbilly. And he and he's actually like this guy who's who's in jail not for robbing a bank but for um, uh, practicing law without a license, some kind of bureaucratic technicality, a crime only a middle class person could uh, could could be guilty of. But at the same time, the music does have a sort of organic sensibility to it. It has an organic sensibility to it uh, and feeling to it, even if it has these layers of fakeness on top of it. I um, mean, you know, Nashville was a classic, like Nashville is the place is a classic example of like this fakeness kind of layered on top of a, a deep history that will, will that will eternally and forever be American folk music.
Um, so that, that is a gem, in my opinion. But, but, um, this is the last book that, I guess, maybe this is the last book of all of them. This might be the last book of the video. Uh, not really a book at all. Uh, but if you're looking for uh, authentic American music of the oldest variety we possibly have, uh, welcome to The Sacred Harp. So The Sacred Harp is uh, a, a Protestant hymnal, uh, a set of songs that were common throughout a lot of different Protestant denominations in the 19th century, so that there would be a common language uh, of American spiritual music that everyone could learn, and that everyone would know these songs, and everyone could sing them. And uh, this style of music, this I believe this book was in the 19th century, it was written in the 19th century, it was certainly iterations of this were from the 19th century, but their, their Protestant hymns put the music, and if you look in the, in the book, uh, the notes have shapes to them. This is a certain variety of musical notation called shape note singing, uh, where, where what, what the, let me see if I can get this right. Uh, so in music, you have the do, le, mi, uh, you have the, the, the eight musical notes, right? And, um, and, uh, and they correspond to uh, notes on the bar uh, that, that you get in something like a treble clef. Uh, well, the shape corresponds to sort of the, the, the broader position in that scale in terms of fifths, right? Uh, so if you see if you see like a square, you know that you're that part of the harmony. And so uh, the sacred harp is sung and in this close locked vocal harmony, uh, you know, where you've got sort of the uh, you've got like a tenor and a bass and a baritone and an alto and uh and and you lock right and the shape notes the shape of notes even if you can't read music you know what part of that harmony you're plant you're singing in any given time as you read through the notes and and because of this it was it was a way of of educating people who, who might not have sophisticated musical under musical understanding to the, to nevertheless read an enormous amount of christian hymns and be able to sing them well and in a religious context. Uh, again, it's, it's Sacred Harp, and this is this this book is literally a uh, an element of American history, a, a critical element of Protestant American history, in my opinion. And um, I don't know if this is still a thing, but the, but but I used to be part of several groups who used to sit, get together and sing a uh, shape note no music, and and there are still communities of people who sung shape note music uh, together. And, um, and it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And, and if people are interested in modern bluegrass, a lot of bluegrass musicians like Cricket Still or, or Gillian Welch uh, or Chris Teeley, um, they, they draw on the old Protestant hymns that come from the, the, the shape note tradition. Uh, they obviously rewrite them, right? And, and you kind of get the idea, you know, you, when you look at Sacred Harp and, and how it's actually structured just raw, um, it's very, uh, there, there's no syncopation whatsoever. It's bum, 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 dun, dun, dun. It, you're just kind of swaying. There's absolutely no rhythm in it. it. It's very, it's very much American music before there was the cross pollination with the more African rhythms that you see in things like blues and bluegrass and ragtime and jazz and all that stuff. And obviously, modern uh, bluegrass musicians or modern old-time musicians, they always spruce it up with syncopation so uh, that these things sound uh, more, more, more like we expect folk songs to sound in the modern day. But again, they still contain that seed uh, of, of religious devotion, that seed of Protestant devotion. And they come from this really rich tradition um, that, that even that anyone, really, that anyone who, who can... Who can hold a tune um, at the most basic level can just pick up and be part of it any time. So uh, with that, with this last book, <laughs> this is this is the last book I have to share with you all for this this very long video. Uh, I Godspeed if you've been me with me this entire time. It's taken me multiple nights to record this. Uh, if you might have guessed my, you might have noticed that my facial hair has gotten a little bit longer over the course of this video. Uh, um, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's taken a while to record this. I hope you've enjoyed this. 
if there's one thing I hope anyone can take from this video is uh, always be curious, always be willing to pick up and, and try to learn something new from a book or from a person. And, and if you can, always try to learn inside a community. Reading books is always easier together. Uh, especially singing is always easier together. Poetry is always easier when you're reading it to somebody or when you're reciting it. And, and, and remember, you know, even if our own world, if even if our own cultural space is, is, is sort of desolate and, and used up and degenerate and, and, and seemingly uncap incapable of discovering anything meaningful and true and beautiful, um, the portals to greater worlds and to larger civilizations than our own, and indeed the seeds that will give uh, forth a new civilization, uh, this is always available to you in, in older media, in newer media, uh, in, in the small places. If only you can teach yourself the requisite patience to, to sit down with yourself and, and actually learn the secrets that, that are available in any given text. And, and that stays with you a while. And don't be afraid. I, I'm of the opinion, don't be afraid to start a book and then stop it if it doesn't interest you or if you come up against something else uh, you want to read. Uh, try to finish books if you possibly can. You know, Try to develop discipline and patience and focus, but, but don't be bashful to buy a book and not read it. I, I don't believe that, that you should not buy books because you have another one you haven't read. And that's just doesn't, that's not productive. But at, but at the same token, uh, don't be afraid to give away books, right? You know, most of uh, most of the books I've read, I've given away, and, and even a lot of my favorite books, uh, some of which I've mentioned in passing, uh, don't even appear on this bookshelf behind me. So, um, you know, that's. Uh, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I'll see you uh, on coming installments on my YouTube channel, The Distributist. Have a good night, and God bless.